the hour of 2.15 having arrived, uh, the council is in session for its afternoon session on May 9th, 2023. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Uh, here, sorry. <laughs> And Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, we will move on. Uh, our item number four is a mayoral proclamation declaring May as Older Americans Month. We have some fine folks here who, uh, who I will present this proclamation to, but who are also going to be making some remarks. So, Recording yeah. in progress. Hello everyone. Happy Older Americans Month. Hi, my name is Kelly mercer Boff, and I am the Senior Programs Coordinator for the City of Santa Cruz. And I have the privilege and honor each day to design programming for our senior population at the London Nelson Community Center and to partner with agencies throughout the county to support our seniors. In honor of May being Older Americans Month, I'm excited to share what the city of Santa Cruz has on the horizon for our older adults. But first, I want to share why it's so important that we take action now. By 2030, 10.8 million Californians will be an older adult, making up one in four of the state's population. By 2034, the United States will, for the first time ever, be comprised of a uh, older, more older adults than of children. So we have a rapidly growing senior population that we need to start preparing for. The sooner we start community planning with an age-friendly lens, the sooner people of all ages will benefit from the adoption of policies and programs that make neighborhoods walkable, feature transportation options, enable access to key services, provide opportunities to participate in community activities, and support housing that's affordable and adaptable. Our current plan is to enroll the city of Santa Cruz into the AARP Age Friendly Network. This designation is actually the US affiliate of the World Health Organization's Global Network for Age Friendly Cities and Communities. It's a public commitment to a five-year program cycle that can be entered at any time and once in the network, there's a plethora of resources available to help jurisdictions support each other in making communities more livable for people of all ages. Now, once in the network, there are eight categories we will be assessing in our community with the idea that the availability and quality of these programs and community features impact the well-being of older adults. The eight demands of livability framework is used by all of the towns, cities, counties, and states enrolled in the age-friendly network to organize and prioritize their work to make our community become more livable. Now, while some communities tackle all eight domains at once, others may choose to focus on fewer or combined domains. Now, this framework is also in alignment with the city's health and all policies, particularly the pillars of equity and public health. So how do we do this? And what are the next steps? Um, we've identified points of contact in each of the city departments to form a citywide committee on aging. In, in collaboration with the County of Santa Cruz and other local jurisdictions, we will be conducting our community needs assessment in early 2024. From there, we will develop a community action plan based on the assessment results and the needs identified within the eight domains of livability that influence the health and quality of life for older adults. And we look forward to keeping you updated as we pursue our age-friendly designation for the city of Santa Cruz. And we invite you to join us in these efforts. And if you'd like to learn more about this process and all the amazing ways we are currently keeping our seniors active engaged and connected over at the London Nelson Community Center through education, recreation, and technology, 
please don't hesitate to contact me or my team at the London Nelson Community Center. Thank you. Well, thank you so very, very much. We very much appreciate it. And we're so impressed with the work that you do at London Nelson Center. Uh, I went down uh, just before we went back into session and told you that uh, I thought it was a prank of sorts today because today is my 73rd birthday and I thought well, this, is, this is a prank. And, a uh, happy coincidence. But, but, I'm, uh, but in all seriousness, thank you so very much. You're doing great work and, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are on item five, and uh, members, uh, any comments on this item you'd like to make? If uh, I could. Yes, make, please, Ms. Brown. I, I just want to say thank you so much for the presentation and for uh, being uh, at the forefront here of moving in this direction. I'm, I represent the city of Santa Cruz on the Area Agency on Aging uh, Advisory Board, and this is something that has been uh, in discussion, I've actually reached out to, and, and I, uh, Council Member Watkins and I had talked about bringing something forward, um, and I'm really glad that it's it's happening, um, and that through the staff, you are coordinating with the other jurisdictions. I think this is uh, just a really wonderful way to get a sense of where we're at, you know, that inventory part uh, that's part of the process, as well as using it to help, uh, you know, a lens to, a lot through the PIAP lens, really, uh, to decide how we move forward with projects and, and programs. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins. I'll just briefly echo Council Member Brown's com comments as well as the mayor's and really thank you for the work that you're doing and just how pleased I am to see this come forward. We have talked about wanting to see this move forward and I know there's been energy happening in the county and other jurisdictions to now have it come before us is really encouraging. And, um, you know, I think we do want to be prepared to, ha to understand how we can best support our aging population and we do need to start right now. And so however we can be uh, kept abreast of what's going on and any kind of points that come back to us for any decision making, please do. And hopefully we can make this a, a real um, age friendly community for, for our seniors. So thank you. Thank you for the comments. We're good. Thank, thank you again very, very much. We are on item number five. And this item is uh, crisis consulting for the department, I'm sorry, for the development of a city-based integrated health response team. We have Ms. Murphy here, I believe. Uh, Mr. Clymer is also here, but Ms. Murphy, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I'm here to introduce the presentation on the integrated health response team. Short, the iHeart team. Thank you, Mr. Alt, for that. Um, just like to start off with, according to the Department of Justice, one in four people shot and killed by law enforcement between 2015 and 2020 had a mental health condition. The current mental health crisis response system relies on law enforcement and puts people suffering from mental illness through an expensive and traumatizing revolving door as they shuttle between jails, emergency rooms, and the street. A comprehensive crisis response system can prevent these tragedies, save money, and increase access to appropriate care. Last year, Councilmember Golder connected Chief Escalante with the City of Petaluma's Chief and City Manager to learn more about their mobile crisis response and intervention program. Their program began in 2021 and has pr proven quite successful. They connected us with their consultant, Mr. Ben Adam Clymer, who prepared an analysis for them and recommendation for a model <laughs> mobile crisis response in not only Petaluma, but in several Bay Area cities. The city engaged Mr. Clymer late last year to perform a data assessment and analysis of the types of calls and service that we receive here in the city. He then reviewed existing programs, since our mental health liaison program, met with numerous local service providers, including the county, and did ride-alongs with fire and PD. And he prepared analysis and a report on an integrated health response team for the city. And Mr. Clymer is here today to present his findings. While we're not here today to take any action, but to hear the program, there is, no, there is not funding that is identified today for this program. However, there will be opportunities to discuss potential funding in the future, including at the FY24 
budget process or even uh, the mid-year in FY20, later in FY24. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ben Adam Clymer for the presentation. Mr. Clymer, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Good? Oh, hello, I'm Ben Adam Clymer. And um, if we could just maybe hit the next slide. Um, just a little introduction, although um, I think that Lisa did excellent job. That was um, fantastic. Uh, uh, I worked for a team up in Eugene, Oregon called Cahoots for about five years as a, um, a crisis worker and as an EMT. Um, and then I have been, for the last few years, helping um, cities all around the state of California start uh, mobile crisis teams very similar to, uh, to CAHOOTS, including uh, at the UC Santa Cruz as well. Uh, those, city, those teams have been started, or I've also helped um, improve them, in Sonoma County, Marin County, here at the UC Santa Cruz, San Joaquin, Los Angeles, and Orange Counties. Um, and I have been uh, working with Lisa and with Chief Escalante and Chief Odie and um, Larry, uh, the homelessness liaison um, here in the city, um, developing this report. And what I've got here is a sort of um, much, much more uh, consumable uh, summary of that uh, very long, arduous report that I wrote. So we can go to the next one. So I think um, just as, a, as, as a, we want to sort of talk about what I think our, our general, although I think Lisa laid it out really well, the kind of problem, oh, that doesn't bend, um, the problem that we're facing generally as a society is that we have developed a very good response system um, to get to crime, violence, fires, medical emergencies. Um, and that, that system is, is made up of law enforcement, fire department, EMS, um, emergency medical services. Um, but there's so many calls that come into that system, into the, uh, the 911 or the emergency response system that don't really meet um, the criteria for law enforcement or fire or EMS, but those calls have been given to those, um, to those agencies. And some of those are mental health, some of those are people experiencing homelessness, um, some of those are people just having quality of life issues, and some of those are um, just family members who are uh, having conflict um, and, and, and end up in that state where they feel like they need emergency assistance, um, but the system that we have right now isn't necessarily designed to respond to them in the best way. So the goal really for what we're talking about here is, is um, adding into that system a, a response that is designed to tackle those situations. Can we go to the next one? Um, also, uh, uh, we're doing older American, um, that was really awesome, the, oh, um, uh, the older American uh, month, um, but also May is a National Mental Health Awareness Month. I think it's really fitting that we're having this conversation now um, in this month. Um, it's important to remember that uh, mental health crises can be frightening and very isolating experiences, and especially with older adults, um, as they as their um, friends pass away and as their things change in their lives, um, there is a huge older adult mental health crisis going on, um, and a lot of what we do in the in the Cahoots model or the integrated health response team model is responding to older adults and saying, hey, imagine it's pretty tough where you're at right now and we're here to support you. Um, in fact, this story that I'm about to tell um, is with an older adult and, uh, and, I, and I just wanna take a moment and um, recognize this month, um, both as Older Adult Month and as, as Mental Health Awareness Month. Go next. So this is a story um, about a man uh, named Ernest. Obviously, there are details of this story that have been changed um, for the sake of confidentiality. Um, so, but uh, this is a story that I've encountered many, many times in my career. Um, Ernest was uh, an older adult living on a fixed income in a hotel. And um, hotels can be pretty pricey. 
uh, as I can tell you right now, because I'm staying in one while I'm here. And um, this left him very little money for paying for a roof over his head. Um, after, after paying for a roof over his head, it left him very little money for food and all that kind of stuff. Um, he was taking numerous different uh, prescription medications for both physical and mental health conditions, um, including Xanax, an anti-anxiety drug. And he started to feel suicidal. And it was, uh, you know, pretty early in the morning. So he took three Xanax over the course of two hours, which is too much. That's more than he was prescribed. And um, he proceeded to call 911 because he was feeling suicidal. Now, at the same time, he called 911, and, and as a good decision, he decided to call a friend for support, and he told that friend that he had overdosed on Xanax, and the friend got very scared and called 911 and reported an overdose. <laughs> and um, this, this uh, of course, was uh, alarming, and so the dispatchers who got his phone call um, for the suicidal feelings sent out uh, our integrated health response team, and um, the, the dispatchers also got a call from his friend for an overdose and sent that over to fire EMS and, um, and they sent out a, an engine to manage the, uh, the overdose. So we can go to the next screen. Um, so in a normal city um, with Ernest, what would happen? Um, usually because of the suicidality, law enforcement is going to be deployed um, to, to do a 5150 assessment. And um, because of the overdose, uh, fire and EMS is going to be sent out as well. That means we've got at least two, maybe three officers. And then we've got up to, especially in the city of Santa Cruz and most cities in California, we're going to have five employees, um, usually three firefighters on an engine and two uh, paramedics in an ambulance or some, some configuration of that. Um, if you're a city like Santa Cruz or like other cities in California, you might um, have a, a crisis team on duty. Um, so, uh, and they're usually riding around with um, police officers. So then, uh, or they're or they're working for the county team. So we might have another one to two um, staff there as well. So we're looking somewhere between uh, nine to ten employees who are responding to this one man. Um, because of his overdose of the Xanax, which is to say um, an overdose that's not lethal uh, and, and is rarely, um, you know, very dangerous, uh, he's going to be transported to the hospital by an ambulance and he's going to be taken to the ER um, before he can be transferred to the crisis stabilization unit. And in all the midst of this, um, Ernest was dealing with uh, a, a lot of stress around money. That ambulance's bill probably run him eight hundred to a thousand dollars. The ER bill is going to run him fourteen hundred to two thousand um, dollars, which he's never going to pay, and that's going to be footed by somebody. Um, all told, uh, we could be looking between somewhere between seven and ten responders arriving on scene. Um, this can be very overwhelming for a person who's suicidal, and ultimately, in the end, despite all of that. Uh, response, all of those resources poured into it, he ends up at the ER, which is not the best spot for him. So we can go to the next, next slide. So what happened in, in reality? What actually happened with Ernest? Um, well, we showed up um, as the integrated health first responders, and we were first on scene, and we performed a suicide assessment. Um, we also performed a rapid medical assessment. Um, to determine if the Xanax overdose was affecting his mentality, his mentation, and his, uh, if he was, you know, losing consciousness or whatnot from it. He wasn't. Um, and because of that, we were able to say to the fire department, hey, we don't need, um, we don't need paramedics. We don't need five uh, firefighters and paramedics. Um, we don't need law enforcement because he's not threatening us. He's not being dangerous. And we can handle the suicide assessment, no problem. Um, we were able to contact the CSU and say, hey, this is the, this is the situation going on. Um, can we bring him in? And, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and they were like, yeah, bring him in. It's no problem. And so we were able to transport him directly to the CSU, skipping the emergency room, saving a bed there, saving an ambulance, um, and saving everyone time and money and energy, um, which is to say with just two staff, we were able to manage the entire situation, save time, save money, um, and get him not only to the right place, but to the place that he wanted to go to. 
So a recent study in Georgia um, has shown that people with histories of mental health issues and their families prefer a non-police crisis response. And I think this is important. Um, this is an important study um, because as more and more uh, teams pop up all around the state, it's important to note that we try to create these teams um, independent of law enforcement, independent of fire EMS, so that uh, people feel like they have um, uh, an independent decision, uh, independent team to respond to them, um, which is what they what they long for. And we go to next. So. Um, when it comes to mobile crisis response, we have a couple of different models. And obviously, I, I have worked in the integrated health response model myself. Um, but I do want to just note that there are several different models out there. And then I want to talk about um, both their sort of the positive components of them and the, uh, and the maybe deficits of them. Um, the, the most common model generally throughout the um, country is the co-response model, uh, which pairs a licensed clinician, usually an LCSW or an LMFT, which is a licensed clinical social worker or licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, if I ever say an acronym that anyone's confused by, you feel free to stop me. Um, there are so many. Uh, so um, usually that they are paired up with a law enforcement officer and um, they're accessed through 911, which makes getting them very, very easy. Um, uh, having the teams uh, funneled through 911 system or the uh, PSAP, the uh, public safety access point, um, is a very uh, functional system, and and um, and that that has worked very well to get crisis workers to scenes. Um, they also respond to a very wide variety of calls. They can respond to anything that a law enforcement officer can respond to. So, which is pretty much everything. Um, which is another uh, positive of that model. Um, and often they do transport, although when they do transport, um, it's in the back of a police car, which, um, as you may know, is, can be, uh, will include handcuffs. Um, it's not the most comfortable transport um, and can be um, you know, fairly frustrating for somebody who um, is having a really bad day and now they're in the back of a cop car. So not, not the, the most ideal transport situation, but they do transport. Um, however, they don't have uh, medical capabilities. Um, so I think, you know, in, in particular, when we're, we're thinking about this model, um, especially with somebody like Ernest, an older adult, um, this is not great for them because um, being put in the back of a cop car can be um, sort of damaging to their health and things like that. Uh, so there's some positives to that model, and then there's some, some deficits there. The other uh, big model for um, mental health response, um, which, is, it, which I like to call it uh, in the report, you'll see it called the county-based two clinician team. Um, because I couldn't make it look good and fit there, I called it the clinical team. Um, at, uh, this is where you have at least one licensed clinician. So historically, it's always been two licensed clinicians. Um, but more and more, they're going with a licensed clinician and peer support model. Um, these teams are usually run by counties, so you have them really all across the state. Um, LA, like almost every LA area team, every Bay Area county has a team like this. Um, they're usually accessed, or almost ex exclusively, I should say, exclusively accessed through um, 10 digit numbers that are run by the county. Um, they respond very strictly to mental health calls. Uh, in, in um, Santa Cruz County, they respond to mental health calls uh, only at, um, at locations, at facilities, so they don't respond to people's houses or to um, people on the street. Uh, and um, sometimes these teams can transport, um, but that's usually limited. So the Santa Cruz County team does do some transports, but not very often. Um, and then most of the time, you look at them throughout the county, uh, or throughout the state, this model will use either private or um, city uh, city ambulances to do the transports. Again, they have no medical capabilities either. These teams do not. Um, so then that leaves us with the, what I call the integrated health model, which is, um, um, you know, I call it integrated health because it pairs up a uh, some kind of crisis worker or mental health professional with a medical professional, most typically an EMT. Um, sometimes um, there's paramedics, sometimes there's nurses. It depends on which city you're in. Um, when you look at something like San Francisco, they have paramedics. When you look at something like Petaluma, we just have EMTs. Um, 
again, these, these teams uh, kind of combine some of the best parts, I think, of co-response and the clinical team uh, model, which is that they are accessed most typically through um, the PSAP or 911 system, um, which is to say they're very easy to get the teams. We launched uh, in San Rafael, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out some, some we'll do a, a comparison of San Rafael with Santa Cruz here shortly, but we launched in San Rafael at the end of March, and um, within, uh, you know, a couple of days, we were responding to about nine to 10 calls a day um, with an, on a 12-hour shift. Um, so we were rocking and rolling right from the get-go, but that's because um, the system the calls that are already coming into the police that fit within the wheelhouse of that team, they were already coming in. So all we had to do was just send the team out. Um, very simple. Um, that Because of that, because of the crisis worker EMT pairing, they're able to respond to a ton of different kinds of things. So um, for example, you know, very frequently some, you see somebody sleeping on the street and you see them there and then you walk by them two more hours later and they're still there. Um, that frequently gets coded as a, as, a, as a medical call because, well, what if they're overdosed or what if they're really sick or something like that? But most of the time, they're just sleeping. Um, so frequently, fire engines and paramedics and all the whole crew get sent out to those calls for service. Um, with the integrated health team, because you have that EMT, you can make that team respond to that call um, easily because most of the time it's not a medical emergency, but with the EMT, if it is, you've got a really easy way to start an intervention, start medical care, and get EMS en route quickly. Um, the other great component of integrated health is that they can transport. Um, as I said, a lot of clinical teams um, throughout the state utilize EMTs to do the transports. With the integrated health team, we take the mental health worker and we take that EMT, we put them in the same van, and then we have them do the transports. Um, this saves a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, um, and like in the case of Ernest at the beginning, um, it's, uh, it's, it's much more comfortable. No gurneys, no handcuffs, just sit in a nice seat. You want us to play some good music, um, we're going to take you and, yeah, we love playing music for them in the back. Uh, uh, whenever I transport, especially like suicidal teenagers, we always want to get them their favorite songs um, in the back, uh, which are usually my favorite songs, so that's always great. Um, and, and then obviously, the, as I mentioned, the integrated health model has um, medical capabilities. Uh, generally, not advanced medical capabilities. We're not doing, um, you know, we're not responding to heart attacks. Um, but we do run upon somebody who's got, uh, who's overdosed, we can get that going. Or somebody who's just got um, wounds on their feet, wounds on their legs or whatnot, we can handle that as well. Oh, there. So what is it, um, just as a sort of definition, uh, what is integrated health first response? Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's modeled off of, of CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. Um, it includes a crisis worker and a medical staff. Uh, and I also want to, you know, say that the primary focus of these types of teams is de-escalation, support, resource referral, and then helping that person in crisis access their own internal and external resources to manage the crisis. Our, our number one goal always, always, always on these teams is to help people stay where they're at, stabilize, and when they are at that spot where they really, really feel like they cannot stay where they're at, it's going to be too overwhelming, then we have a really um, easy and efficient way to get them to the place where they need to go. Um, and one of the cool components of that as well is we transport to any staffed service. Um, so, you know, you want to get into a, in, into a rehab, um, cool, we'll take you there. You want to get, you know, you want to go to the crisis center and, and stabilize there? Cool, we'll take you there. We're not just going to, like, write you a note and say, this is the address, you know, <laughs> like, this is the phone number. Um, we're going to go, we're going to make introductions, we're going to help that person get through that process, which can be always, you know, sometimes very overwhelming. Uh, yeah, we can go next. So what kinds of calls specifically um, do these types of teams respond to? So obviously our, our highest priority is always mental health and suicidal um, folks. Um, anybody who's uh, 
having a manic episode, anybody who's experiencing psychosis, anybody who's feeling um, acutely suicidal, um, you know, any, any kind of, of situation, uh, even just somebody who's like, man, I feel like absolute garbage and I really need to talk to somebody, but I hate talking on the phone and I would like somebody to just come and talk with me. Um, those are great, you know, kind of bread and butter calls for this type of team. Um, substance use, uh, honestly, uh, it, it runs the gamut. If somebody's contemplating going to um, going to, to treatment, or if somebody's just drunk and um, you know needs somebody to come check on them and make sure they're uh, going to be cool for the night, or make sure they get to a, a place that's a little safer, um, sounds great to us. Uh, people who are unhoused, um, a lot of the. Uh, uh, a lot of times what you find with, um, especially with law enforcement, is that it's very exhausting going to calls um, frequently to deal with people who are sleeping on the street. And it's not great for the person who's sleeping on the street, and the officer doesn't like doing it, and um, we don't have a great uh, alternative for that. So um, these types of teams respond to those types of calls. Um, sometimes that's to say, hey, you know, the business called and they would like you moved along. Can we help you get someplace better? Um, sometimes it's just going out and making sure that someone's still alive, um, and and saying, hey, you know, here's a here's a a, a cliff bar and um, and a water bottle, and I, I hope you can have a better day. So the other big, um, really big ticket item for these types of teams is the is what we call welfare checks. Um, these are the, a lot of these that we do are done on older adults, so bringing that back in as well. Um, people with dementia, people who um, maybe their grandkids live out of state and they talk to them once a week and um, their grandkids haven't heard from them in two weeks um, and their grandkids call say, hey, can you go check on my grandparent? Um, that, that's a total thing that we do. Um, honestly, those are some of the most fun calls. I really enjoy those. Uh, I, you know, going out and seeing how folks are doing. Sometimes that means we're looking to make sure that they're able to take care of themselves, um, trying to make sure if we need to file an APS report or something like that. Um, sometimes it's just in going out and saying, hey, you know, how are you doing? And they're like, not well. Um, and then we get to sit and be with them for a while and just give them some support. And then also, um, you know, not the, not the sort of domestic violence calls, but sometimes um, people hear their neighbors yelling at each other and um, they they call for assistance, and uh, and and really just the the families having conflict, um, and they just need a referee of some kind, and um, we like to go out and do those mediations. Um, I also really enjoy those calls, although they can last a long time. Um, our, my very when I was training the team in San Rafael, the very first call that I, this was a month ago, the very first call that we took was a two hour long family conflict call, and um, it was rather exhausting, but. Uh, uh, you know, those are the types of things we go out to, um, and um, those that can be any 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 family. It doesn't matter um, if you're the wealthiest family in the city or the poorest family in the city. You can go out and handle that. So I do want to uh, bring up um, the similar. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. So we have scheduled this till. Am I going too long? Let me finish my <laughs> and you can make yours. Uh, we have scheduled this for another eight minutes. Okay. That is, okay. That is also going to involve people Questions. who want to testify and comment. This is enormously helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah. I just want to alert you to time issues. Let's skip this slide. Santa Fe and Santa Cruz are very similar cities next. <laughs> and it's working really well for them there. We go to the next slide. Um, this is what we what might look like a pr sort of proposed system of response that I that we call like a two tier where we have first responders and second responders. Um, just to uh, give a sense for this really quickly for some context because I think we understand everything on the left side. Um, this would mean that when there is a uh, we would that the integrated health team would respond to that huge bulk of calls that come in that aren't sort of law enforcement and and EMS related and then when they escalate to the point of needing something like a 5150 then we would um, sort of uh, include the county clinical team in that and would and and the goal would be to create a really nice sort of tiered response that way we can go next and then um, this is benefits to first responders. Um, I think I've already hit everything here. And then we go to next slide as well. 
This is also benefits the community. Honestly, I've hit everything here as well. Um, one of the, I will say one thing here, which is that um, I like to think of these teams uh, as if we think of the person in crisis as the hub of a wheel, and we think of the social service agencies that support that person as the rim of the wheel, we really want our integrated health response team to be the spokes of that wheel, where they connect that person to those services, and then when those services are having, um, you know, need to give extra support to that person in crisis, they call on the integrated health team to provide that extra support, which will reduce their overtime costs, it will reduce their burnout of their employees, and it will it reduces their um, sort of reliance on on um, extra help uh, in their within their own organization. Here's some data. Um, I think that we could respond to a lot of calls in Santa Cruz. I'll just summarize it that way and go next. And um, thank you so much. And I'm very looking forward to answering any questions. Well, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Very thorough, very complete, very helpful to us. I know that a number of colleagues of, uh, here on the city council have been interested in this for some time. Yeah. I know the city administration and the police department have also been very supportive of this, and this is a, a real uh, step in the in, in the right and proper direction. So thank you very, very much. Let me ask if council members have any comments on this you would like to make. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clymer. And uh, so I, I just, I wanna say I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear your presentation, to see you here today. I have heard you speak about this model and your experiences and how this model could be in, utilized in other communities for um, several years now. Um, I'm just thrilled that you're here <laughs> talking Thanks. to us about it. Um, I did try to um, move forward this process uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and didn't have support at the time on the council to do that. So I'm just I'm just thrilled. I want to thank uh, the vice mayor for uh, catalyzing this, and uh, you know I'm just, I'm really looking forward to seeing how things progress. Um, I have a question, which is really a, a big question about what next <laughs> um, after a, after getting this information. And I think that you know the cost effectiveness, and you know for all of the reasons that you've articulately laid out. It's a wonderful opportunity for us. So I would just love to get a sense of when we might hear about this again. How you know how we're how we're moving. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Thank you. Uh, what's next would be to um, consider in your budget deliberations, either in FY24 deliberations or kick it to mid-year. It is not funded at this time, uh, so that that's. That's where it stands. And the next steps, if it were to be funded, then would to be continue on with the second phase of, of the contract of actually going and putting together an RFP. It would not be a program that's run by the city. It'd be funded by the city, and hopefully there would be at one point in time the ability to go after some grant funding in the future. Uh, but it would be by a nonprofit, most likely, who would um, administer the program. Wonderful, thank you. And so the, the budget time is is where this will, as, as you said before, thank you. And to Highlight also the second part of the contract is what she means is that not only do I, when I work on with cities like this, not only do I provide the analysis and things like that, but I also provide training to teams when they start um, launching so that there's somebody experienced in the whole system um, helping out with that. Council Member Bruner. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Um, and uh, I guess, I have a couple questions regarding um, the Petaluma model. Is is that where you worked? Is um, no, I, I worked uh, in Eugene on Cahoots. Okay. I helped Petaluma start their team okay. and train their team. Um, and so one of the th one of the things that I know um, we come across, we have existing um, uh, response models as you laid out here, um, uh, one of the concerns is places for people to go, which is also simultaneously being worked on. And so what, I, I, I didn't get a sense in this model how that addresses that, and I don't know if you have an answer to that. Well, I think you, yeah, I think you explained it just in the way you asked the question, right, which is that, um, 
you know, uh, there is a important component of this, which is having good locations to take people when they're in crises. Um, and the, the, the struggle with that is that we need both the team to take them there and the place to go. So I'm the person who can talk about the team to take them there. Um, and I think that continuing to expand those things like good crisis centers, sobering centers, when CAHOOTS was started in 1989, they opened a sobering center at the same time, specifically so that the team would have a place to take someone when they're intoxicated. Um, that, you know, so, you know, having components set up is really good. And also as somebody who's, who can say that I used to work overnight shifts when very few services were open. Um, and so my role was to help that person stay calm and, and deescalate and say, okay, you know, like, we can't go anywhere right now, so what are we gonna do? How are we gonna manage this? I still think there's an extreme value in having a team like this, helping that person sort of center and de-escalate, even though there might not be a place to go. And then uh, my question might be for staff, and um, um, at what point um, can we, are there other options that have been explored by staff based on the direction of this type of exploration? Well, I think if you've seen the report that Mr. Clymer has explored what the other options are and lays out several different models. Uh, currently, we're in a, a co-response type model where our mental health liaisons uh, go with PD. Actually, they're in two separate vehicles, but that's the model we have. The several ones that he looked at of all of the models he looked at and now analyze the one that we're proposing mm -hmm. if we move forward is, is the, the most appropriate best response, we believe, for this city. And then um, one more question. Um, so uh, I guess on, on knowing that um, we have existing models and county is working on, um, for example, I was in a stakeholder meeting and they're working on um, expansion of their responses and I just I'm trying to understand the overlap and there are other organizations and um, how this all fits in this is um, Ben's opinion and <laughs> an experience that he's presented and for city staff I'd like to see um, um, the county side the other orgs and um, you know, the whole picture, um, I guess, in, in um, knowing, like, do we need to consider a model like this that um, is a template, basically, that Ben has provided um, based on the CAHOOTS model and um, some of these other cities? It's a template, but it's up to us to find funding, to staff it, Right or the nonprofit to staff it, um, and um, I'm just wondering when we'll have the opportunity to figure out what it is we need in this realm um, that's not an overlap. Well, um, le yeah. Let me say I will say um, we've started teams. You know, I've helped start teams in in like this in Orange County and Sonoma County and Marin County. And what we find over and over again when we've done that is that the county mental health crisis response teams mm -hmm. um, have at first been like, oh, uh, well, you, you know, all the work that you guys do is gonna we're not gonna have work anymore. And what they found is that it hasn't been the case um, because these types of teams respond to calls that those teams would have never gone to in the first place. Um, because teams like that are, you know, county mo bo mobile crisis teams are almost never responding to um, the person who's sleeping on the steps of City Hall. They're not responding to um, the person with dementia. They're not responding to the person who's intoxicated. They're not responding to a whole variety of different types of things that these types of teams respond to. Um, and so, uh, so what, what, has then happened is that the the types of calls that those crisis, those county crisis teams respond to, um, they continue to respond to those um, both on their own independently, but also in coordination with the um, with the mobile crisis team in the ci the city based mobile crisis team. So when I say city based, I'm talking Huntington Beach, Garden Grove, Petaluma, San Rafael, Runner Park, Katati, et etc. Um, and 
And then when, when they collaborate together to respond to those types, um, it creates a nice continuum of care where you have um, somebody who's in a crisis, they get a crisis worker, that crisis worker calls the county crisis worker to come out and do the 5150 assessment or something like that. And then the transport can happen either by the city-based team or by that county-based team um, so that throughout the whole experience of that person's suicidal or you know mental health crisis, they're never touching law enforcement. They're never um, touching fire. They're only ever dealing with mental health workers. So I do see them respond weekly, <laughs> daily, often, different teams that we have. So I'm asking staff, at what point can we have um, follow-up on, on determine, will this come again on an agenda to determine if we're moving forward with a model like this, if if we are voting to fund it at, or look into funding, like what is that next step? This is, um, I guess I have a lot of unanswered questions because a lot of what is described in this model almost makes it sound like if we added an EMT to existing teams and it already that are being expanded, it could be a very similar model to this. And I'd be curious what county says about this model and how that affects all of this. So, uh, yeah, absolutely makes sense. I, it is a different model, and it's a model that's been proven in uh, numerous cities to be successful with the EMT co-pair. Now, is that something the county wants to participate in that type of program? Not fully sure. They are under a mandate to inter. Uh, put together a mobile crisis type response program. I know they have, um, and uh, I sat in on the same call as you did. It's very much a different program in terms of the level of what they will be looking at and responding to versus the needs of the city. And it's a much broader, widely expanded program. Right now we just have two mobile crisis, well, two mental health liaisons for, the, for this city and it's not a 24 seven program. That's what we're looking to implement is a 24 seven type program the recommendations that you see before you is the full breadth depth of um, of what we're looking to to implement. I'm happy to bring it back if we want to re-agendize and, and bring it back for further discussion. Uh, I think is wholly appropriate to, to continue down that that pathway. Uh, again, we have worked to met with Encompass and, and 911. Uh, I was I was just the, yeah, and yeah, Compass to, outreach workers, right, all of them. It, yeah, it's a it's a, a model that is far workers. more responsive, and have the ability to respond. As Ben pointed out, an example where he went on a call uh, with uh, fire, and they sat on a fire call, and wait, I can't if you want to describe oh, yeah. it, but it's a whole well, different. I, was, no, excuse I, I me, think. Excuse me. We are running really late. Sorry. Yeah. We, no, we're yeah. running really late. Okay. Further questions on this? This no. is an informational item. Yep. We can get this back in front of I us at some later that, date. Do you have that was questions? My, that's the answer no, to my Council question. Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions as well, but I'll keep it brief. And some of my questions and concerns were around not duplicating efforts and um, why not augment and expand what we have at the county. But I'll, I'll leave that be for now um, and go to some of my other questions. Are the crisis workers licensed? No, they are not in this not in this model. How are they trained? Uh, we do probably about 20 to 30 hours of classroom training, and then we do significant in-field training, and then they also have to come to us with um, at least two years of experience in the mental health field. Okay, so that um, that's something, if we were to um, continue to come back to this, that's something I'd like to dive into a little more. Hmm. Um, I know that, that um, in the report it said 10% um, or less would be acute cases. But even if that is the accurate number, that 10% of acute cases would need a licensed clinical trained person to respond. So um, again, I know we're running out of time, but that's, yeah. that's a concern I have with this model that I'd like to dive into. Um, and then the other point that was brought up is, um, and I totally understand this. I, I have a master's in social work, by the way. So this is this is a world that I'm somewhat familiar with, but um, that, that one of the purposes of the model is to remove law enforcement. So I, I understand the thinking behind that. And how do we account for worker safety? Um, we've had a lot of challenges very recently, in fact, with some of our public works and parks and rec workers when they've gone out to um, respond to um, encampments um, 
So, so that's a concern, and um, we've heard from our mental health liaisons recently from our criminal justice council report that they would like law enforcement there when they respond to calls because there are safety issues. So I'll keep it at that. I have a lot more questions. I guess one more thing I will bring up is the opportunity, if we were to move forward with this, because we are um, relieving the impact of em on emergency rooms and diverting folks from emergency rooms, an opportunity to partner and ask um, the medical world and emergency room uh, hospitals with emergency rooms, that's dignity here, to um, provide resources. So I'll keep it there, but I have a lot more to say. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Vice uh -huh. Mayor is recognized. Oh, yeah, we'll, go, we'll keep doing it in order here. Matt, I'm also going to keep it pretty brief, but I just want to thank and acknowledge um, Mr. Huffaker and uh, uh, Chief Escalante, and in addition, Jeffrey and Stacy Arlt that kind of put me in touch with those folks up in uh, Petaluma and, and gave me the ball to keep rolling. And I agree. I think this is a great first step. I think we have to partner with Netcom. We have to partner with the county. We could also loop in Kaiser and PAMF in this as they are opening hospitals in our region. And um, one thing that didn't get brought up, but when we do bring this item back and something to think about, when I spoke with um, partners up in Petaluma, um, they mentioned that not having a locked facility was a barrier. Mm -hmm. So not just pet facilities, but locked facility for some people in some situations. And so I think, again, the county is going to have to be an important part of this conversation moving forward. And I just want to thank you for coming and thank you for the presentation and um, thank you everybody, that's all. Thank you. Ms. Watkins. Um, I too will keep my comments brief, but I, I will just echo what my colleagues have said in terms of appreciation of the report and the work and definitely a good first step and um, important for us as a council and community to consider our options to um, not only ef efficiently, but um, you know, be socially responsible as we address some of the mental health issues that impact our community and the individuals like the Alt family that were deeply impacted by this. Um, I, I, I agree with what was brought up in regards to kind of context with the county. That was part of uh, a reason why in terms of what kind of was a barrier to have this move forward at the city level uh, years ago and that the county was already working and we were trying to work with them. And so that will need to be, I think, fleshed out and um, would be a consideration for this council if we were to move forward. And then the only other um, additional kind of insight or suggestion or consideration is as we see the state moving towards more reimbursable services that if this mm -hmm. could be a model that could be sustained through Medi-Cal reimbursement mm -hmm. and um, having these individuals who are conducting this work be certified by the state and able to um, reimburse for that, I think that would be helpful for sustainability. So if that does come forward, I'd like to also have a sustainability component built in. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Just a quick follow-up question. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to? Okay. Um, uh, just given the concerns that I'm hearing, I, I wanted to, um, just because I, I am very familiar with this uh, model and I've heard a lot about it and the County Mental Health Advisory Board recently uh, had a session about this where Petaluma folks were there, you were there. Um, and I remember hearing, but I have no recollection of what the number was, um, the savings that they have estimated um, to the city budget as a result of this. So if you, if you happen to know ballpark uh, I don't have anything off the top of my head. I can say that in Eugene, they estimate approximately $8 million a year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, my comments will be uh, very brief. I just want to uh, kind of re-echo uh, the comments of my colleagues and you know, express my appreciation for the report and for the presentation and for all the work that went into uh, making this, uh, making the report and the presentation. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think it's a great first step, and thank you. Thank you, council members. Thank you both very, very much. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, yes. You are also free to email me or whatnot um, also good. as well. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you for being so available. Very much appreciate that. Anyone wish to provide comment on this item? Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jeff Horn. Um, my very good friend, Sean Arlt one of the people who um, you know, suffered a mental health crisis and was shot by the police and died um, like two houses down from my parents' house. Um, I just want to say like myself, 
tons of people who knew Sean really want dedicated services to respond to that sort of issue. Um, I think it's super important. I don't think anything outside of that will ever be appropriate. Um, it was kind of hard to listen to the great presentation, thinking about all the things that could have been different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, still something I think about basically every day, not just what happened, but what could have been done differently. They were all responsible, 100%, the entire community is responsible for what happened. Um, and just as a community, I think that we should keep in mind that these you know, people this happens to are valued members of that community. Nobody wanted any of that to go the way it went. Um, and everyone can imagine how it could have been just better. You could still be here with us. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate the time. I really appreciate the report and that you all had them come. Um, and I just would really, really appreciate if everyone thought a little bit about, you know, if someone they cared about deeply uh, had a mental health crisis, how would they want the response to look like? With what would they want to show up at their house or, you know, their loved ones? Um, to me, it's extremely clear. So I just really encourage everyone to, to think about that. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I, I read over the report when it was posted on Friday, and I would just like to uh, say it seems very compassionate, thoughtful in that sense, but I think it's uh, incumbent on everyone to keep in mind constitutional issues and where we are at this particular juncture in history. Um, on the one hand, it's uh, I can see a, a good idea to not involve law enforcement in every case, we seem to be at a conjuncture in history where not involving law enforcement might mean you end up with less you less rights. And uh, we're, uh, I noticed in the report that it's mentioned that the county manager has the right to authorize any employee or anyone they want, I think how they used to put it, uh, uh, basically to have the LPS certification so that they then would be able to, you know, Determine that the person they're helping could be involuntarily, you know, taken in and, and put somewhere. And um, I, I think that's a very serious issue that needs to be kept in mind that this is, it, it might be friendlier, but it might in the long run mean a loss of civil and political rights. It's undetermined where the locations are going to be, where people might be taken to. And also I'm concerned with the wide scope of the, uh, of the applications for this. So a f someone I knew died a couple days ago and the police were there. And I'm, I'm kind of unnerved by the thought that when someone dies, it's not gonna be the police who interface with the community. I'm concerned that there's going to be a nonprofit organization that is going to be the interface for, uh, for, the, for, for our, for our uh, outreach to, to our fellow citizens. And I think that these are some critical questions that should be kept in mind. Thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon, rather. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and happy birthday, sir. Thank you very much. Seriously. Uh, I guess I read this information was at 32 pages on uh, Sunday night. Took some notes today. Of note, I'll say stories about older adults, welfare checks, and 24-7 type of programming. So in these pages, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's another number people can call instead of 911-988, which seems like it's a service number, and I think that's important. But here's a pretty big elephant in the room that's on page six, so I'm just going to read it because, boy, does it set up a lot of conversations that seems like if more people had read this, they would have made different comments. On page six of this, um, the primary responsibility of teams in this model is to perform risk assessments. In the state of California, Welfare and Institutions Code 5150, WIC 5150, allows all law enforcement officers, all law enforcement officers, or anyone designated by a county medical behavioral health authority director to place someone in an involuntary psychiatric hold so long as they are perceived to be an imminent danger or harm to themselves or others. 
When mental health workers are granted this power, it is known as having an LPS designation, where a county's mental health behavior health authority director has liberty to determine who has this designation. It is, it typically, and this is rather important, reserved for mental health workers with advanced degrees, such as master's or doctoral degrees in social work, psychology, or counseling. Oftentimes, licensure is required. So beyond an undergraduate degree, it's two to three years in a specialty graduate degree, and my understanding is two years of being in direct observation. Or you could be a law enforcement agent, or someone could just designate you with that power. Wow. Um, I wonder why that wasn't spoken by any of the council members or the staff that spoke. It's time to go. Okay. I'm done already. <laughs> I appreciate the liberty, sir. And I suppose I'll birthday. leave it I at that. <laughs> but I had other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Was I given three minutes or two? Oh, two. two. Okay. Thank, th you. thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, being out on the streets watching um, some of the people out there that have mental health issues, I experienced one time where there was one person who was suicidal, a young black man. He was walking across the street from the shelter and um, there was a call that he was suicidal. I guess he left someplace and someone called. So I arrived soon after, and there were 14 cops there. I have pictures of, I have pictures and videos of it, 14. I just, I can't imagine what that young black man was going through, surrounded by 14 cops. I mean, this is a time you want to have someone who's compassionate, um, something, uh, as, as something like Cahoots, um, instead of re-triggering um, the, the re -triggering trauma in this person's life when you're surrounded by police. So um, I highly suggest, I, I'm very much for a Cahoots type program and I'd love to see it here in Santa Cruz. I think, you know, I know Port or Eugene, wherever he said was the eight million savings. I'm sure you would like to have that. I'm sure it's gonna be lower here because Portland's a bigger city, but whatever it is, we could use that savings for housing or for shelters or for whatever we need to do. So I, I just I hope you look at the savings that we can make also. And um, I know the um, sobering center um, had, you know, is no longer in existence. It would be great to see that no matter what, the sobering center up and running again. I know it helped out a lot of people there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Joy Schendeldecker. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to speak. Um, in addition to what Abby just said, which I you know, have experience meeting people, working with people who live outside, being friends with them, but also I'm a parent of teenagers. And in the last few years, there have been several friends of my children, housed middle-class people, who you know, we wouldn't lump together with people who live outside, or people with disabilities, or people with mental health or substance use disorders in the way that we other people. Um, and several of them have had mental health crises, children, and the police have been called. And those experiences for those children and their families have been more traumatic or as traumatic as the mental health crisis itself. And so what I argue for, and many other people, is abolition and a non-police alternative emergency response. And you know, the way that, that 
this, um, the alternatives are being presented as, as I, far as I can tell so far is that there's still not a fully non-police alternative emergency response, you know, where there are, where we're helping each other, where it's a mutual aid response, where it's, you know, people, people helping people, um, which I think is how cahoots originated. Um, and, and I'd also like to say that three years, almost three years after the murder of George Floyd, this is a long time coming, just getting to this point. So it's great that the conversation has begun. It's really too slow for my BIPOC friends, especially the ones who consider themselves far to the left and abolitionists. And I would, I would like their voices to be heard and considered as part of these conversations as well, not just the more moderate middle of the road. You know, they've, they've told me that they really feel sidelined. So, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm just very briefly, I want to thank the mayor for opening up presentations to public comment, which have hitherto been inexcusably shut down, and we had to listen to a lot of people, uh, often with useful information, without any access. So thank you for that. And I just want to uh, kind of expand. Uh, I, of course, endorse cahoots as a first step, perhaps. But the problem also remains that the, uh, the rights and the actual power of treatment for people who are uh, being removed from the streets, uh, which, of course, is what really this is all about. It's, it, I don't think it's really about the mental health of folks. I think it's about the fact that there's a lot of people in the community who regard the presence of homeless people as itself a kind of social illness. And they like to put it in categories like drug abuse and breakdowns and uh, bad behavior. They've got all these categories, but the real es essence of it is they don't want them in their neighborhoods. I'll be coming back to this because uh, the mayor has given me more time to speak. Thank you. Uh, but again, thank you for allowing the public to speak here. The more, the better. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to make comment? Seeing and hearing none. I do have someone online. Someone online. We'll hear the person online. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, this is Ann Simonton again. It's a very emotional um, issue for me, having a son who, you know, has witnessed two suicides and makes him 100% more likely to kill himself. He and I both found both bodies. And this is, uh, you know, the... The level of mental health, the needs are increasing. We need to understand that um, Mr. Klimmers is an incredible asset and would be an enormous help to our community. And to think that we are, we would need to wait to, to see what the county does, why not allow Santa Cruz to be an example, to be shining as an example uh, of what can be done, the money that can be saved, and the lives that can be helped. Because as long as you know, uh, you know, Sean Alt and individuals like him. There was a suicidal man recently who had a tactile weapon uh, shot into his home. Uh, it, it, that was astounding to me that, you know, the military use of the police department is extraordinary and that we need to have this be immediately part of budget deliberations and to understand that Santa Cruz could be an example that would lead the way to show how this works at obviously uh, allowing Mr. Klimmer to teach and work with us to uh, ease a lot of the fears would be an uh, enormous asset. I was under the, I could never call the police if my son was feeling suicidal because he would, he would anger them and he would be dead. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else online? Uh, this is an informational item. Uh, we thank everyone who has participated. Mr. Norse, let me just be clear about something. Typically, we don't take a lot of public participation. This issue is one which falls, in my judgment, outside the normal kinds of presentations. We receive informational presentations. A lot of people showed up today, contacted council members and myself, saying we're very interested in this. We understand it's, a, it's an informational presentation. So 
at the discretion of the presiding officer, I am encouraging today for there to be participation in this presentation. I don't want people to think that every time there's a presentation, you know, Boy Scout, Girl Scout Day or whatever, we're gonna have two hours of public comment about it. We're not going to, but this one seemed to fall a bit outside the normal course of events. Please, please. Do. I would just like to do one final comment in that the three of us and uh, Ms. Murphy met with uh, um, the president of Cabrillo and Chris Monroe and student representatives yesterday for our first um, children and youth summit in um, the city. And what bubbled to the top for all of us was mental, mental health mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we're at a pivotal point in time where not only could it be a cost savings to the city to address this in some way, but I mean, I think there was a point in time when there wasn't paramedics on the fire engines, right? It was all through AMR. And so I think that however this gets addressed, it's not about the homeless, Mr. Norris, it's about the whole community and, and everybody um, with mental health off crises often suffer in silence and we need to remove that stigma and get in front of it to help save people's lives. And, um, and that's why I feel passionately about this. Thank you. Anyone else last comments? Uh, very briefly, again, thank you so much for this. I, I will say that, that a way to look at this uh, when looking at other models and the one that the gentleman brought to us today has been successful, uh, I think it's terrifically important. We are evolving as a society, as a culture, how to deal with pleas for help. Some of those are safety pleas, some of those are mental health pleas, some of those are whatever. I do wanna say this though. Um, I don't think people should labor under the impression that if we institute this, which I think would be quite a good idea, we'd have to work it all out, but, but, but quite a good idea. I don't think we should labor under the impression that means that there are savings. Because if what you mean by savings is now you're not sending a police officer to this mental health, you cannot call that a savings. I think what it does is there's an awful lot of calls which appropriately belong over on this sort of mental health social service side. I think what that does for our police department is flees, frees up our police department. Every time you don't have to go to one of those, you can go to something that is more serious for which you might not have time right now. So I don't think we ought to labor under the impression. I think it's a way to actually make the city safer by freeing up the police officers to do more law enforcement work and have folks who are over on this other side appropriately respond to that. But all in all, thank you all very, very much. We are on uh, item number six. I want to uh, point out that we will be returning to this item about 4.30 because we're gonna have children who are coming here who are gonna be acknowledged uh, for their uh, Hans Christian Anderson contest awards. Uh, we will move then to uh, presiding officer announcements. I'm going to uh, give my time over to council member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge um, Community Action Month. May is a lot of things. It's also Community Action Month. And this is something that's um, celebrated across the country, um, community action networks that implement anti-poverty strategies to help underserved individuals um, with stability and self-sufficiency. Our local community action network is Community Action Board, which I have the privilege of serving on as a council member. Um, I wanna just highlight one data from a recent, they do a bi biannual community action plan. Um, and they work with UCSC to do a survey and um, the preliminary data with this survey, which they were able to reach individuals who aren't typically reached through census data, like undocumented individuals, farm workers, um, individuals who speak and indigenous languages. So this data showed that 56% of survey participants earned less than $20,000 a year with the majority of them being farm workers. Yeah, less than $20,000 a year. That's here in our community. Community Action Board is one organization that addresses these issues. There's a lot of um, organizations in our community that do. Um, so if you all can take a moment to learn more about the work the Community Action Board does and to contribute in whatever way makes sense for you, I invite you to do that. I just wanna take a moment to th thank them for their work. Thank you, Council Member. We're on uh, statements of disqualifications. Any statements need to be made? Seeing, hearing none. 
Uh, we are on additions and deletions. Uh, Madam Clerk, any additions or deletions to no. our agenda packet? Thank you so much. City Attorney, close, re close session report, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon, afternoon. Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. This afternoon, the Council met at noon in the Courtyard Conference Room to discuss uh, three uh, items. The first was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. There were three matters of existing litigation that were discussed by the City Council this afternoon. The first was a case entitled City of Santa Cruz versus Service Employees International Union Local 521 pending before the Public Employment Relations Board of the State of California. Uh, on that item, the council, uh, by motion of uh, Vice Mayor um, Golder, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson, the council uniformly voted to direct uh, our outside special counsel to dismiss that case uh, pending before the PERB Board. Uh, item two was the case City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California et al pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, and item three was the Regents of the University of California et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz, pending in the 6th Appellate District Court of Appeal. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. Uh, the second item was a conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation, uh, a matter of significant exposure to, the lit to litigation. The council received a report on one item of potential litigation under that category. And then finally, the council uh, consulted with legal counsel uh, on potential initiation of litigation on one potential item, uh, and there was no reportable action on those. Thank you, sir. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar, items 8 through 18 inclusive will be voted on on one motion. Uh, there is an opportunity now for council members to either comment upon or pull an item off of the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda uh, or for a member of the public to do so. Let me ask, uh, we'll move around here, we'll start with the vice mayor, vice, Madam Vice Mayor. I just have a comment on 17. Please make that. So I just want to um, thank um, Claire Glogley and Matt Starkey on, uh, for bringing this item forward and making some improvements along Bay Street um, for for um, bicycle and pedestrian safety. They've done tremendous outreach. Kalantari, Ms. Kalantari Johnson and I met with um, them on site and they've done outreach to our parents at Bayview and to um, other neighborhood groups and I'm really excited to see this project and I wanna really thank them for their great work on this. Wonderful. Anyone else on consent agenda? Comment or items? Ms. Brown. Um, yeah, I um, totally agree. <laughs> um, a, a protected bike lane on Bay is is a really big deal, and I think we should celebrate that and, and uh, more than con the consent agenda allows. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I um, I wanted to pull item 11, and I also have had a request to pull item 10. So okay. I have a few questions on that item. Um, I'll just pull it. Let's do this. We, we will pull both items 10 and 11. We will take them up immediately after uh, taking up the modified consent agenda. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Anyone with us today who wishes to either comment upon an item on the consent agenda or have it pulled for further discussion? Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm going to comment on number eight on the consent agenda. I'm glad that number 10 and number 11 are being moved. I have some questions on number 12 and some questions on number nine as far as the minutes for that agenda item number Go nine. Go ahead, make your comments, certainly. Oh, I will. I'm trying. Okay, okay. And um, <laughs> resolution ex number eight, resolution extending the emergency declaration in connection with the December 2022 and January 23 winter storms. There's nothing natural about what happened and what's happening all around the world. There should be lots of states of emergency, but not necessarily this one. Our weather's being affected by both natural and unnatural sources. Um, trying to stay on subject, but wishing I had more time on the one on number five, which is of, is of critical importance and how it relates to number eight. 
is um, emergency declarations. I just don't know how I can politely put it together, so I can't. But I sure wish I could have and understood a point of order because I would have loved to have used it earlier. I'm sorry, what was that? Can I help you with that? What, I'm sorry, what do what you say? Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, about number five, yes. that we were just talking about the first step of 50-story building with what was presented in the actual information. And I, I, you said that this shouldn't be something that comes up for public comment where I feel it is of critical importance that it be discussed by the public. I'm no, I, I'm done that. because I'm done with the consent agenda. Oh, okay. I am totally done, but I appreciate oh, your time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Anyone else on the consent agenda? Mr. Norris, good afternoon again. <clears throat> um, this is, I'll be talking about a couple of items, but uh, when, you, when you're finished voting, voting and so forth. But this is generally about the consent agenda, a concern that we're, we're going to be hearing a police auditor's report later. We've heard about mental health problems at length, which I think is a very important topic. What we don't get, and this is again something that I brought to this council before, is the ability to see what kind of claims are being made against the city regarding the police department, regarding problems that have, have arisen here. This is because, though these are public records that are available, the city clerk and administrator has chosen to keep these okay, uh, secret. Uh, let me just ask a question. Yes. Commenting on a specific item? Um, I will be soon. Okay. But thank you so much. Yeah. I ask you to take some make some changes on this. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Anyone else online? Okay. We will take up. Uh, I, yes, Ms. Um, Watkins. No, I'm just. I'm willing to move consent with the exception of items 10 and 11. There's a motion. Is there a second? Motion is second by the vice mayor. Uh, exclusive of items 10 and 11. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries and so ordered unanimously. We will take up, uh, Ms. Brown, uh, we are on item 10. You asked that that be pulled. Yes. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I, um, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. This item is the quarterly update regarding City Council directed homelessness response programs and services, of which uh, there are, are a growing number. Uh, I'm really pleased to see the, um, the information in this report, and I think it's really a reflection of a lot of the commitments that have been made uh, over the past several years. Uh, so I, I want to thank you for that. Uh, my qu and then others, there may be folks in the audience who want to speak to this, that they asked me to pull it. Um, but my questions were, um, I wasn't able to find, maybe I missed it, uh, information to help us understand what's happening where uh, these, uh, where like for 1220 and the safe parking program in particular are full. Um, the report speaks to people being at capacity and um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk about what happens where people are turned away, wait lists. I mean, how, how do people begin to think about accessing these um, sites over the longer term? Good afternoon, Mr. Amali. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the question, Council Member Brown. Larry Amali, Homelessness Response Manager. Uh, the short answer is for ongoing capacity that we have with those programs, our out city outreach team, our outreach staff are really the principal source of connecting folks who, in the course of their work with available space at the shelters. Uh, the programs both at 1220 and at the City Overlook have been uh, close to full capacity for quite some time now, but there is some regular turnover, both for positive housing exits. Some people decide that that's not the program for them. So while they are essentially full, there is typically some available capacity at each of those places. And so our city outreach team works through the course across the city, um, engaging folks who are unsheltered and really trying to connect them to the space that we have or other programs that other providers have in the community. Thank you. I, a quick follow-up. Uh, I, I read in a, a separate document uh, for another agency agenda that um, the, the 
uh, there's a wait list for the parking program. And um, so I guess I'm just, if you could, I'm wondering how, I, I get it that the, the work is happening and our outreach workers are doing amazing work. I run into them out in the world and, you know, yeah, well, <laughs> they're doing a great job. Uh, but just, so do people just sit on the list and then they're contacted when a space comes up? Or right. how does that? Yeah, thank you for that. For the safe parking program, that's our tier three program that is operated by the Free Guide and Association of Faith Communities. Uh, that program uh, for recreational vehicles has a capacity of 15, and there actually is um, a large wait list of approximately 50. Um, and so the Free Guide uh, actually does regular contact with folks who are on that wait list. Uh, to make sure that there's still a need, or if there's a need, um, to keep that list current. They're in more frequent contact with the folks at the top of the list uh, as they anticipate openings uh, so that they can begin to do that work. So, um, yeah, so there is regular contact, rather engagement, uh, ongoing engagement with uh, those folks as well. Great. And there, is there a similar, great, thank you. And uh, similar for 1220, is there a wait list there, or is that? through your internal kind of transitioning people into that site. Right, that is for the outreach team, exactly. Sort of as the course of their work when they engage folks, you know, there is an interview process for 1220 as a self-managed camp that requires kind of a community set of rules and living in that environment. So um, they do it sort of their own kind of interview and assessment, if you will, when they engage folks to see who might be a good candidate for that program. And when there is capacity, they can be considered for that program or also the overlook. Can I make a quick comment? So, uh, because I, I, I just want to um, say, in addition to my uh, uh, comments earlier about really being pleased to see how this programming is, is being built out, I think that, that there are t the key takeaways here are we don't have enough capacity. Um, we don't have the resources to provide the capacity for the level of need we have. And so I'm also very glad to see the conversations happening uh, with uh, Collaborate, collaborating agencies. Um, so thank you. Further on this item? Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Matters uh, back before the council on item 10. The uh, recommendation uh, here is to receive the quarterly report. Motion? I do have Second. someone online. Excuse me? We do have public comment. We have someone online oh, for there public is comment. Thank you. Let's let's hear from that person. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. This is Garrett. Um, hey, as to the homelessness update, once again, has, that has always been the case. There's no mention of a numeric goal, time and delivery for a price of reducing homelessness that we may use to judge the program's success for cost. But instead, we just get a listing or proposals or a list of ever-expanding services and workers as if ever-expanding services or assets is in itself accomplishing that undefined goal and at what cost. Where is there an ongoing, detailed, and comparative financial analysis here of the total homelessness response cost, including staff and cost per homeless person, and the cost to actually elevate someone back into self-sufficiency? And where are those totals for this quarter? How many less net homeless people are there this year at what cost compared to last year? You got me. I don't think any, but, you know. And uh, how do you define success? Do you consider getting people onto welfare and into housing via welfare as eliminating homelessness? Do you think the city of Santa Cruz should be the Statue of Liberty for the county's homeless to become the welfare Grand Central Station Population Center? Do you think growing a bigger welfare state in Santa Cruz is the road to prosperity? Do you think blowing the whole $14 million and more in one year to establish a response infrastructure without a completely approved plan to maintain it is wise? Do you think, dang, if we could just house 1,200 people at any expense, like who cares how much or even no worries where the money will come from, and put them all together somewhere, then no one else will come to take their place and the problem is solved? Or are there limits, and what do you think they are? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Matter of respect before the council. There's a recommendation on this side. Motion. I'll move. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Motion and a second. Mr. Norris, good afternoon again, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I have to take issue with the idea that the outreach workers have been wonderfully successful 
and that they're doing a great job because I hear exactly the opposite from people both who they were contacting in the benchlands when the benchlands was being depopulated, destroyed in fact, without adequate shelter alternatives. And then of course now again in the Poganip area, in the Sycamore Grove area. Um, I attempted to, I, yesterday I was up there watching the police dispersing the area between Highway 9 and the river uh, and people were desperately taking their stuff out. I requested of Jeremy Leonard what the capacity was he refused to say it, kept referring me to higher authorities. This is what he is, does regularly. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to do that, and I thought I would mention it publicly, because I think it's important if, if a member of the public can't get what is relatively simple and open information, I'm wondering how homeless people are doing with this too, and I've heard unfortunate reports. So regarding this particular quarterly report, it doesn't mention as, I kind of take a different slant on it than Garrett Phillips, who just spoke with you, but it doesn't mention any of the costs involved and how effectively the money is being spent. And that kind of accountability has never been clearly provided that I've seen, at least it's not included in this document. I mean, you hear about, essentially, a lot of money is being spent for a fundamentally small number of people, smaller number of people, compared to the overall needs of the people who are outside. So the matter of there being optimistic assessments, we're working very hard. This is the kind of stuff we heard for years under the earlier councils. Uh, but of course, what's happening is a few, even more than before, are getting served. But for example, the broader community that was served in 2015 meals at Coral Street no longer is served meals. And that was the case throughout, of course, COVID. And who, what, the people that were served meals were served meals by food, not bombs, often under hostile action by the police when they tried to serve, for example, under the, the eaves of parking structures. Ten now, more seconds. Ten more seconds just to give you a sense of time. You told me I was going to have five minutes on this item. My error, you have your uh, error. You have uh, three minutes and ten seconds to go. Uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll, I'm going to cut it short anyway. Good, I know good. you're trying to fit into a schedule here, which um, I want to encourage you to spend more time on public comment. So that's the point. Um, so, do we know the actual number of people in town who are in vehicles? It's not in this report. We know that there's a waiting list of 50. Uh, as you've just heard from Larry and Wally, but you've got a capacity which is already filled and you're going to have, a, a, the city is spending money to appeal an OVO ordinance to essentially drive OVOs completely out of town uh, for those people who have so-called oversized or vehicles. So, so that this is happening, all these things are happening at the same time as uh, everything, everyone is, uh, I'm hearing hay, uh, praise heaped upon the uh, HRAP program or the homeless response folks. Uh, you have to consider what is actually happening to the average homeless person, whether they're getting the most basic services or have access to them, and if they're not, why not? And how much is it costing to give the appearance of a lot of progress when in fact it's not real progress for the majority? Uh, some obvious examples are of for the last six months there's been no porta potties, no services up at the Poganip area. They were pulled out. So you've had a hundred or more people up there crapping in the woods because the city decided it was somehow more cost effective to do that. Or as I said before in an earlier comment, is this an attempt to use the hide out or get out strategy, which I think is a go-to for the city with respect to homeless folks. I think essentially the behavior, well, the reality shows what the answer is to that question. That's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll be brief. My name is James Lee Whitman. I think I made some comparisons to the homeless. I don't know if the archives in this place are 
available for more than like starting three and a half years ago. But uh, what, you know, what I suggested to various people that were in service with the homeless is why don't they work on the strengths of the homeless? People are getting, people are doing things, holding full-time jobs, their kids are going to school, and they don't have correct housing. What makes a house? You assume it's secure, you, secure, you assume it's safe. But I was speaking more than three and a half years ago that we're all homeless. And that has to do with the technology that's around that doesn't give us security, doesn't give us privacy, and doesn't give us safety. So when there is actually some real emergency, we're all going to be homeless, and what are we going to do? Because I think that these subjects are kind of very narrow, and they could be broad. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? One more. Good afternoon, person online. You are on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, this is Reggie Meisler, member of Santa Cruz Cares. Uh, I just wanted to comment briefly on um, the HRAP. Uh, I don't want to disparage all of what HRAP is doing. Obviously, there's a lot of money going towards a lot of very good programs. <clears throat> I just think that um, there's some uh, problems with the balance of how we do certain things. For instance, uh, in response to the winter storms, as we know, recently with the Civic Auditorium, there was a demand to open it during the most extreme winter storms. Those demands were not uh, answered. Instead of staffing it with one person, we staffed eight police officers to defend the um, Civic Auditorium from being broken into, which I find uh, somewhat disturbing, uh, especially considering that the Santa Cruz Police Instagram is often toting their ability to operate in a social role that they cannot be um, tasked with just watching over the Civic Center as temporary safe sleeping. I, I think that there's some interesting uses of funding here, right? There's what happened with the, the Civic Auditorium. There's the vehicle abatement contractor, which was not a lot of money granted from HRAP, but is a position that we used some of our HRAP funding on, which works uh, in contrary to people's... It uh, works with the vehicle abatement hotline to uh, start ticketing and towing and green tagging people based on this unaccountable complaint-based system and is far more helpful or harmful than it is helpful. Uh, the other thing that um, ties in with that is that we just recently in April got a study that demonstrates that um, involuntary displacement is bad for public health. So when we talk about health and all policies, and we're talking about involuntary displacement, like what is being done or requested to be done in Poganip, we have to understand that that is explicitly evidence-based. 23 uh, different cities were looked at, I believe. Over a 10-year period, it increases people's overdose deaths. This is exactly what the Santa Cruz County Public Health uh, Officer was anecdotally describing is happening based on the data he was looking at. So when we sweep people, we are hurting them, we're killing them, we're making public health worse. And so I want the city to take this kind of data into account, because if you're not, you're just working for anti-houseless bigots and fascists. You're not actually doing good public health and good public policy. Thank you. Anyone else who is with us who wishes to make comment? Seeing and hearing none. Matters back before the council. Ms. Brown. Ms. Kalantar Johnson moves the recommendation. I'll, I'll second that, and if I could make one second by comment. Second by Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown on the motion. Go ahead, and I'll, okay. So I, I just, I wanna uh, make a comment in response to some of the things that I'm, I'm hearing from members of the public, much of which I agree with uh, about the bigger uh, social 
problems we have in our community as a result of um, extreme inequality um, in unjust institutions that are just <laughs> we have a we have a lot of work to do uh, to to try to move forward in productive ways. And so I, I agree with all of that. And when I am laudatory of what I am seeing here, it's because this challenge it is we have talked about this as an intractable problem. We have talked about this as something that um, we can't address, that we just don't have the ability to address. And when I see genuine efforts being made and positive outcomes for, yes, certainly not an, enough people, um, but for some people, I believe that's worth being laudatory of. And I think that, um, you know, with respect to the people who do that work in the field, um, they're, you know, they, they need to be supported. Um, and uh, so I, I just wanted to say that before we... Uh, take the vote, um, I do understand, and, uh, and all of those problems still are on the table, and we have to figure out a way to work together to, to address them, um, but we also need to be positive when we take some steps. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Ms. Collentari Johnson. Councilmember Brown took the words out of my mouth, but well, I'll just say, I'll say it my way really quickly. Um, the problem is huge. We're not the only players, and this is exceptional work. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who has, has gotten us so far in less than a year. Other comments? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. And the motion carries in order. We are on item number 11. Uh, Ms. Brown, you asked this item to be continued. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to pull this item because it, I believe it's, it's really an important item that um, uh, is, is a, a bit misrepresented in the title um, uh, in the, on the consent agenda. Um, the contract is to remove debris, um, but um, nothing is really said here about the, the people. And we know, uh, at least from the, the previous uh, item, uh, that there are 80 to 100 people that you, you are projected are in that space. So I, um, I wanted to, um, I think that, that, in, that if that's the intention, which I believe it is, that needs to be made clear. Uh, and so I wanted to ask if you could talk about uh, a little bit more about this process. Ms. And I Murphy, have, I have one again. real specific question um, that's related to this. Um, my understanding was that, and it looks like it's scheduled for May, um, and I, so I wanted to ask you about Sycamore Grove because I was told that uh, that was, was noticed uh, last Friday and that um, people were being uh, at least communicated with. The police were there yesterday, um, and so I, I thought this was part of the, the Pogo Nip um, the overall, um, and it, it seems like it just has happened sooner, so I'd like to hear about that as well. Thanks. I'll address the, the Sycamore Grove. Sycamore Grove, that location is considered separate from the Pogo Nip uh, closure process, process. And yes, it has been noticed. Yes, there's been offers uh, for individuals to go uh, to the Salvation Army. I believe we transported four just recently who accepted offers of shelter. So that is in the process. In terms of the, the Pogo Nip, uh, we will be doing a very similar process as we are doing with the bench lands, where we're um, doing outreach and we're working with the county to do outreach as well. They are out there every day. Uh, we are now uh, making plans, which includes the refuse contract, to move forward. Primarily, there's for several reasons for the closure. One is it's extreme fire danger. A fire department already has uh, plans to do vegetation management, which they have done before. As we know, the, the storms create a lot of underbrush, a lot of growth. That's extreme fire danger. So that's a, a concern. And as always, the public health, public safety, uh, the fo folks living there, it's a public health safety concern as well. Uh, so what the plan is to uh, take our time from about in the next two weeks uh, through June to do a phased closure and 
through that process of offering shelter, continuing to connect people to services, uh, providing for storage, very similar in the same process that was quite successful in the bench lands when we closed that. So that will be the process uh, for, for closing. And outreach is extremely important, again, and connecting with the county to help us through this process with their caseworkers. Um, in terms of this particular contract and what is difficult in this location compared to the bench lands is the bench lands is a very flat area, uh, much more, it's easier to work in. This is a steep terrain, it's quite difficult. Uh, it will take longer to close, even though it's a, um, not as many uh, tents. We have 65 to 75 tents that of our latest count. We're going out to do another count next week. Um, so yes, that's the process. Uh, again, very similar to what we did um, in the bench lands and offering shelter. Further on this item, any other council members wish to comment on this item? Anyone with us today wish to comment on this item? Anyone online? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No, I'm sorry, I, I just yeah, did. We, we do? Yeah. Let's go with one online, then we'll go one here, then one online, then another one here. So thank you for your forbearance. Good afternoon. Hey, this is Jared. Hey, I, I will be brief here. Hey, as to clearing the homeless Pogan encampment, I'm, I'm not up exactly where that is today, but I want to tell you and relate a story uh, in that I recall, you know, my cat escaped from Kitty Hill Resort, uh, which is right around there, about 15 years ago, and I went looking for him for almost a month all over the place. In the process, I had an eye-opening, a great many encounters with homeless campsites on the San Lorenzo River across Highway 9 while looking for them, mattresses, sleeping bag, trash. We're at that tomato farm homeless campground on Gulf Forest Drive and all along the railroad tracks. That was a really long time ago, and it sure seems like nothing has changed, uh, meaning not for the better anyway, except the good news is I did finally find my homeless cat under that underpass on Gulf Forest Drive, which was a minor miracle after about a month. And uh, I have no idea if that tomato farm homeless camp, uh, which is the first right as you go under the uh, underpass, on Gulf Coast Drive is still there. But you know, at the time, that seemed like a, a, a private property, you know, homeless campground solution at no cost to the city. And that was working pretty well. Uh, I did talk to a lot of those people there looking for my cat. And some of those people had jobs and they seemed to be doing okay. And they were just living in their tents. And I assumed that that was at no cost to the city. And uh, I don't know what happened to that, if it's still there. but. I just tell you that story. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. This morning I went to uh, Sycamore Grove and and uh, Poganip and walked around. Um, although the cops that were there would not allow me to go to the area that they already closed. Um, but yeah, they, they swept yesterday. And then another area, um, they put up notices to sweep on the 15th of Sycamore Grove. Uh, I'm curious. Um, it's an interesting thing that happens every single time is that the camp gets very dirty and messy and then you want to close it. But I'm curious, like, why can't a little money be spent on a dumpster and porta potties so it wouldn't be so messy? So you don't have to spend $250,000 to clean it. You know, I think you put yourself in that pos position. Um, basically, blame it, blame on people. And if you live in a house, you have garbage services. You have a garbage can outside your house. You know, so you, you can, so all you need to do is put a dumpster, which they did years ago, but they, sometimes they do it at the beginning and then they take it away and then all of a sudden they sweep it, it's too dirty. Um, so that's my uh, comment on closing. And also the main thing is where are people gonna go? 
you mentioned that 1220 is almost completely full, City Overlook's completely almost full, and as well as the Armory. So, you know, Jeremy has a little closed thing where he particularly note, he, he, get, he picks certain people, and a lot of the people don't last because they have mental issues or they have problems with being around other people. So they don't last in the shelter system, and then they're out back in there. It's just a ridiculous um, system that you're putting people in. It's, it's inhumane what you're doing to these people where they have to pack everything up and lose half their stuff. And just a reminder that just because someone's items are, happen to be um, at a location and they're not there does not mean that they gave up their items. The city is supposed to store those items. So today, one person's items were, uh, he moved from one part of Sycamore Grove to the, other, to the upper part of Sycamore Grove and he put his items there. And I'm really worried that normally you guys clean it. So um, you're not supposed to clean it. Um, you're supposed to hold it and put it in the police department or somewhere where people can grab it. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else online? Yeah, we have three people now. Three folks online. Next person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We'll go oh, to somebody yeah. who's yeah. with us here. He just, he's on now. Okay, now you're on. We can we can hear you. Please proceed. Yes, good afternoon. This is Michael, a resident of there. Paradise Park. And I drive through Pogonup area, um, the Grove area, twice a day, as does my wife. Um, I'm glad we have this month as senior month because we have a lot of senior people in Paradise Park. and. With the encampments near our entrance, there's a lot of fear driving through there now. We've had one guy accosted. My wife has had a, an attempted carjacking. All coming back to homeless people who are living in that camp, as far as I know. The other aspect I'm worried about, and I believe it's mentioned in your agenda item, is fire. There's a redwood forest there. It's not like they're in the city next to the river or in a parking area or any place else. They are in the forest, whether it be on the Pocomich side or the Grove side. I have personally seen people entering those encampments carrying propane tanks and gas cans. And if a fire gets going in there, it's gonna cost you quite a bit of money and there's gonna be a whole lot more homeless for, to deal with. I'm so sorry people are homeless, whether it's a mental issue, uh, living arrangements, friends or family, a lack thereof. I do take offense that people calling peop, uh, uh, folks bad people because we don't want them in the forest, but they don't belong in that part of the forest. Simple. It's a danger to themselves. It's a danger to society. And just recently with these heavy rains, the Sycamore Grove area got flooded out, and 20 people had instantly had to move out, and all their belongings went down the river into the ocean. And it's a terrible situation. They deserve help. They need help. But honestly, they don't belong in the forest. And one of my biggest concerns is where are they going to go, just like a lot of other people? Are they going to go deeper into the forest, become more of a problem? Or is the exit going to be managed so these people are taken care of in the manner that they deserve? So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you listening to me. And I'll lower my hand now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, hello, my name's James Ewing Whitman. I'll be brief. I went up there today. You know, from the mid-90s to late-90s, I probably rode my bicycle from Felton, Santa Cruz, to party, and then sober up more than 100 times. Now, fortunately, where I parked today and looked around, I didn't see any hypodermic needles on the ground. That was good. So uh, this is number 21. It has to do with the homeless money, the $250,000 for whatever it's going to be spent for. At some point, I'll make a connection from number five to number 21 and how it relates to number 11. You know, I think it's kind of pitiful that people litter as much as a corporation does. Because I've, for years in this town, it's a 
incredible how dirty it is that people ju that just don't care. Very much like a corporation, because the other side of that is terrorism. Ask the people who are being terrorized. I'll continue at number 21. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Another person online, correct? Good afternoon. Hi, it's Reggie Meister again. Um, I just want to echo a little bit about what Abby was saying, which is that there are obviously not 70 plus open shelter spaces for everyone up at the Poganip. And so if everyone asked for shelter, you wouldn't be able to give it to them. And so I guess I'm just curious, like, how do you see this kind of thing playing out with Martin v. Boise? Because you're moving ahead as though enough people will reject shelter space. What do we have, like three open shelter spaces? All we need is like four people to say they'll accept shelter, and now you can't sweep the camp. Like, are you taking that into consideration? Because this is a constitutional requirement of Martin v. Boise, is that if you do not have shelter space, you can't sweep. So I'm just very curious about how you plan, or how city staff, rather, plans to handle that particular situation. Because it seems as though, similar to with the um, closing of the bench lands, there's simply no consideration <laughs> as to whether this is even like lawful uh, to do. There's just an assumption that you can kind of get away with it if you do it in a particularly tricky way. Um, I think the other thing uh, that I would bring up here, just for everyone's sort of edification or sort of, I don't know, let's say it's experiencing, is that here we have, what, what do we hear from Santa Cruz together and Santa Cruz neighbors folks? Not in the city. Like we don't want them in the city outside city limits well here they are they're in the forest and people don't want them in the forest either right this is what happens when your entire like economy is mostly controlled by like the demands of people who are invested in real estate or the gentrification of real estate or the privatization of real estate is that nobody wants anything anywhere it doesn't matter if it's in the most remote part of the woods and they never see it and that never affects them in any way they don't want it there. And because they have the most sort of economic power in our economy right now, you're going to probably listen to them <laughs> over, you know, even small businesses who are not real estate based. So I just want to sort of call out this sort of interesting dynamic that even in the sort of remote woods, people don't want unhoused people. Um, so this is not, this is, it sort of reveals so quickly how unsustainable this nimbyish logic is that, oh, they can't be there, but I don't know where they can be, but they can't be there. Like, obviously, we know what people want and what works, which is tiny houses, individualized shelter space, even if it's not that great. And I think you can economically pretty efficiently provide that for people. So maybe start looking into that a little bit more. All right, thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Joy Schendeldecker. Um, three of us were campaigning last fall when the bench lens were, were cleared. Um, Mayor Keeley, Council Member Colin Terry Johnson, and me. And none of us thought that the bench lens was a good situation. We all want to protect the people in the camps and the environment. Um, but Mayor Keeley and Council Member Kalantari Johnson s spoke very publicly about how it was so unsustainable for people to be in the bench lens that it had to be cleared as quickly as possible. Now, I agree, like, that's no place for people to be in the winter when it floods. And the Poconip is nowhere for people to be in the fire season. Um, but if the bench lens was a horrible place for people to be, where vulnerable people were exploited sexually and economically, the Poganip is not better. And now the Poganip is being cleared and Sycamore Grove and as many other people have said, there is no mention of where people can go aside from the few people who will accept shelter space for the few shelter spaces that are open. And that does mean that there are going to be 
50, 100 more people who will continue to move around the city between spaces, wherever they can, as long as people don't have space to go where they're allowed, this is gonna keep, it's been happening for at least 40 years, probably since colonization. As soon as you exclude people from the system, they go where they can survive, mm. right? So that's, that's one point. And another point is I think that we've spent about a million dollars in the past year just on cleanups. And for, for Sycamore Grove and the Poganip, there's been little to no sanitation or waste management services for them. So $250,000 is gonna be spent again. And you know when they go in with their heavy equipment, they grind up debris that's left in the ground and it gets compacted, broken and compacted into the top layers of the dirt. I've seen this multiple times at multiple camps. There are better ways to do cleanups with people who live outside. There are better ways to avoid people moving from place to place unsanctioned. And that million dollars, I bet could have spent, you know, that's a lot of portable toilets and hand washing stations and rent, you know, and other living spaces. So that's all I got to say for right now. Thank you. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? One more online? One more. One more. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. It's Keith McHenry. And um, I saw, uh, listen to staff say that the bench lands eviction was very successful. And of course, the core part of that um, illegal and inhumane and cruel aspect of that, but of that. Um, sweep was that those people then went to Highway 9, Sycamore Grove, and the Poconips. That's where they went. So it was not so successful. So now you're going to have those people, and it may be many more people than what the what the city is admitting to, will be back down on the levees and in the doorways of downtown until uh, they get swept back in the Poconip. And uh, it's not a solution. And it's, uh, you know, every uh, few weeks we hear that Another few million dollars is going to be given to the city or the county to deal with homelessness. But all it is is uh, this inhumane, tragic disruption of people's lives over and over again with no actual solutions and no intention of solutions. And the reason there is no intention of solutions is the people on this council, the people in the Board of Supervisors, the people in this in uh, the, the higher levels of management and staff in the, in the city and county do not perceive homeless people as people. And that is at the core of the problem. The, your council has repeatedly referred basically to these individuals, these families, these people that are struggling as essentially trash. And that's why, you know, all through the bench lands eviction we, even for the two years of the bench lands, that we tried to negotiate with the city to actually provide real solutions, there was no will because there is a perception that these are, are, are varmints, are rats, transients, vagrants, drug addicts, mentally ill people. So they're not worth any resources on their behalf. We have, um, I think that Joy's, um, uh, underestimating the amount of millions of dollars that have been wasted year after year after year, which could have provided housing and, and uh, uh, access to addiction treatments and to health care and things which were never offered, never provided. And it gets down to that core thing, which these are useless eaters that at some point you're going to place in internment camps. And that just saddens me that you cannot at all consider these humans as the people they really are and that to you they're just trash and they can get put away in some internment camp somewhere else so it's really it's it's frightening that we're at that point in in our history of our country and of our city and the county good afternoon sir For the record, Mr. Norse requested in a timely manner additional time. That time has been granted to him on this item. 
Good afternoon. And, and a thanks to Mayor Keeley for that. Uh, you know, yes, it's, it's unfortunate that people are so afraid of homeless people as they drive through the Pogonip uh, from the areas where you can drive it. Well, most of them you can't from Felton. But, um, but remember, there are lots of seniors who are also living in the Pogonip outside. At least I met some of them yesterday when I was there. Um, and remember that you found out before when you attempted to move people without paying attention to the fact it's not just you have to have a bed for everybody you move. When you look at it moving a group of people, whether you have asked them they, whether they will take it or not, you need to have provision for that group. This is what the injunction was granted on the basis of up in San Francisco in December. So it, it's, not an, it's, not, it's not applicable here yet, but it could be so argued and probably should be so argued because this business of switch them around, musical beds that uh, Jeremy Leonard and others are playing, uh, perhaps under orders from higher management, this is not necessarily to blame Jeremy for that particular thing, is um, it's, it's, it's a scandal, it's disgraceful, it's beneath the dignity of the community. It's not beneath the dignity of the council. The council does it all the time, and the staff makes money doing it. So that's not, that's not really the issue. But the issue is for the rest of us, it sucks. It's bad. And it's, um, it also tempts an injunction. So for instance, uh, Ross Camp, when you tried to do this with Ross Camp, didn't fly, an injunction held up for a week at least. Then when you tried it against the Duck Pond area, held up for a, a, a year and a half. That, and, and, and the city decided that the actual proposal by the Union of the Homeless to use the bench lands was a good one. And remember where the bench lands came from. It came from police chief and city manager, not the city manager current, what, currently here, but the city manager. They were directed there. That's why they went there. And so to sweep them away again, I would hope that some legal eagles will, will in fact hold the city accountable for this and get some kind of damages because you're obviously creating damage when you do this. When you, when you, because I've seen people trying to try scuttling to get their property out, police officers stopping the press, of which I'm a member, I do a radio show, a net radio show, and I tried to get in there yesterday. I was stopped by armed force. Police officers said, you will arrest you if you walk any further. I said, I'm pressed. That doesn't matter. Well, you can't go there. You can't, you, can't, you can't help these people or document what's going on. They didn't say that, but that was the impact of what they did. And that's what's going to be happening throughout the Sycamore Grove and throughout the Poganip for the next month. And that's what this council is responsible for. Even the council members, Martin Watkins, Renee Golder, and the other ones who are not even keeping their eyes on speakers who are talking. I don't care about me, but I've been watching. You know, you've got other things to do than talk about this homeless nonsense, I know. Fo focus in. I am focusing because the council yeah, well, has the I, power. What, I, what I'd like to do is yes. just, let's not get into ad hominem, just address the issue. Well, please. I'm not trying to be ad hominem. I'm referring to the professional duties of council members here. Good, good, I'm good. encouraging good. the entire council to pay attention to these speakers, or at least to pretend Mr. Norris, to pay attention. I'm, I'm going to ask you again. Council members can pay attention in a wide variety of ways. I'd like, I'm going to ask you again, address the issue, please. Thank you. Um, I have been interrupted, and I will continue. Yes. It, it is my perception when a council member isn't looking, they're not paying attention. But if they're not, if you are paying attention, I thank you. And I will thank the council for doing that, if that's the case. But it's hard to know because the council's comments don't usually necessarily indicate that. So the basic issues have been raised. The notion of fire danger, uh, I, haven't, I don't know about the nature of fire danger at the moment, but uh, up in Felton, it's low. That's the, that's the situation according to the sign outside the fire department. So you certainly don't need to be going after people this last weekend like you did. But as has been pointed out, this is a pretext. And the real issue here is, for instance, as I've been told by some staff members, 
what happens at the shelters is they evict people who are in the shelters in order to provide room so the police can say, we have a place for you to go, get out of here, get off this area. If that is the case, it is, <laughs> I would hope it's illegal, and if it isn't illegal, it's scandalous and it's abusive, and someone at this council should request it be looked into. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online? No. Anyone else? Matters back before the council. Council, the vice mayor is recognized. I'd like to move item 11. Motion to uh, approve the recommendation as presented in the packet. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, second by, uh, excuse me, by Ms. Watkins. Under discussion, debate or discussion, Ms. Brown, then Ms. Uh, Bruner. Well, I, I actually have a, a few comments that I'm, I've been thinking about, but. I also want to be mindful of the time. We have people who are coming into the room to um, have a scheduled presentation. Uh, so I'll just say here, I have um, a long history, as you all know, of opposing encampment clearances um, for all of the reasons that people have, many of the reasons people have talked about and others. Until we have places for people to go, we will continue uh, to chase uh, people around it immiserates their lives. It costs the city money It's a dynamic that's been going on for as long as I can remember and I've not supported it um, and uh, But I want to say that in this case fire danger is very real um, It will become even more real in the coming months and I think it's important that we address this problem which uh, some of us projected would we, we would be facing uh, after closure of other encampments uh, and including myself who didn't support that. Um, but in this case, I think it's really important to move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Further on this side of Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the comments today and online. And um, this item is a uh, Poganip refuse disposal and abatement contract. Um, I walked uh, the area and the amount of refuse um, that was in that area was pretty outstanding. And um, <clears throat> I think, you know, it's really important that um, I want to respond quickly to a couple of the questions that were brought up in, um, you know, this isn't about a closure, it's about the cleanup contract. And um, staff did mention earlier about um, the phased approach that would be happening in this area. So the question about if there's only four shelter spaces and um, however many people above that, what happens? Well, um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I am asking staff, my understanding based on the earlier comment was that it pauses and um, then it continues. And I think the reason why that's starting now, this phased process, because it does take time um, before the fire, the extreme fire danger and a forced closure by fire department. Um, so given that um, we, we need that time to do that phased approach. Um, and so, you know, it, it's so sad <laughs> that we are here um, talking about this and, and it's so sad to walk those areas and see people living that way. And, you know, there are comments about um, people not wanting homeless people in, in their area. And um, I know I talk to a lot of people where that's not the case. It's, it's more about, um, or even the caller who called in, seniors living in Paradise Park and they're afraid. It's the behaviors that, they're, um, that people have a hard time with, not the people, um, at least, you know, people that I've, I've talked to and, and have concerns. Everybody wants people to get help and 
whatever their needs are to have housing. We have housing coming. So I want to keep that in mind that as we keep moving forward, there are repetitive cycles that we've seen. But at the same time, there are um, uh, uh, steps forward in terms of the long term that are happening that I think will have a positive impact. And um, we're not talking at all either about the fact that people wanting shelter or, or even help in the form of mental health or any other component, it's voluntary. So as we reach out, and um, I know that as a council member, I've directed to staff that our outreach is really um, happening. We had the conversation with, um, you know, uh, the, the presentation earlier, making sure there's less law enforcement um, uh, response, and, and those, those things are happening. But um, there is a people component, there's an environmental component, and um, um, thank you, city staff, for um, getting this area safe and clean and clear the, um, and for doing it in a phased approach. Thank you. Thank you. Further on this item? Very hopefully briefly, a uh, couple of thoughts. One is uh, I was not on the council uh, until till December, and so this is my first experience with, with this particular activity. As a, as a resident of the city, I must say that at that point I was uh, distressed by the situation that took place at Ross Camp and equally distressed uh, at, uh, at the Benchlands. Uh, uh, neither of those, nor is the Poganip, uh, a right and proper place for folks experiencing homelessness to try to live a, a, a healthy life. Uh, it's my understanding that when the bench lands was cleared, that something on the order of 70% of the folks who were there, something, uh, excuse me, something on the order of 30% of the folks who were there uh, were willing to accept uh, one or more offers of assistance, everything from some kind of sheltering option to uh, various kinds of social services spanning a uh, fairly large uh, uh, spectrum. And uh, it's my understanding that that was a similar number uh, with regard to, uh, to the Ross camp at the time. And as the gentlelady said a few minutes ago or just a moment ago, uh, these are voluntary uh, actions. Um, it does seem to me that uh, as we move forward with, with the challenge of how to assist those folks that are experiencing homelessness, that uh, we know the state is coming in and whether uh, people uh, will have a wide variety of views, whether this is good, bad, or indifferent, but the CARES courts are arriving. Uh, and that will be an entire public policy debate and discussion about the, the relative wisdom of that and how that is how that is assembled. That is a county activity as health and human services rightfully belong uh, for, for the county government. They are subdivisions of the state. They exist to provide health and human services. You can wander around this place all day and you won't find a city department of health or a city department of mental health because that's not what cities do. Uh, I think the helpful thing we can do on this uh, is to identify those opportunities for providing safe, clean, healthy housing, shelter, navigation center, permanent supportive housing, into which county government and nonprofits are going to pour their wonderful health and human services. Uh, as it relates to the current challenge, it seems to me that uh, it is not even close question about whether it is healthy or safe
for people to be in the Poganip for very much longer, given the wet winter and the vegetation and the and the fire danger. You can drive up to Felton CDF. Fair enough. You can drive up to Felton CDF today, and it will say fire danger low. Uh, that does not mean that you should keep people there necessarily, and only wait until it's extreme fire danger, and then uh, start thinking about what to do on that. Uh, I do think that both the city has a, has a greater obligation uh, than, uh, than what we have undertaken so far in that space. But I think the great area of, of advancement on solving the issue uh, really does, and I'm not trying to point to another government to excuse this government, uh, but the state government and the county government are designed to do this. They are designed and intended to solve the area, the kinds of problems that many folks spoke of today. That is not a city government role and responsibility. We do have roles and responsibility. And uh, we are going to get to an item later tonight, later this afternoon, which will go to the question of whether or not the public may want to have, have uh, an affordable workforce housing bond. And uh, what proper place in there uh, we could locate uh, a fund or funding source uh, for those who are experiencing homelessness and what is the right and proper element to be included in that measure. We will talk about that later uh, this afternoon. Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes is so ordered. I think we have a bunch of wonderful young people with us. I think I can see some right back there. There's one right there. Authors, young authors. <laughs> young authors. <laughs> young authors, come forward. We want to see you. We want to see you. Do you have a script? I do. I got it. Yeah, right here. So come on forward, youngins. We want to see you. We're so proud of you. Come on up. Come on. We're a long ways away from being able to bite you or anything, so don't worry about that. Well, my goodness, how wonderful to see you all. And, uh, so hello, uh, these are the creative and talented writers uh, who are the winners of Santa Cruz Sister City Committee's Hans Christian Anderson Writing Contest. We're so proud to have all of you and so honored to have all of you in council chambers with us. Uh, also kind of glad that you were able to see your city government in action. We were taking up a, a, an issue which is controversial in our community. And as you can see, there's a spirit of give and take and that's what we do here on a regular basis and uh, try to try to solve some public policy problems. But right now, this is your moment, and we're so happy to see you here. Um, the, our, our winners are, and I will try to, and, and please excuse me if I get either your first name or your last name wrong. I'm going to do my best on this. Uh, so Molly High Grunes with uh, Scarlet Bird, uh, Jasmine Harris, Schenken with Tight Knit Wood, Mira Stern with the document alone or the, the writing alone, Elena Kaplan with Herbrook, and then in the ages uh, 17 and up, uh, I'm sorry, uh, fourth grade, I'm going to have to back this up. Let me do this again. And it's you, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, then uh, we have uh, fourth place in the division for adults, ages 17 and up. The winners are fourth place, Eves Yagelnister for Gold Hearted. Also fourth, Shannon Bassano for firing up the old Studebaker, California Foothills, 1949. Terry Frett with Gifts and Challenges. Third place, Mary Flooden with The Magical Wishing Pond. Second place, Michael Warren Mott with 
Light Over the Mountain. Second place, Joan Preblich with Heat. And Janine, first place, Janine Selfo, and I apologize, I suspect that is not the right pronunciation, with Time When a Super Small Something Stopped the World. So uh, these are exciting titles, and we are so happy to have you here. Um, we are, uh, would, would, would appreciate seeing all of you. Stand up if you are one of these award winners. We'd love to see you. Thank you all so much. forward. How nice to see you. Mayor and council members, uh, thank you for having us over. We're really delighted to, to every year have the opportunity to have the writing contest and we have prizes for the winners. So please uh, stay around and uh, we'll give the, the awards to uh, our wonderful writer. I have to say this year was a really good year. Oh. And you'll find the fable on our website, the Sister City, which is on the Santa Cruz uh, um, City uh, website. And you'll find all the fables on the website, as well as a ranking of, uh, of uh, the fables. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. I'm the chair of the Sister Cities Committee. I just wanted to briefly add that, uh, give you a little context, that there is an annual Hans Christian Andersen writing contest that takes place in Sestri Levante, our sister city in Italy. And what we do is we run a local competition here in Santa Cruz, and then the winners are forwarded to that competition, which will take place in June this summer. And so we're really excited to have all these amazing entries, and we think we're going to have great representation this year. So if we could give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You two lovely youngsters right here in the front row, <laughs> would, you, would you like to come to the microphone and just tell us a little bit about your writing? If you want to, you can. <laughs> OK. <laughs> would, would you like to? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Well, we're so proud of you and so excited that as young authors, you would take on this challenge and, and, and do that good work. And we're so happy to recognize you for the good work that you have done. Uh, any other comments? Anybody would like to make comment on this? I just want to mention that last year during the international competition, um, Somebody from Santa Cruz actually won first prize. Wow. <laughs> the over 18 uh, age groups. So we represent. And so hopefully one year we'll be able to go in person to Sestri Levante during their week. It's in June where they have that all weekly event around the fable, around Christian Anderson. And it's really something we should try to uh, and start to click again. Thank you. Well, that's just great. I think what we're going to do here is uh, this is the the conclusion of this activity here. And I think what we're going to do is uh, we'll take a five minute break because I know there's council members that want to come down and say hi to all of you. So let us take a five minute recess right now.
After a brief recess, the council is back in session. We would ask folks to to come to order. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, we are on agenda item number 19. This is the Coral Street Visioning Report. Good afternoon. I see two of our outstanding planning department staffers. Good afternoon, Ms. Noyes, Mr. Van Waugh. How are you? Glad to be here. Good. We're happy to have you here. You're on. Great. Thank you. So um, my name is Sarah Noisy. I am a senior planner in the um, planning and community development department here at the city of Santa Cruz, and I've been the project manager um, leading this uh, project for the last few months to develop a vision for um, services, housing, um, all kinds of land uses and public realm improvements for the Coral Street area. We have a, I have um, also online with me Justin Duell of Dolan Architecture. He was our consultant um, on this project. There he is. Hi, Justin. And um, he's going to be joining me in this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then put it in this mode. Okay. Good? Okay. Um, so just a little bit of background about what brings us here today. So this uh, campus at Coral Street, um, the Rebelief Family Shelter and the Housing Matters um, operations have been in this location on Coral Street at the near the intersections of Highway 1 and 9 for um, many decades. Last year, the Homeless Response Action Plan was approved by your city council, and one of the um, actions that came out of that plan was under the a goal around permanent affordable and supportive housing was an action to partner work with partner agencies to deliver a plan for the Coral Street campus and navigation center and acquire needed properties. So um, a little bit out of order, the city ha acquired 125 Coral Street. And then we got to work on this visioning report to sort of guide, you know, the next several decades of time in this neighborhood and look at it with all of the various service providers and um, the community as well. So we're here today to talk with the city council. Um, there is no formal action that's required on the report itself, and there are some other pieces that we as staff are asking for direction about. So um, having the city council review provides another op an opportunity for your council to contribute to the vision, make any amendments or additions that you think might be necessary or wise, um, provides another opportunity for the public to comment and to provide their comments directly to you as a city council. And then also, as I mentioned, we're asking for some direction on our immediate next steps. Um, we did do a fair amount of outreach on this. We had two in-person community meetings. The second one of those in, in uh, February was also available um, online um, at, on, in a Zoom format. The first meeting in December um, wasn't really a format that was well suited to Zoom, but we provided that information, the questions, the, the content from that meeting was available on our project website after the meeting. And we got a lot of really um, thoughtful, rich, um, complete comments and thoughts from our community members. We, um, we also had two focus groups specifically with the service providers that are already working in this neighborhood to make sure that, you know, as we move forward, we're keeping all of their needs and their, you know, just knowledge of the needs of the, these community members in mind um, as we're moving forward. We made a point in both of these meetings of ensuring that um, community members who have lived experience with homelessness had the opportunity and support to be able to attend and participate. That was a really important piece of this for us. So just at a high level, sort of hitting the, um, the key points that came out of this, um, at the first charrette we had, the first meeting we had in December um, in person, some of the big themes that came out were around services, how our services provide, how does transportation fit with those. Transportation then also includes um, some mentions of uh, modes of transportation, walkability came up a number of times. This can be kind of a challenging area to get to on foot. Um, people also talked about uh, opportunities for career and health, housing, hygiene, food. Um, all of these were kind of themes and topics that were mentioned frequently in that in-person um, event. From the Con the same content was then placed online, as I mentioned, and you know we got a lot of really thorough comments that way as well, um, hundreds of comments online. And again, we, we're seeing some similar themes, so parking is also related to um, transportation. 
Um, we are still seeing services, housing community, um, you know, walkability. And then you'll also see the big one there is the SCRS, which is the Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studio. They are a business that is in the study area and um, is very interested in staying in business in that location. So um, they were mentioned frequently in the context of folks wanting to be sure that they could stay in that location and continue to do their business in this context. So um, just to introduce you now to the study area, this is the area that we're looking at. This is showing you, this map is showing the um, ownership of the property here. So we were looking at the area from River Street to the, um, the rail line. That rail line kind of provides both a visual and physical barrier there. So it made sense for us to look at both sides of River Street um, from the rail line to, or I'm sorry, both sides of Coral Street from the railroad to River Street. And, um, and then also grab this one parcel here that Housing Matters is currently leasing. So um, the purple parcels are the city-owned parcels. This is 125 Coral Street that the city recently acquired. Um, the blue parcels are owned by Housing Matters, who's the um, operator out there. And then these parcels that are shown in green are currently under a lease by Housing Matters. Um, and then these parcels over on the west side have are not owned by the city or under, controlled by any service provider. Those are privately held parcels. So just want to be really clear about you know site control and you know who owns the property and all of the things then that that may mean for um, the the vision and, and phasing um, over time. So at this point, I am going to ask Justin to step in and talk through um, the how we started to look at this project and um, sort of what we thought about for the campus. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you to the to the members of the council and, and the mayor for, for hearing us today. Um, we just wanted to put up a quick slide to uh, kind of highlight some of the, the um, key uses and areas of the existing uh, Housing Matters campus. Um, Sarah spoke to the Rebley Family Shelter, the Day Services Building across the driveway from that um, provides a, a number of, of key services um, and is the, the, uh, the home of the future Hygiene Bay if it's opened yet or not, but uh, we'll be there. Uh, we've also shown the Harvey West Studios project, considering it a, a, a part of the, uh, the campus that is already well underway. Um, and then um, across the street, across Coral Street, um, there's 801 River Street, which has been the, the recent renovation that Housing Matters has, has gone through with, with seven studio and one bedroom units. Um, and then the, the three pieces at 112 to 116 Coral Street that are currently leased. Um, so it kind of just sets the stage a little bit for um, kind of filling in these missing pieces and creating the synergies here between existing and future use. So the, what, what we'd like to focus on mostly here are the, the key opportunity sites that have been identified. Um, site 1, uh, 125 Coral Street, I'm going to actually talk about last, uh, spend a little bit more time on it. Uh, the other two that we took a look at are the site of the former River Street Shelter, um, which is currently shuttered, and um, and as mentioned, the three sites across Coral Street. So first at the, the River Street shelter site, we explored two options. Um, the first one is sort of a um, option one here would be a kind of low cost, uh, easier implementation um, that would not preclude option two from being a future use for the site. It, um, it essentially expands that um, the, the, the sleeping cabin uh, small community that has been an outgrowth of COVID that we've, we've witnessed being actually a really great success for some privatized, privatized space. Um, it introduces a, a little bit of um, additional parking um, near, near the entry at the sort, of the sort of mouth of the driveway as an, as an entry point, but does it in a way that really kind of tries to preserve a pedestrian character. Um, parking was uh, a key item that we heard. Um, and it also organizes those sleeping cabins around sort of a core uh, community open space that has a relationship um, in a way and sort of ex expands and builds on the, um, the current courtyard outside of the Reveille family shelter. Um, some outdoor community gathering spaces uh, was another kind of key element that we heard come up a number of times um, in our outreach. Um, option, whoop, sorry. I can go over option two, just very quickly, sorry. Um, the, um, Option two looks at a future use for that corner parcel, which would which would frame in the campus a little bit between Rebelly and uh, Harvey West Studios, creating kind of a sense of enclosure for this as a as a campus. Um, it um, basically it's a it's a podium type building with ground level uh, mechanical and some um, what we're calling programmable space to be very very general in terms of what its future use could be. 
um, and then uh, residential units on upper floors above. Um, for the sites across Coral Street, we looked at, um, at two options. Uh, the first one was essentially just a, a, um, an enhancement of the existing spaces that are currently, uh, currently used for essentially storage and staging. Um, just to, to get a sort of a yield about how many square feet we, we received in, uh, a fair amount of feedback from different service providers with some specific square footage needs um, this identifies that there are about 7,000 square feet that we could um, make use of potentially in, in um, more more um, more be better utilization for that space um, option two uh, one of the key components that we discussed and we'll see um, at 125 coral is the idea of a navigation center um, we, we looked at a way that um, ideally without impacting uh, the actual parking and circulation of the, um, the, the front parking area there, if we were to, to peel off one parcel at the end um, and enlarge that from a programmable space that we would be able to um, essentially come up with what would be about a 16,000 square foot navigation center um, as an alternative use for this parcel. We go real quickly through just the idea of four options that we looked at for 125 Coral Street, kind of a range of, of programming um, scales. Uh, first option, we know parking was a big deal, so we, we looked at um, basically what would happen if we created a ground level parking podium um, with some uh, some use fronting Coral Street, but essentially the, the, the balance in the back portion of the site being um, at grade parking um, with residential units above. Uh, option two uh, eliminated the, the the parking garage itself. We know that parking is an, an ex very expensive, costly item to add to a building. So there could be cost considerations that would, um, as we saw in the, the Harvey West Studios, there is no at-grade parking. Uh, they've, they've parked it on the surface. Um, it expands the ability to provide some um, programmable service space um, by doing so and also adds a few additional residential units at the ground level. Um, all four of these have um, upper floor residential units. Um, option three looked at the idea of the entire presence along Coral Street becoming a service provider use and that the access to the residential portion of the building would actually come from the in internal portion of the, uh, of the campus through the, the, um, the existing checkpoint. So you'd actually access from the back side there. Um, and then option four, which is, um, as we go into is a, a little bit more detail in the next slide, our preferred option, which... Um, combines three basic programmatic uses, pro pro programmable space in a general sense, um, a residential lobby, and then would implement the navigation center here as a part of this for a, a shorter term, potential shorter term solution. Um, so this just expands on that option a little bit further. Um, what we see here is that um, in order to reach approximately that um, kind of 15 to 20,000 square foot uh, target for a navigation center, um, that would span the, the ground floor and the second floor um, in order to do that. Residential lobby in this case would be accessed from the internal portion of the site, um, creating a little bit more of a community feel to that um, and how that's accessed. Um, also at grade, kind of similar to Harvey West, there would be access to some programmable space, which could, uh, could span to the second floor. Um, and then we looked at an option where the, the third level um, would actually could could be an entire floor plate of programmable space. There was a kind of a target number from um, HPHP that we heard about uh, 15 to 20,000 square feet that they would desire in a single space for their use. So that's about what we're able to yield on a on a single floor plate. Um, again, the upper levels would be residential units, and in this in this case, there would be um, potentially four floors of residential units over the three floors of non-residential space. Uh, the, the future opportunity sites, um, you know, the, the detail on those and what we did is, is considered, uh, is actually presented in, in the packets that you received. It's in the, the visioning report as noted there. And as Sarah pointed out earlier, those are privately owned. There's no control over those. Um, everything we did, it was a, was a visioning exercise and it was, it was really encouraged um, in some of, our, um, some of our interaction with the service providers when we had initially really tried to focus on those first key opportunity sites um, that they they really encouraged us to look at the entire project area as a whole for um, for longer term um, longer term development in, in 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 the future what could potentially occur um, we're not going to go into more detail on this in the interest of time um, but
but it, it was it was uh, it, it was encouraged that we look at the entire site, and I think that was about the the, the uh, extent we wanted to to mention those. And then I think finally, um, this was an, a, a few other items presented here that we just wanted to touch on that came from um, the community outreach and working with the service providers, um, mostly from at the community level. Though what we heard was, um, and this is this is has kind of uh, abstracted the building programs to look at the space between the buildings from kind of an urban design perspective. It was, uh, we heard a lot of things about, again, kind of creating community gathering spaces that could be formal or informal, um, some relationship as we see on the, the north side of Coral Street there, potentially to uh, a commercial space that could be inviting to the broader community at large. Um, again, provide some sort of a, a sense of a place, place to go, place to gather. Um, so that could be, you know, a, a potentially a cafe with outdoor seating. Um, creating some some sort of a landmark um, that breaks up the length of Coral Street and identifies uh, where the main entry to campus would be um, is located sort of right in the center there uh, near the mouth to campus and it, it could be done very simply with um, you know um, cr creating a well lit space there that would that would could en enhance safety um, done simply with things like paint um, to to just to kind of create a little bit of a landmark. Um, and then at the east end of the, or sorry, the west end of the street there, um, kind of just creating a soft space that might be like a little parklet. Um, again, you know, kind of having a sort of semi-public, semi-private interface where it's, it um, provides a, a, a functional use space um, to members of the community where they feel like they can gather and, and, um, and, and spend time. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I just have a couple more slides. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, what it would take to implement pieces of this vision, um, you know, kind of the pieces we would have to have in place. Um, we understand that a navigation center is a priority for the council and for the community. So there are some state laws that would allow us to um, use a ministerial review process to um, create a navigation center in this area um, under its current designation. As we've been looking at it, we do think there are probably some advantages of redesignating 125 Coral for a commercial use. I think that we think that expands the options, um, and um, we'd like some direction on that from your council. So um, we've also already begun some work exploring grant funding for design development and resiliency in this area um, in terms of energy and climate change. Um, and uh, I just want to emphasize that this. This location at 125 Coral Street, it, it provides a unique opportunity for expanding homeless services. There are not a lot of sites like this that are well located, that it would be the appropriate size um, to, to create something like shelter space and navigation and, and additional service space. Um, we, we do have other options for addressing parking needs, so I just want to emphasize that um, for the council. So um, just on this point, we are looking for direction about, um, you know, Development option 4.1, that's our recommendation. Does the council agree? Um, we'd like direction to go forward and begin um, researching and beginning work on the land use amendments that may be needed in that area. And then we'd also like um, your approval to just begin pursuing funding to go forward and implement this piece of the vision for 125 Coral Street. Um, relating to parking, um, parking is a significant challenge in this area today. And um, as we add more uses and users will continue to be a problem and, and a challenge for all of the users and visitors and local residents um, to grapple with business owners. So there are several things that can be done to start addressing these needs um, on the ground for parking. Um, new developments can use transportation demand management pro um, programs. We can look for additional off-site parking agreements. Currently, there's a parking agreement with the Portuguese Hall. Um, it's maybe a little bit far away. So we could start pursuing other off-site agreements that might be closer to this campus and provide some parking for employees, staff members. Um, we can partner with existing businesses to maybe build some new parking supply and then have some of that parking supply dedicated to staff and um, guests or visitors clients of the site. Um, or lastly, we could acquire land for parking. So um, relating to parking, we are also looking for some council direction on um, 
ideally to pursue the first three strategies in sort of the immediate term, focusing on primarily on identifying partners with existing available supply and then um, moving secondarily to um, other, other ways that we can incorporate TDM or can start to consider building out some new um, parking supply in the area. So just to finish up, this is the staff recommendation. I'm not gonna read it as <laughs> we've just talked through it. It's printed in the packet. Um, and we are available for any questions. We have some slides in reserve if there's other parts of the visioning document that we didn't touch on in the presentation that you'd like to look at in more detail. Ms. Noisy, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you for the gentleman that was on the line as well. Let me ask uh, if council members have questions that you would like to ask. We look around here, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much for the work and the presentation. A um, couple of questions. Um, in terms of uh, folks who filled out the survey and the community meetings, was there any way for us to determine how many of those folks were neighbors like, or resided in the um, neighboring area? Did we? So I, I don't know that we tracked, we didn't track not that numbers on that specifically and we we did, in our online responses especially, I know we got several comments that said, I live on Fern Street, I, okay. this is my address, I live on the next block, and you know, these are the parking challenges I'm having, or like, these are, this is what's happening on my sidewalk that's really a problem. Um, so okay. we, did, we did noticing to a thousand foot radius, postcard noticing right. for each of these okay. events, so um, we did have pretty good representation from neighbors. Okay, and then I have one more question for now. Um, I can't find where this is in the report, it says, if it is determined that the county cannot sufficiently contribute to or if sufficient grant funding is not secured to go towards the construction of integrated health services space, then staff would recommend that option four, without the dedicated health services space, be pursued rather than option 4.1. So it's whether option four or 4.1, and I can't remember where I read that. I just cut and pasted it in my notes. Um, so the question is, um, so we, we are being asked today to, uh, give direction on one of those options. If we give direction on option 4.1, how do we determine if the county can support in the funding of that? And that's gonna be a, uh, in the future. Um, so then how do we go backwards if we can't accommodate the resources to put forward a health services space? I'm gonna invite the planning director to come speak okay. about that. Mr. Butler, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Thanks for that question. Council Member Calendar Johnson, I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, we've already initiated conversations with the county and they've identified some potential funding opportunities that could be used. Uh, of course, um, those need to be vetted um, with uh, their county partners and in some instances, um, there are competitive um, grants that they need to pursue. If we are unsuccessful in that, then we would be reporting back to the council and we can identify for you that we uh, don't believe that we're able to incorporate that. Here are the reasons why, here's what the county is offering um, in terms of um, you know, potential other um, benefits. For example, um, long-term leases. Uh, initially, we were talking about long-term leases um, of the space for um, HPHP, the Homeless Persons Health Project and or behavioral health services. And um, just having those um, could be helpful in terms of the approach that we take with respect to um, uh, getting our financing lined up. But um, clearly, you know, this is gonna be an expensive endeavor and um, to the extent we've got funds for the construction, that's gonna be a uh, primary goal of ours. And then we'll be looking to partner with the county for the long-term operations and looking for uh, community partners to operate that as well. That's actually, um, uh, you made me think of my other question is that, so we are not proposing that we would fund the operations of, of whatever the services will be in these spaces. We are, right now, we're focusing on the infrastructure. That's correct. We would, we would be looking to the county, um, likely also to our Housing for Health partnership and um, to nonprofit partners, um, to grant options, um, but our focus would be on the infrastructure and looking for partnerships um, with respect to that long-term operation. Thank you. 
Councilmember Brown. Thank you. So, um, I uh, have two questions. Uh, one of them is related to the um, what's laid out around uh, option 4.1, which I, I generally look, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you've gone through this process and I'm glad to see that this is a possibility for um, us to consider today. But I am I'm wondering about the mix of programmable space to housing on this site, given we are given our housing crisis, our affordable housing crisis, given that that's such a big priority and that there um, could potentially be funding to support a project like that if it was, um, if, if the housing, um, the numbers were significant enough to make it, you know, kind of pencil out, right, as, as a, its own project. So I'm just wondering um, if you looked at the possibility of more housing um, and less programmable space, for example, in the event that we um, we don't end up filling that space we, for, with serv service providers. Sure, yeah, so um, we can just go back to that slide. So one of these other options could be pursued. So this one, you know, option two has just this smaller amount of programmable space so that, you know, any kind of service provider or office space for, you know, service providers could be in there. And then basically all the rest of the building for however tall it goes could be housing, right? So we did, sure. you know, we looked at, you know, all of these options and we, we do have a preferred option and we want to keep these in the plan for exactly that reason that you mentioned because, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Gotcha. Thank you. And uh, the other question was about um, the other, oh, I just lost it. Oh, this has happened, this has happened twice today. <laughs> uh, the, it'll come to me. So I'll just, I'll pass for now. Come back around. Council member, uh, the vice mayor is recognized. I don't have any questions, just a couple of comments that I want to be um, mindful of that, um, one, this is such a highly visible intersection for tourists coming into our town, and so I hope that it would be attractive to look at whatever we build, and I've heard that people taking the train, they have to open the gates right now, be, like, and so the train is also another one, so I liked that idea of that garden space right there that's along the train tracks where people are coming into town from the train. Um, I'm nervous about getting rid of the programmable space because the kind of people that will be living here really do need a lot of care and wraparound services. So having that on site, I think, would be paramount to their success. Um, and uh, another concern I have is I think if we can all remember before we had anything there, mm -hmm. uh, there the population of homeless people people in Santa Cruz per capita was less than it is now. So an, a concern I have is that it's kind of a, a magnet. And I know people say that all the people are, that are here from our community, I know that's not true. I've been in public education for 20 years and so many people come to us with the address 115 Coral Street and they bring their CUME folders, which are legal documents and they are not from Santa Cruz County. They're from all over the state. and so. I just want to be mindful that how much of our city's dollars we're investing in this kind of infrastructure and and if any of it's reimbursable at the state or federal level given the disproportionate amount of homeless people we have in Santa Cruz compared to other places in this city and the state. And with that, we have a lot of shelters in the city and I have been woefully disappointed by Housing Matters over the years at, with their partnerships with Santa Cruz City Schools, three shelters in my attendance area alone. And um, so I would hope that whoever's managing these, we have some MOUs set up where parents that are coming in to use these facilities must attend parenting classes and must get their kids to school. Um, and we shouldn't have to be going through SARB for families that are living and using these um, services. And so. If we want to stop homelessness, we have to look at generational poverty and we have to focus on the youth that are experiencing this um, situation. And so it's, while I think this is all really ambitious and great work, and I know it's taken years to develop, I have reservations. I just want to just say that. Thank you. Council Member Brunner. Did you 
have a I have to read that. I okay. remembered it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for this information. I it's huge report and a lot of reading, but I appreciated seeing all of the comments and the community meeting um, post-it notes. All, all of that was really helpful and important. And in considering the options and the recommendations before us today, um, I just want to understand and ask since, you know, this has been many years in the in the development that from what I understand and um, some of these options have been explored and may happen and some are just kind of there in, in theory or potential and um, I think there's some really good components in here um, and it definitely addresses the direction of from Council um, for Navigation Center, which was identified um, from previous work as a need. And um, the parking component is um, one that I'm trying to wrap my head around because it is a huge concern. And I, I remember in previous discussions, we, um, you know, m maybe we, um, uh, prematurely envisioned, but um, parking uh, potential, even for oversized vehicles, even, I mean, if one of our previous items was on the waiting list, for example, at, at Tier 3 parking, and, and what a great uh, site potential that could be for um, that as well, people in their vehicles, whether they're oversized or not, but essentially their homes and kind of that tiny home concept. And so um, in all of these, I don't really see that that is an option. And I'm wondering if that was explored. Um, yeah, so we did talk a little bit about um, safe parking and it was something that the community brought up um, at the community meetings. And, um, you know, we, we did some thinking about it, and the configuration of these sites makes it difficult to really create a very efficient parking lot, honestly. So it's kind of hard to go out there and say, like, there's not really room, but parking garages have, like, pretty specific dimensions that they need to hit, and um, the way the parcel lines are out there right now, we, we're not really hitting them. So it's not really the greatest location for that specific kind of use. Um, and I know that parking is a is a major concern, and as we add more uses here, we're going to you know increase demand for parking, and so that's definitely an, an area where we need to be pursuing more options. We need to pre be pursuing other ideas, and and we need to be doing that sort of in the immediate term. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, part of it is also exacerbated because we've lost the on street parking on Coral Street currently. So um, we're trying to think about if and when we could bring that back to sort of relieve some of the pressure. Um, you know, kind of all in the mix right now. Thank you. I, I mean, I understand that this isn't the, the magic solution for everything, and this site can't be everything that is needed, that this is only part of, you know, that big picture. So, you know, try, it sounds like as long as that was explored and really um, considering all the uses and um, that we can fit into this site best. And I appreciate the diagrams and, and the thoroughness of that. So, um, but the parking too, I know that I received a lot of emails from um, surrounding um, residents and businesses in the neighborhood too. And that was a high concern as well um, that parking would, it seems like it's already difficult and that it doesn't get taken away or get worse because of this. Like, um, so do you feel, is, is, is that your recommendation represented in 4.1 versus four? So our recommendation in 4.1 does not dedicate a lot of space to parking. Um, 
there are lots of places in the immediate area or within a quarter mile where we could augment the existing parking supply. You know, one of our um, community members came and said, why don't you work with Costco to put in parking stackers and then dedicate that to staff? And we were like, that's actually a really great idea. Why don't we think about that? Right? Like, and I think there probably are other businesses in the area that probably have something similar. Maybe we could work together to think about ways to increase their parking supply and then have some portion of that be dedicated for staff or for long-term residents or people who aren't like in and out. And then that can let the on-site parking be more available for people coming for an appointment or coming for a meeting um, and sort of just relieve some of the pressure in mm -hmm. that area. So there are lots of other programmatic things that we can do that we can look at for that. There are, it is harder to find programmatic solutions for services and for housing and for shelter space. Like that's really about the land and, and the dimensions and proportions of this piece of property. And so that's why that's our recommendation. We feel like that's the highest and best use of that property. And then, you know, the mix of housing to service to navigation center, that's kind of for your council to really discuss and debate, right? I think there are trade-offs um, and 4.1 is our recommendation. That helps to hear that why behind mm -hmm. that um, it is easier to find parking versus that programmable space, so thank you. Um, and um, my last question is, um, I just, there's um, the, the vision report and there were also a lot of, um, there was a lot of comments on certain properties wanting to be left out of the vision report and um, you know I just I understand that this site is what this is about and you can't look at one site without looking at the whole and the whole neighborhood so I get why that you know there was kind of looking out long term what could be potentials but I think in that process um, um, those properties were um, feeling like that was the intention of this city. And I just wonder if going forward we can, as, as we move forward, I hope there's more community meetings and, and communications that really um, help, um, help the understanding that, um, around that. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation and I had a chance to meet with uh, some of the staff in advance to get some of my questions asked. Um, I agree with some of the con concerns that my colleagues have brought up. I work in that area and I think that, you know, it is an industrial area, right? So we do want to maintain its purpose for workforce and we had Joe Beam now moving in and with this development, I think parking and transportation demand management is essential. That is a very congested intersection, is also one of the most um, dangerous intersections in our city. And so when you add people, you add a lot more cars and a lot more activity um, to an already impacted area, that for me is a, is a big concern personally. Um, and then you add housing on top of that and pedestrians walking around, et cetera. I think we just wanna be really mindful about how we're factoring in safety and transportation demand management. So I, um, I recognize the trade-off with um, the parking. I do give him sort of this now more robust use of the space with Costco, with Joby coming in, with other um, workforce development opportunities. I am a little hesitant, frankly, to not have more parking available, especially as we're thinking about bringing services and housing in. I think we just wanna be realistic about that. Um, there's also only one way in, one way out, really, too. So I know that's already an issue for a lot of people who go to the Harvey West area. Um, you know, you have to leave before Kirby gets out, right? Like, there's certain times that you just have to leave or else you're gonna be sitting in traffic for, like, a half hour. You have to factor that in. Um, so I guess I just say, all that to say is that I think we need to be really mindful of the entire area, not just the site planning and the impacts associated with 
um, adding more usage and more housing in that space. Um, and then definitely around the pedestrian safety, I think you know that's got to be essential. So those are just my comments. I don't know if I have any questions really. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I will have comments. <laughs> I was going to save those for uh, the comment portion, but I, I did remember my other question, and it's kind of related to the line of questioning that we've had here, or at least expression of concern about uh, parking and, and traffic flow, um, but also the the area in general. Um, and I, I think um, I was talking to somebody who uh, was, you know, uh, there are a lot. We've had a lot of people talking to us about this project, in particular the the private parcels, which I'll comment on later. Um, but the um, getting over the creative hump of connecting the um, north side of River, you know, what there's there's a lot of space there and a lot of work going on and um, a lot of potential there, um, and it, it, they're not connected. There's no way to get there safely, right across River Street, Highway Nine. So I'm just wondering how, um, have you been thinking about, I mean, I know the visioning project was for this particular area, but I'd just love to hear uh, if there are conversations, as part of your conversations or with others or internally about how we do that, how we get over that creative hump and how we can actually make use of that space to connect people Right? I mean, there's going to be ho affordable housing over there, from what I understand. There's going to be a lot of other things going on. Is there, um, you know, and the tanneries over there, and people try to get across, and it's not safe, and we know there have been accidents. So there's, like, all of those questions kind of um, sort of lead into my question about how are we thinking about connecting the both uh, Harvey West with uh, across the street. Across the street, yeah. So, so great question, thank you. That um, that was brought up often at our first community meeting. We were talking about, you know, transportation and um, mobility and circulation. Um, and as your council is undoubtedly aware, and I'm sure most of the community here is also aware, um, you know, we are trying to purchase a piece of property there from Caltrans. Um, the current vision for that inter that area over there would be for affordable housing as well. And so we have been thinking about, you know, how are we going to be handling circulation in this area, and how do we do we need to be, um, you know, directing pedestrians up to the light at Ensenal and cyclists, you know, to to turn to cross and you know come down so that there's a proper crosswalk, or like how else can we manage this? So, um, you know, we we did talk about several options, and um, you know at at this point in this vision, we didn't feel like we had all the pieces to really be able to put something complete together. Um, and, you know, I know that our public works team is going to be begin working on updating the active transportation plan sometime hopefully within this year. And um, we want to focus on this intersection and on this part of town as, you know, as a significant component of that because um, we do want to be supporting alternative modes of transportation. We all know we know we have a lot of folks that access this area on foot, on bike, and um, it's really challenging right now. And I, I mean, it's really challenging in a car already. So, um, you know, we talked about different ways that we could like sort of amend the existing circulation on Coral Street, and there were some sort of pros and cons of that, and we ultimately ended up just recommending that we keep the circulation for automobiles as it is now um, for a variety of reasons. And this is going to be an ongoing issue. I think when we get to the point of actually um, making a plan for the other side of the freeway, this is going to come up again. You know, are there ways to do an overpass or an underpass? Is that financially feasible? Is that physically feasible? How you know how how do we manage a space like that? It, it's all in the mix right now. And um, yeah, I wish we had like an immediate. <laughs> good answer for that, um, but just to say, it's, it's very much on our minds. Thank you. I just I just keep thinking about like built. We're going to be engaged in these projects, and we're going to have islands, right? And with people frustrated trying to get to either side, and and so I appreciate the, the response. For the questions or comments at this point by council members, we'd be glad to recognize member of the public. Uh, and while you're approaching, let me ask Miss Bush: Do we have anyone online? We do, yes. How many? Uh, currently two. 
two. Very good. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, yeah. Uh, um, I lived uh, there for six months. I got um, kind of kind of placed there. Uh, kind of a special license to be there for a longer term than most people. Most people were there for like a month or two. But I lived at uh, the River Street Shelter, which is now uh, decommissioned or defunct or however you want to put that. Um, one thing that went away when they took out River Street Shelter is really more or less just the corner of that property right there. Um, you know, at the intersection, uh, it's, you know, it's behind it. There's like a, a house, you know, next to the small parking uh, lot that's there. There was a house and they had uh, a laundry facility. That's one thing that's absolutely so critical. I'm not really impressed with them, you know, them putting in greenery or, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, like that's, that seems uh, less essential for uh, homeless people. Um, solar uh, on the roofs, uh, definitely, definitely, definitely important and useful. Um, so that, uh, you know, they have un uninterrupted endogenous uh, utility access. Um, you know, the solar will um, be continuous power for them if uh, it goes out for the city. Uh, let me see, uh, what else would I, I guess, suggest or recommend? The, the city, this uh, not the city, the, the county owns that, that rail, um, that rail area. The rail, the, the, I mean, it's quite, it's as wide as, almost as wide as this chamber. And um, I feel like I feel like if you re-engineered things, you could run the train alongside some, um, you know, maybe tiny homes like that going all the way, or I don't know, put a parking garage over uh, the clearance of the train. That's the only one train that uses those tracks. I mean, that sounds kind of extravagant, but you know, could you could have some kind of a parking structure that incorporated that space, um, and then made it kind of a unitary, um, architecturally unitary kind of uh, region or space um what else was i thinking oh yeah uh you don't need to put a coffee place in java junction is right around the corner uh chipotle is uh, really the only restaurant um i think going to chipotle and talking about it there you're much closer to you know it, the exact uh, uh reality of coral street um in some ways um, i wish it was closer to here you know coral street like you know give people, you know, a little bit more um, convenience because there's there's now a four bus that goes there and it's once an hour. And uh, yeah, access, an underpass, wow, wow, that's, that's mind-blowing. That would be incredible if there was like some kind of access to Harvey West that would kind of circumvent all that, that traffic jam that's just trying to go to Costco and get their steamer trunks of toilet paper and get out, you know, like, <laughs> that's how I view it. Yeah, I mean, it really is how I view it. Okay, thanks, folks, bye. Thank you, sir. We're going to hear from someone online, and then we'll go with you next afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. And the person who is online, good afternoon. Five, four, three, good two, one. Good afternoon. This is there Ken we go. Um, you beat the clock. Thank Way you to go. Your and some of you know I'm the Chief Initiatives Officer at Housing Matters, and I'm here to express mine and our Housing Matters support for the visioning process for this report and specifically for the options, um, 4.1, that includes the recommendation for navigation center, expanded medical clinic, as well as residential included. As Sarah pointed out, there's a great opportunity with 125 Coral and there are also the other properties that the city or housing matters currently own or lease, which are also um, opportunities for us to develop more services and some answers to issues that we've been hearing about all afternoon in the discussions regarding the Hoganip and uh, um, other topics that we've heard today. And we're also pleased with the people center design um, that in is community oriented and pedestrian friendly. I, we thought it was really thoughtful and incorporated a lot of the ideas that came out of the charrettes, which um, many of, or several of us from Housing Matters um, attended as, alongside other community members. And just wanna say that we're appreciative and committed to participating and planning for the future of Coral Street. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. I just wanted to weigh in on the discussion as I was sitting in and listening to all the questions. And it sounds like that you admit that there are problems in this report, that there are way too many issues. I was listening to Council Member Brenner. I'm concerned about the lack of parking, and I don't understand how you construct something and then just say you're going to have hopium and, and decide later how you're going to address how, um, parking issues. You know, the Costco parking lot is already impacted and usually full, so I'm very concerned about that. And crossing uh, Highway 1 and uh, River Street is already a highly congested area that can take you a half hour at the wrong time of day just to cross that area. So I don't think that you guys are um, really considering the huge um, uh, vehicle impact, so it's just a part of reality. And so I really do think that this uh, vision report needs a lot more work before it can be accepted, and that's just my opinion. Thank you. We have another person online, I believe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, Paul, we can hear you. Oh, great. I'm Paul Gallagher. I'm the owner of the Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studios with my wife, Jennifer, who is there in the city council chambers right now. Um, I just wanted to say that since Housing Matters took over the lease at 112 through 116 Coral Street, the parking lot we now share with them at 118 Coral Street is now being used for purposes and forced to handle volume it was never intended to accommodate. Uh, all the spaces on a daily level are maximized day and night. I'm looking at it right now and uh, it's just a real challenge and even a crisis for us here. And I'm just thinking that as soon as ground is broken on 125 Coral Street, where Seaburg Metal is currently, this problem's only gonna get worse. And if you open up parking on Coral Street, it's gonna have to be managed 24 seven. I've been looking at Coral Street for the last 13 years. I'm here every day and before the COVID-19 shutdown, it was a really bad situation with the parking on Coral Street. Everyone was living in their cars or living in a tent on the sidewalk for whatever reason. And you could give every one of those people a parking ticket and it would be very low on their priority list. Nobody was moving. And it was, uh, it was a pretty horrible deal out here. Uh, it put my neighbors out of business, Polar Radiator. They were a great shop. Nobody wanted to take their car down here because of that. And uh, my other neighbor, Asher Rios, with his lovely wife, Melissa, they've just been evicted. Uh, Housing Matters recently gave them a uh, notice to occupy. So they're out. It's another family business gone. And uh, I really urge you to look at this parking situation in a realistic on the ground matter uh, because um, it's not going to get any better, uh, especially as I look at this uh, option 4.1 on this great plan that got drawn up. Um, it's uh, it's going to go nowhere with this uh, with all the cars that everybody is connected to around here, uh, the clients with housing matters and also the staff. Um, and just being that this is my livelihood and I have everything invested in this shop, I could talk to you all day, but I won't. And I looked at this report and I appreciate your time and your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and your patience. Ms. McCoy, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here as an employee of Granite Rock, but also as a lifelong member of this community. So in terms of Granite Rock's position, our parcel is one of those that's within the project area that's currently envisioned as a parking lot. Um, as was kind of discussed earlier slightly, there's been encroachment of industrial lands all across the Bay Area. And so we've been at this site for over 60 years as it stands. We would hope, we would like to stay there for another 60 years. And so to plan for, you know, parking is an issue, and I'll go into that, but to plan for placing some of the much needed parking on sites other than those controlled by the city and housing matters can create some issues. And so my previous background, I come from 
um, working for the state as an analyst. And so I went through and kind of analyzed the projection, projected build out of what's there currently, what's the number of units and all of that. So right now there's about 144 units that supports about 200 individuals. And that's what I was able to gather from public information. From what I can tell, there's about 10 off-street parking spaces or so maybe dedicated to staff. And so under the projected build out, I was able to use essentially a conversion factor, which was the um, per square foot of residential, you're able to determine the approximately the number of um, the number of units, and so I was able to project that right, if right now there's about 200 individuals there. In the future, there would be about uh, 420 units housing 500 or more individuals with about 50 parking spaces, and that's not including 50,000 square feet of the homeless, this HPHP. So I want to be clear that we completely commend the city for trying this, you know, all the discussion that's occurred today. This is something that needs to be resolved. But I don't think that completely maximizing, pitting, providing services against parking is the answer. I really think that this report can and should not judge how much parking should be provided based on square footage or what's required by the state. How many, how many staff members currently are there that need a place to park? How many residents approximately have cars? How many, based on the clients that are coming to access services, have cars and will need a place to park? Or else there will incur more impacts in the surrounding neighborhood. And so then it kind of leads into the fact that um, right now the focus has been potentially on expanding within this project area on parcels not controlled or owned by Housing Matters and or the city. So we would like to highlight the fact that there's, you know, this has come up, you know, potentially slated for affordable housing directly on the other side of River Street from the project areas around four acres of land. Um, around two acres of it is owned by the city itself and it would require no acquisition cost and would thus start to minimize some of the costs to develop some of these facilities, which is already so limited. And so as Granite Rock, we've discussed with our oper operations folks, the topography itself from um, one side of River Street on the other, um, perpendicular to Coral, lends itself to an underpass. There's actually a steep difference in grade. So we just would suggest that opportunity or that be evaluated further. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Okay, we'll hear from that person, then we'll hear from you. Good afternoon. Hi, all. This is Kim Salisbury, a resident of Santa Cruz um, and former social worker at County of Santa Cruz, um, working with a lot of these folks. Um, I just want to uh, bring up a few things. Um, I know Harvey West is supposed to be expanding their swim center coming soon, and that will likely draw in a lot more people. Um, and even as it is now, um, a lot of families and children go there for summer camps and throughout the year. So, so back to the traffic issue and also just making the area as safe as possible. Um, I taken my grandkids there before and it, it could be a little rough in that area. So whatever can be done to um, just consider that um, but for the, the youngsters. Um, and I was just thinking about it, it is very difficult getting out. In there isn't as hard as getting out of there. Um, but if there could be some way of a safe walking path along River Street, I don't know, maybe with a little um, like a corridor or a fenced area, because I'm always I'm terrified that I'm going to hit somebody coming out of there, making that right out from the shelter. And, you know, and then especially if you're going right, no matter what you're doing, but just if there could be either some secure walking paths in there um, to make it safe for, for everyone. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that this will be good improvements, whichever decision is made and um, that it be an area that can help move people on to the next level and you know like it can be a rest stop and maybe not a permanent location so that people can move on to um, work and find housing outside of that area since it's already so congested thanks for listening thank you kim good afternoon by prior arrangement uh you are ms gallagher, gallagher yep. correct yep. and by 
prior arrangement in a timely manner, you have eight minutes rather than the, the shorter period of time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I promise I won't use the full eight, but i um, happy to not have the Here's clock going. Um, so my name is Jennifer Gallagher. I am the co-owner of Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studios with my husband, Paul, who you heard over Zoom, located at 118 Coral Street. If you're not familiar with our business, we're a one-of-a-kind hourly band practice space, the only one that is operational in Santa Cruz and pays taxes. We're utilized by hundreds of local musicians uh, every week and have been doing that for the past 13 years. Um, last year, the city launched the Coral Street Master Plan, and I was personally shocked to see our private local business within the outline of the master plan to which at that point we had no relationship or um, knowledge of. I attended the first community charrette on December 12th and was similarly shocked and pretty upset to see 118 Coral Street cheerfully presented as a future opportunity site within the Housing Matters campus. I watched slide after slide presenting all the different ways our building could be visioned out of existence. But at that meeting, what I did not hear was that they didn't own the sites. What I didn't hear at that meeting was that so much of the plan was based on property they had no control over. There was no mention of the impact on local businesses already well established in the area. In this plan, nobody talked about who would be displaced. I set uh, this stage to remind you all of how this master plan launched because the city, Housing Matters, and the Planning Commission would have you believe that including us in their master plan is not affecting us. That rebranding into the softer visioning project will help people understand that it's just an imaginary thing that could happen in the future. Because that's what I've been told and that's what I've heard at every one of these community meetings that I have attended. And I'm here to tell you that it's not true. What I'm here to tell you loud and clear is that we are being neg negatively affected and impacted by this plan and being including, included in this plan today. Because we share a parking lot, even before this plan, staff and clients of Housing Matters assumed that our building was under the control of the campus, which it is not. We own our building. We are not associated with Housing mattered, Matters. And this plan has only exacerbated these assumptions which has led directly to increased entitlement to our private business. So I just want to share with you a little bit of what entitlement looks like to us on a daily basis. It looks like Housing Matters clients parking in spots clearly marked Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studios and then being fully outraged when they're politely asked to move. My husband has been screamed at, threatened, and defamed on social media because he has had the audacity to ask people not to park in bands designated for our business. It looks like contractors blocking our parking lot during business hours while dumping a pile of dirt from Housing Matters Victorian construction on our front lawn because, and I quote, they had no room for it. Since Housing Matters took over the parking lot, you heard from my husband about the volume and how it's not even able to accommodate it at this point. Um, it's often impossible to discern which Housing Matters clients is using the parking lot to access services across the street and who is parking there to go buy narcotics around the corner? Because oftentimes, frankly, they're doing both. The result, this results in vehicles staying in the lot for extended period of, periods of time, tying up parking spaces our customers and other staff can use for legitimate reasons and reasonable lengths of time. I commend Planning Commissioner Dawson and Commissioner Maxwell who made a motion to adjust the boundaries of the visioning project area to exclude the three parcels on the western boundary of this project area that are held by private property owners like myself, yet that motion failed to pass. I'm here to ask the City Council to stop, negatively, to stop this plan from negatively affecting our essential local business and remove us from the planning area. Aside from my personal stake in the direction of this project, I also urge the council to force the city to not just give lip service to the need for increased on-site parking, but actually insist on a realistic solution. Seeking to maximize space dedicated to homeless services on the site at the expense of increased on-site parking is truly at the expense of the entire neighborhood and the businesses that I feel the council is supposed to be protecting. Um, the city and Housing Matters have not be able, been able to solve the parking problems of today 
So I have very little faith in their current vision for solving them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? One more. We'll take that person's testimony now. Good evening. Person online, good evening. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, yeah, a previous woman mentioned what I had been thinking of, of how uh, not much has been taught, spoken about as far as the parking impacts of, on Harvey West. Not just the parking impacts, but the impacts on park, uh, Harvey West neighborhood, the park, the pool, the children's activities, sports teams. It, it's just, you know, people are going to park there and impact access to uh, people who want to use the park, sports fields, et cetera. And um, frankly, I am just read the uh, Santa Cruz local report on how badly managed the millions and millions of dollars have been for homeless services. And it, it's really shocking. So um, in a perfect world, you know, this would be a great project. But in reality, I have my doubts. So um, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for wishing us good luck. We appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Bush, anyone else online? There is one more. Two more. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your time. And thank you all for um, not just the council members, but everyone that contributed to all of this. I know it takes a lot of time and a lot of work. So thank you for all that went into it. Um, I just wanted to speak and say, you know, homelessness is the result of policy choices. Our housing and homelessness crisis are the result of decades of intentional planning to exclude marginalized communities from housing and access to our economy and our services. And a problem that took decades to create is not going to go away overnight. And it is not going to go away without deliberate long-term planning and significant investments to address those decades of problems and those decades of discrimination. So while it is totally true that there are all of these problems that we've heard about today, these are problems that are not the result of the people that are being blamed for them, but rather the policy choices that predate many of us, uh, but that we have a responsibility to address. And while I hear a lot about parking, I just wanted to say parking should not come before people. It is absolutely true. We need to address impacts on the community. Doesn't mean that those impacts come before the wellness of people. And finally, to say that this is a problem that isn't going away. It is not a problem that is res the result of providing services. It is a problem that is the result of a failure to provide sufficient services and to get people back into housing. And so when programs are able to offer a pathway back to housing and we push back against those programs, we don't avoid the problems that people are talking about. We perpetuate them. We allow them to get worse. If people are parking where they shouldn't be parking, it's because they don't have a place to go. And that's not going to change by denying them access to services. It is going to change if we expand services and we get those people back into housing. So I would just encourage everyone to you know, recognize that these are problems, but these are problems that can be solved by investing in homelessness services. And they're certainly not going to go away and are only going to get worse if we don't make those investments. Thank you all. Julian, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, we have one remaining, is that correct? Thank you. Good evening, person online. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Keeley, Key Keeley and uh, city council members. Uh, I've been watching this um, uh, city council meeting for the last three and a half plus hours. Uh, and I'm always really interested in how you guys debate uh, very controversial issues, including this project. Um, uh, I'm the uh, CEO of the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce, as many of you know, and uh, this project puts us in a, rock, a place between a rock and a hard spot. We have many, many members that are in the Harvey West Park area, including um, the uh, um, Martine Watkins' employer, 
uh, Granite Rock that spoke earlier, uh, Joby Aviation that's moving in there, uh, and a number of other companies, um, including Costco. Uh, that area of the community has always been impacted. Uh, I, must, I must also mention that uh, Housing Matters is a member of the Chamber of Commerce as well. We have over 400 members uh, that um, represent 25,000 employees across the county. Uh, I would, I've been through many charrettes and council meetings and uh, programs to come up with a really well-planned project. Uh, there's nothing that the city staff has done wrong. It's just I think there's a missing cue. And the public comment you've heard this afternoon has risen that level of the queue. Uh, when you do a charrette and it's on a community meeting on a specific date, you get a certain group of people that attend. And that is a small percentage of actually the community that's being uh, represented in that region. I would encourage the city staff to go back and pull the, uh, through a survey the businesses that are in there and their employees. You need to do a short survey, maybe six or seven questions that uh, come out of this conversation to give you a better understanding of the impact that could happen, whether it's transportation, whether it's traffic congestion, whether it's safety on Highway 1, uh, congestion getting in and out of Harvey West Park. All of those concerns are going to be magnified by a very well-planned staff report. I'm not against this staff report. I'm not against um, creating more housing opportunities for the homeless population. We've been there for day one, working on that problem for 15 years as a, as a chamber. But I think the strategy is that you need the, uh, community input, but you need also the partnership of the community, including the business community, when you make this decision. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your hard work that you do for us. Thank you, Mr. You. Byer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon on this item. Welcome. Thank you, Councillors. I'm very pleased with hearing all the information. It's very informative. I just want to applaud the, uh, the most recent speaker, but one, for laying it on the line. We can't uh, sacrifice people for parking. And, uh, and all the problems, it looks like, Coral Street project may not be possible to really serve people and everyone else in the Coral area. So it's very important to consider whether uh, that, that whole thing should be sa uh, put aside. But if that's done, then you have to find another place. And I, I don't know whether it's available, but my daughter and I were walking along uh, out the west uh, in the uh, industrial estate, almost out there. Uh, and there were these, uh, these huge fields along the way, and you're walking out in that area. You know the town better than I do. There must be other places, but uh, people are what we have to serve. And so far, I don't see myself a clear way that that's going to be achieved by what's been offered so far. But I hope you will diligently look for that really fundamental solution. It's uh, a, a shame that we, it's not only just Santa Cruz, but our country is failing the poor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Uh, no. no. Anyone else wish to provide testimony? Last call on that. Matter is back before the council. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I have a motion which I've uh, shared with Bonnie, uh, which hopefully she can put up. I'll read it before saying another word. <laughs> so the, uh, the motion is to accept and file the Coral Street Visioning Report and provide the following direction to staff. Uh, one, to pursue option 4.1 as the preferred development option for the property at 125 Coral Street. Two, initiate a process to more fully evaluate potential changes to the general plan and zoning of city-owned property or properties. I think this, is, this should be housing matters as well. Um, uh, on the south side of Coral Street to facilitate the preferred project, begin pursuing funding to support full design and construction of the preferred option for the site including evaluating the funding for long-term operation in coordination with the county and other community partners. Continue to work with neighboring businesses and other stakeholders to find ways to mitigate parking impacts and identify parking resources in proximity to the Coral 
Street neighborhood. Uh, as laid out on page four of the staff report, I didn't include it here, it's pretty long, but um, those three items that you've asked for uh, to pursue and uh, parcels, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and then five, this is the, um, I think the, the difference between the, the staff recommendation and what I've got here, uh, adjust the boundaries of the visioning report project area to exclude the three parcels on the western boundary of the project area that are held by private property owners. There is a motion, is there a second? Second. Under discussion, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, I just want to say a few words about the, the, the project area. It is in, uh, ostensibly in my district. Uh, I live quite close, although I'm across the highway. Um, uh, and uh, I believe that this area is um, an area that has experienced <laughs> has had a very high low impact and it's, it's, it's struggled. Um, and it is an industrial area and I want to make sure that we maintain those functions um, and, and, and workforce um, op opportunities. I also believe that um, b rationalizing this area um, will address some of the challenges that we see there where we, we don't have, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's limited um, kind of activity and, and monitoring. And so having a fully built out campus, kind of campus there and a navigation center, I think actually will help mitigate some of those behavioral issues. And um, so I, I think that it's really important that we move forward. Um, I do support moving forward. I am very, very uh, concerned about the potential impacts to business um, and the neighbors as well. And um, so I, um, I, I added a little, I tried to make the um, parking items add a little bit more there to suggest that um, we really need to focus on mitigating the parking impacts um, and identifying those uh, possibilities. Uh, for um, for parking locations in, nearby. Um, uh, and then the uh, final thing I'll say is that, at least for now, I may have a response if people have <laughs> other things to say, but um, that, you know, for me, this question of including the, the private properties that are um, in this map, you know, I've, I've shared this. I, I recognize that the staff has a rationale for, and the consultants have a rationale for doing that. Um, but I want to encourage people to think about what it feels like um, to be in, or just to think, <laughs> imagine if you will, um, be in an uh, listed as an opportunity site uh, in a city that has um, pretty recently uh, eminent domained a property across the street. And um, so the idea that this is a property that is in our sites um, is is producing a lot of anxiety uh, within the community. And I think it's unnecessary anxiety. We don't have site control. We're not going to have site control. And I would like to see those parcels removed. Um, I'm happy to provide more uh, rationale for that if uh, I'm, I'm not persuading, <laughs> persuasive. Um, but th that's, that's just what I kind of wanted to try to get on the table for discussion. Ms. Collintar Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you for presentation and all the speakers. Um, you know, we spent almost the majority of this afternoon hearing from community members around how our, the challenges in our community around unhoused is, is just exponential and growing. And we heard a clear ask from the community that we need to respond. We are responding, but you know, that's, that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. Um, the concerns that are being brought up by community members on this item are very real. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Jennifer Gallagher, who spoke about the issues around the behaviors and how her and her husband are being treated and um, people feeling entitled to park there, those are really real. I'm, I'm unclear as to how removing this, the site from the plan would address those challenges. Um, and I hope that, um, I would like to follow up. I, w I hope that we can follow up to address the challenges of Ms. Gallagher's business and other businesses around there, because that's unacceptable for any of our businesses to be treated that way and to um, go to work in that kind of a working condition. Um, but I, I don't see the two of them connected. Um, going back to what we heard earlier today, that 
The issue is complex. The city has a role. Uh, we need to look at things holistically. And I think that's what this uh, vision document brings forward to us. There isn't a commitment, like we can't have a commitment that we would uh, do anything in these opportunity sites because it's not ours to say that we will. But it's an opportunity for us to step back and see what's possible 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the line. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying, Councilmember Brown, and, and the concerns of the community, but I do think, especially given everything we talked about and heard earlier today, we have to look at the bigger picture. And so for that reason, I do support these parcels being included, and, and perhaps something we can add to if, if you, if so, I don't think I would um, support this motion as is with number five in it, but if, maybe this is diverging too much, but I would be interested in adding something to the motion that looks at the problems that are happening right now with the businesses in that corridor and putting an action plan and supporting those businesses. Um, but that's maybe diverging too much. So those, those are my thoughts on um, the motion that you've put before us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. I, have a, I just have a question for um, the staff. So if these parcels were removed from the vision plan, could they be added at a future time? Or how could that impact the vision, if you will, for years to come? So the vision, so the vision document isn't really like a living document like our zoning code, right? right? Or our general plan, it's sort of like, you know, we did this exercise, we have the vision, and now we're gonna like move forward understanding the partners and like issues and concerns and goals, right? So I don't know that like, I kind of can't envision a way that we would amend it again in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of what it would mean for this, I actually was gonna ask for some clarification <laughs> on like, so removing them, are we talking about like removing them from every map and then deleting the two pieces like that show how those sites might change in the future, like everywhere? Okay. Um, so yeah, so so essentially what it would what that would mean we would remove page 40 and we would remove the top part of page 41 of the visioning report and just not show those parcels. So we'd essentially just have one site as a future opportunity site and it would be 803 River Street, which is currently leased. Um, it really only has sort of like one, it's a very small property, so there's really only one way to develop that. Um, and yeah, I mean we would we would eliminate some of the components that are called out as um, as desired for the area, um, but are only shown in those um, those options, right? So we would lose the open space components. We would lose this um, piece of commercial property that could provide some um, connection to the broader community. You know, those those would no longer be there. So, so this this oh, sorry, this really becomes a, a guiding document that. Maybe it's looked at 10, 20, 30 years from now with a new council and new staff. And certainly parcels could change um, over time, but it's something that uh, if, if those properties are all struck out now, you know, this conversation around whether they're in or not won't be included in that later when we're looking at the document for this year. Matt, I see you raised. <laughs> uh, Matt took the words out of my mouth, but uh, just to put a finer point on it, um, you know, over time, uh, given that this is a long range vision, were th the uses of those parcels to change or the appetite of those property owners to change with regards to what the site could holistically um, redevelop over time? Um, whether they're technically in this document or not with your approval tonight would not preclude exploring those opportunities in the future. So I wanna make that clear as well. Um. I wonder, I guess my, maybe a thought for the council or just in general, like if it could be shared that these are not areas that are, you know, targeted for um, incorporation, but at a future time, if, if say they want to move or there are circumstances that lead to that, if that could be, I, or maybe that just overcomplicates the situation. I mean, we would we would defer to the to the will of the council on that when it comes to the motion itself, but it is certainly accurate to say that those properties are not currently being pursued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I guess I, I mean I'm trying to reconcile that 
what I, I do agree with and understanding the bigger picture and vision for, for the long term. So um, I don't know if there's something that can meet in the middle there. And then, in, and then in regards to the neighboring businesses and other stakeholders to mitigate the parking impacts, there was a suggestion by the chamber to have a survey go out. And I was wondering if that's something that the staff is interested in pursuing or had pursued potentially prior. Mr. Butler. Good afternoon again, Council. Um, yes, uh, that's certainly something that we can do is, is coordinate with um, particularly the businesses in that immediate area. Um, and um, we've continued to have conversations with Housing Matters. They recognize that particularly as the, um, the pandemic occurred and we moved um, people from inside of those buildings due to social distancing requirements into the pallet shelters, those pallet shelters took up parking. And um, so we have been in continuous conversations with the um, Housing Matters team about um, how they can approach that and those are gonna need to continue. But those um, the implications for the parking on site there have implications for the immediate area and the broader area. And I think that's part of what we're seeing and hearing from the community is, is some of the challenges that we've had when we're trying to balance the, the real issues of, you know, are we housing people or are we providing the um, spaces for vehicles to park? Um, you know, both of them um, are um, important. You know, the businesses need that parking to survive. And um, when we had the social distancing requirements, you know, we did not want to turn people out onto the street. And so we, we made the deliberate choice to put um, pallet shelters in those parking spaces. And um, we're seeing some of those um, challenges uh, bear out. But it's, it's not just in this, uh, it's not just on Coral Street right, on, on Fern Street with Shanty Shack, and as you were mentioning, Councilmember Watkins, um, uh, over by the County Office of Education, you know, the, the larger area, um, I think um, we will need to look at it over the long term, and even in the short term, um, how we can address some of those uh, challenges. Um, we've talked about the development at the northeast corner of Highway 1 and 9. Um, that is a real opportunity. Um, as we look to develop that to also um, provide additional shared parking resources and, and benefit from some of that um, economy of scale and, and working in a, the construction that's going to be happening there. But even that's not the most convenient location um, to get back and forth. And so um, with some of these options, we need to look at potential transportation to and from um, if we're looking at options that aren't in immediate proximity. So. It's, it's a challenging issue and um, something that we are happy to work with um, both the immediate area and the broader housing, uh, Harvey West area. Yeah, no, I appreciate that and I, yeah, I agree. Um, the only other thing I'd say is if we're exploring off-site parking, you know, I observe families and parents with strollers walking and it's not ideal, you know, environments for a lot of families in that area and so if we're adding more people and then having them park away. I think we also just wanna factor in their safety and how we're thinking about that, you know, overall environment. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying that I think holistically, depending on where we, we go with this, but um, I think safety in that area for those residing there, those driving there, biking there. I mean, the Ensignal intersection is dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. It straight up is dangerous. And, mm -hmm. and I've, you know, bikers and that right turn, it's tight. I do it every day. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we, we, I appreciate the vision and I understand where we are limited and I, I, I totally get it. And we really need to think really broadly as we think about the, the just overall impacts to the area and the people that frequent it and live there. Thank Thanks. you. Madam Vice Mayor. Um, I'm really conflicted about this, and I didn't think I'd be so conflicted at this point, but I think uh, the, the community benefit of, you know, providing more um, services and homeless shelter space is obviously something that we need, but the community benefit of businesses in our industrial zone that also provide a tax base to support those other services and things we just talked about are also really important. I also think about a couple weeks ago when we were talking about parking and we were saying that the market would 
correct itself and people wouldn't build things without parking because people need parking. And now here we are, we're the people, we're the developers or we're the potential developers and we're saying, well, we'll figure it out later, we'll put it somewhere else. And so I'm just, um, I'm really torn uh, right now and I don't, I don't know where I'm landing right now if I'm gonna be honest. Mr. Newsom, on this side, I'm sure. Yes. Um, I'm uh, conflicted as well, and I'm really conflicted about uh, or number five, but I think there, uh, there there seems to be a good bit of community concern around these these three parcels on the west part of the project being uh, added or included in the site. Um, and it seems like given that they can still be potentially included in the future, it seems like there's community concern around that. There's also concern around and legitimate concern around issues around parking, what's been taking place at those sites too. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if this is possible or not, but a way to almost bridge uh, Councilmember Brown's uh, motion here, number five action with Councilmember Calentari Johnson's direction of wanting to give staff some direction to look at ways to address the issues around parking and the very legitimate parking issues that um, uh, Ms. Gallagher uh, brought up as well. So I don't know if that's possible or not, but some way to kind of Sorry, I just had one other thought. I think another concern is that by essentially doubling the population in that area, it's the behaviors that come with the population and would it drive out the businesses? That was another concern. And we did just have Joby move into the neighborhood and all this stuff. And so it's just like, it's concerning. Ms. Colin Tari Johnson. I'm having a hard time understanding how um, this item, the f fifth piece of the motion solves for parking or solves for the impacts to businesses. That's, and it, and it, and it limits our long-term scope. So that's. Ms. Bruner. We'll get there, we'll get there. Ms. Bruner. Um, okay, so my understanding um, with, um, excluding those parcels, and I think I brought it up earlier, is um, the the understanding from those private parcels, the anxiety that was brought up of um, seeing that their parcels are in maps in a discussion around um, some ideas of this area. And really, I think um, going forward, it just, it needs to be clear, apparently it's not clear, that these are ideas if those businesses no longer own that property or were no longer located there, that there's potential ideas. And it is a little um, not clear right now. So I think, um, you know, again, looking at the whole picture is important and I understand why those parcels were included in any discussion around this site and this area um, but I think to make it very clear um, that they're not part of the recommendation that staff is asking for direction on I mean they're included in the community meetings and the maps and um, so and and at, at some point if somebody and I know you, Council Member Brown, probably want to clarify your intent on number five. Um, but my question here is, um, it, is there a timeline on this? Do we have to vote on this tonight? Can, can we give direction to do the parking survey, come back after Public Works has like looked at this more holistically? All these concerns are connected. And really, I think we can make really good informed decisions with more data um, addressing all of this. So I didn't know if there was something driving this decision um, to be made tonight. So um, I will invite the planning director to come up because I can't hear him whisper through this barrier. And um, I will just say the t our timeline was mostly driven by um, potential funding deadlines. So. Um, we wanted to have this vision in place so should Project Home Key funds become available again, we would be positioned to be applying for those to start design of the 125 building. So that was that's kind of the timeline. Mr. Butler. 
That's that's correct. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, the um, the one thing I, I might add is that um, as we proceed, um, you know, making a decision on the vision report here is not a final time that the council would have an opportunity to look at this. Um, and in fact, as we proceed, I would expect that we would be providing updates to the council on here's what we are anticipating with respect to our ability to meet various grant uh, opportunities. And um, those uh, grant opportunities could even shift some of the programming um, that we um, seek to include within the project. And so it's, it's a balancing act of matching the funding um, uh, with the project and then also um, uh, the timing. Uh, so we do anticipate home key round three coming up in the next few months. Um, and um, we don't know all the uh, parameters around that, whether or not a project like this would fully qualify. But um, timing is an important consideration when we're looking to apply for those grants. Council uh, and Mayor, if I may add to Lee's comments and also just speak to uh, the very valid concerns around uh, the tremendous parking demands that are occurring as we zoom out and uh, think of the Harvey West area more broadly, including being able to, to visit, move, um, um, make connections to and move through this area in a safe manner uh, in ways that I know we all experience, whether we're uh, making a visit to Costco or, or uh, catching a little league game at Harvey West Park. So if I may just zoom out uh, to respond to some of the parking concerns. We have serious parking challenges in this area. There's no question, no doubt about that. Um, and we also have some really exciting opportunities to I think solve those challenges more holistically. Uh, we're not gonna solve those challenges uh, with this project alone, as we're talking about today, and I think we all acknowledge <laughs> that. But we are gonna be embarking on a Harvey West Park master plan, aquatic study, as well as moving through the development of Highway 1 and 9 as well as looking at safety improvements uh, in terms of how folks are um, visiting this area as they're traveling to downtown and back uh, and the, the challenges we've had around safety concerns in the past as well. I think all of that needs to happen concurrently with this work we're doing on the visioning effort. And I would hate for the parking concerns alone to hold up what I think is a re really exciting opportunity to leverage really kind of once in a generation state funding for these types of projects. So that's, that's the time sensitivity around it. Uh, not wanting to diminish in any way that those parking concerns are valid uh, and something we need to continue solving for uh, on a parallel path. Thank you for, um, I'm glad you reminded me and us of um, even the bigger scope of Harvey West and that whole um, process and, and looking at that and how that all relates. It is um, concurrent uh, work for sure. Um, I think it's just a little more, it's just vague and um, I think, you know, the community is looking for some more concrete, um, concrete information. Um, so as much as we can drill down on that, um, I think would be very helpful going forward and um, yeah, there's a lot here in this area. There's a lot here in this plan. And thank you for all the work that you've done um, thus far to bring a navigation center plan and vision for this whole area. Does the city have a role in supporting um, um, that parking lot at that address and um, supporting the issues there? Or is that a private neighbor to neighbor um, con issue? The, the 118 at, Coral? At 118 Coral? No, the, the city is not involved with that. The city doesn't own it or lease it. So, okay. yeah, I, um, those are conflicts between the property owners. Okay. Is, yeah, I just wonder if there's any way or any support that could be offered or direction. Um, for them. <laughs> and we can certainly engage with housing matters leadership regarding some of the issues that were raised today, whether or not we have a direct involvement in the parking lot across the street, they're a major partner in this work. And we certainly want to ensure that as the current operation continues, as well as future plans, that we're able to do it with a health, healthy ecosystem with the adjacent businesses. 
Can I also ask in the future if there's any crisp reports for traffic concerns in that area? To also, or, or at least for staff to look at that as well, the community request for service portal. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I can remember <laughs> the things that I was going to, um, I haven't been typing them, but um, I'll, I'll just circle back to the initial question that was asked about um, the, the, how the number five is going to address the parking issue. It's not. That is not my intention with this item. My intention with number five is to um, make a move that um, helps the existing businesses that are having the other issues that you, and I agree, and I want to work on those. Um, so I, I'd be happy to in, in, include something else to, to address that, but I am going to draw a line in the sand here for myself about removing these three parcels. I hear my colleagues saying, well, can we, um, you know, how do we keep them in the maps and assure them that that means nothing, um, that there, there's no threat to their properties. Um, but then we hear a response from a staff member saying, well, if we don't keep those in, then we're going to lose X, Y, Z. We're going to lose the, other, the amenities, which means we think we have them, and we don't. So I really feel strongly that um, if, if for those who want to actually um, – eliminate that anxiety, the only way to do that is to remove them from the map. And I just don't think it makes any um, really political sense to keep them feeling threatened by keeping them on these maps. So that is really where I'm going to draw the line. In terms of the question about how to work with um, neighbors, neighboring businesses, residents, others who are affected by what's going on in the area, I'm, I'd be abs I'd absolutely love to see uh, an additional direction about that and would support that, but I'm, I'm not willing to remove that number five. So um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So the intent of number five, the problem we're trying to solve for number five is relieving these businesses, these valued businesses with the anxiety and stress that they're experiencing with it being in the plan. Correct. Okay. So, um, I, I hope that that would accomplish it, but I, I think in order to actually solve for the, the stress that is upon them right in this moment, there needs to be further action and further movement. I mean, whether we are a facilitator of the parking site or not, um, we as a city can play a role in that. So what I'm saying is it's a yes and for me. Um, if it's a yes and for you, then we could merge them. Okay. And if right. it's let's, not, let's then... Let's do a yes and because I want to support this. So <laughs> let's do a yes and. Um, I don't know what the friendly amendment looks like, but some direction to address the real concerns that were brought up by the businesses, the behaviors, the um, entitled um, parking. Um, I have them written in my notes. I'm not articulating it very well. Let me see what I wrote down. Um, I got to find my notes. But I think you get the gist of it, is that direct staff or the appropriate um, departments who work directly with the businesses within the Coral Street visioning area to address the current problems that are occurring. And then I wonder if there's another part. Okay, hold, hold on just a second. Let's make sure that, that Ms. Bush gets that, and then we'll, we'll okay. continue on. We got it. We got it. We got okay. Ms. Collin-Tarry And I'm just wondering if there's another piece to it, um, a, a good neighbor piece, a condition that we integrate somewhere, either in the visioning plan or as we move forward, that services that are being provided there need to act as good neighbors. We can define what that means. Acceptable. Accepted. Okay. Ms. Bush oh, captured that. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, that's the extent of your amendments. 
those are agreeable to the maker of the motion and it's agreeable to the second of the motion. I might make a couple of comments. First, I uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I think it is, uh, I have some skepticism, I've expressed it to you before, about the uh, charrettes and so on uh, having more influence on this than they ought to have. I think that the charrettes are okay. I don't think they're terrific. Uh, I attended one. This has nothing to do with you folks. It has nothing to do with the consultant. Uh, it has to do with my sense that um, anything and everything that was brought up by anyone, including a five-year-old child, was written down on literally was written down uh, on a uh, uh, put on post-it notes and written down and integrated into this. I'm not saying it's bad. It's okay. I don't want to give it more weight than it deserves. Uh, I do think that what we see here is um, is exactly what it says it is. It's a visioning process. It's a visioning document. Um, in order to get the motion motion passed here, I understand the desire to go down a little deeper than perhaps we might customarily go on a visioning process and something we might take up in a in a rezoning or a general plan amendment process. But I think in in the spirit of collegiality and moving this along, it, it, it makes good sense. I do think that uh, any notion that we are going to, as the city, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, going to have some place other than Coral Street where we locate uh, our primary homeless services, whether that is shelter, navigation, housing, homeless people's health project, whatever it may be, it's going to happen at Coral Street. Uh, it is not going to happen someplace else. There may be a building someplace else that does something or a service provider or whatever, but by and large, this is going to happen at Coral Street. It's been established there. It's part of the fabric of that neighborhood. It's going to continue to be the case. I do think that it may be also helpful in this, uh, somewhat similar to what we're doing south of Laurel, uh, which is we are taking this 4,000 housing unit number from the state and we're saying some 40 to 45 percent of it's going to go in your district, Mr. Newsom, because that's what cities do, is that they grow up in their urban areas. I think that that's a similar approach we could make here, which is that there may be boundary issues going this way. There are not boundary issues going this way, which is to say going vertically. I do think that it would be quite helpful to have this be four stories, uh, whatever they're doing over there, three stories of housing. We should maximize this site going up, going vertically, not going horizontally is my, my sense of it. And I think there's a sense on the council maybe uh, that, that might, uh, might agree with that, might agree with that. I'm fully supportive of taking out the two private property owners, and let me explain why. We have a local business, a husband and wife local business, very unique business, not something that, you know, a trinket shop that you can go two stores down and find another one. Uh, this is a rehearsal studio. There isn't another rehearsal studio. They've invested their time and their money and their belief and they're building their customer base and so on. I don't think this city or this council needs a very sympathetic small business owner uh, to be opposed to this and to try to rally others to be opposed to what we're doing here. Uh, if at some future date, some future council wants to revisit this, that's fine. But I do think that it makes very good sense to take this out at this time and not to consider it not, not considering putting it in any other time, but take it out. I think that on granite, there's a, there's a separate reasoning, at least from my point of view. Granite has been there forever. That is an ideal site if you were going to locate a sand and gravel and cement plant 
<laughs> and, and a whole bunch of cement trucks driving all over the place, you would do it right there. It's exactly where you'd do it. Highway 1, Highway 9, Highway 17, access north, south, east, west, perfect site. They have an idea, they, they use their property the way they want to use their property. And uh, as best I understand it, they're in full compliance with air quality district emission issues. The, we don't have any zoning general plan issues. We don't have a bunch of folks uh, filing complaints against that entity. That's where they belong also, it seems to me. And again, from a political point of view, given how much I know this council will want to put all kinds of things at Coral Street. Let's not buy a problem uh, with either a very large industrial use or a very small family use. Seems to me to make good sense, take them out now. This is a visioning document. I like the idea that our vision is constrained to, to essentially the city and the, and the uh, uh, housing matters uh, properties. That makes very good sense to me. I think the motion is a good motion. Uh, I think it, uh, the additions that you've made make it an even better motion, one that I would be glad to support and the clerk will call the roll. I, can I get one point of clarification before we close the roll? Certainly you can. So I just want to make sure that um, within the outreach component of the motion is to have the staff uh, further discuss and kind of connect with the businesses around some of their input of the complaint. Okay, just want to make sure. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Let me check with my colleagues now. We have two remaining items that are likely to take a bit of time. I think we can perhaps do item 20 in hopefully 20 minutes or so. We'll see how that goes. Item 21, maybe not 20 minutes. Uh, a suggestion here would be let's take, let's make a rapid dinner break. Let's go for, uh, yes. I, okay, okay. Maybe we'll take those before the dinner. Is that your suggestion? Okay, and then uh, when we do, we'll take oral communication and then we'll take a, let's make it a half hour break for dinner. Is that all right with everybody? You okay? Everybody okay? Half an hour break? Okay, without objection, we'll, no objection? Okay, without objection, we'll, at this time, we'll move to oral communications, then we'll take a 30 minute break and come back on items 20 and 21. Anyone who wishes to address us or under oral communication, let me explain how that works for you. This would be you can address the council on any item under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Is there anyone online, Ms. Bush? Nobody with their hand up yet. Okay. Seen in here, are you, let's go. You're um. certainly welcome. My name is Shelly Silva, and um, I'm a homeowner. Let's pull that microphone just down. There we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a homeowner on Frederick and Bromer Street, and um, there's a notice out there that you guys are going to be bringing in those jump bikes back there, and I feel like it's not a safe location for us. Um, I guess the pictures is going to sure. be up here. If you submit those to the clerk, we'll pass those around. And you have a very soft voice. Let me ask you to just pull that microphone really a little closer hot. to you. It's really just a high squeaky voice. You're doing great. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is safety. Um, I live on the corner. It goes around Frederick and um, Broadway. And what they did when we moved in in 2018, they had the bikes there. But um, what I noticed is there was a high level of crime like our cars got broken into, my mail was stolen, there was a pipe in my son's window, but that's one issue. Being It's right out my kitchen window, I measured it's 20 feet, and um, what I'm trying to do is, on those pictures, you can see the bikes go right around Frederick, which the street is at an angle like this, 
and there's flooding. So we get all this water, and then your bikes are at an angle like this, and there's about 20 bikes in that picture, and it's clogging my drains. So then it's flooding my yard. Mm -hmm. And so it floods that whole Broadway street. So I talked to, um, her name is Claire in Public Works, mm -hmm. and I told her about this issue in 2019, and it, she said, well, you have to call Jump Bikes directly, that there's nothing that we can do um, with this. It's just not part of us. So anyways, what I did is I kept calling them, had them come out and do a cleanup of it, but it still didn't fix the problem. So. No, no, take, if you need to take a couple more seconds, go ahead. Okay, I'm just trying to say a safety issue is when you're getting those bikes, you're going into the street on Broadway, and people don't stop at that corner. I have a camera there. You can see that they just burn, burn around those corners. And so I feel... As a, as a parent, you're, you're doing your phone to, to get the bike to work, and their kids are like, doing, doing, walk. you know, they're not paying attention, and they're pulling it right into the street. I feel like this is just not a safe location. So I told her about this, and I said, can you just move it somewhere else? This is a residential. We need the parking. It's around the corner. Nobody stops her. And she's like, this is where the permit is. And so I said, I need to talk to your supervisor. She got mad on the phone. He's also in public works. He's an engineer. And so hopefully, with your help, his help, you could just move it down to um, the park down there. There's that Frederick Park, the dog park. Mm -hmm. So at least it wouldn't be high traffic. You have four corners there. Nobody, believe me, nobody stops there. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And let me, uh, I don't know that you've appeared here before, but let me make sure you understand how this works. Yeah. So this particular part of the council meeting, what we can't do yeah. is so take any action or commit anything to you. No, no, no. Because, well, uh, but, but we sort of can, which okay. is my guess is the city manager heard everything you had to say. Yeah. My guess is you're going to hear a follow-up. Okay. I'll provide a really quick update, although we don't typically do this. Um, I did receive a chat from our staff that they're already in process of relocating that station. That's what. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because it was just not smart. It was just like, I could hear people trash bottles out my window. And I was just like, all night long, okay. who, who wants well, that? Thank you, thank you. It's all good. Thank you very much. You keep my picture. Thanks for coming. That's okay. Thank you. We appreciate it. Ms. Bush, anyone online? We're going to take one online, then we'll take you, sir. Good enough. Uh, person online, good evening. Hi. Um, Mr. Meisler. Yep. I just wanted to really quickly just make a quick point about health and human services. About, um, about what? Say it again. We, health and human services? Cer certainly. <laughs> yeah. So the health and human services, while it is traditionally not a city department, there are some cities like Berkeley that do have a health and human services department. Mm -hmm. uh, and one incredibly valuable reason to have, not necessarily a fully uh, functional county level health and human services department, but at least a smaller version, is that when it comes time to open up emergency shelter, for instance, for the unhoused, we can have a dedicated staff member that can very quickly respond to such emergency uh, service requests uh, because that was the reason that was cited why we couldn't do the uh, Civic Center during the last emergency shelters that we were sort of in a holding pattern with the county to provide staff for that. Um, if we had a city health and human services, we would be able to rapidly respond to emergency health and human service needs. Uh, and I think that would be much more appropriate than trying to have some sort of rapid response coordination between multiple levels of government. Um, so, yeah, just something to think about there. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Meisler. Good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm uh, kind of confused to hear the jump bikes are back. When they uh, went away, uh, I was like, Okay, jump bikes are, are gone. I you know I kind of could have predicted this. Um, so uh, you know it's like the couch is dead. Long live the couch. Okay, great. Jump bikes. I call them jump bikes because um, 
you know, uh, you have to jump over them when people leave them in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, the, uh, let's see, um, I, I've been reading a lot about um, the George Floyd, um, uh, let's see, the uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which they were, they were pushing for uh, early, in, um, early in the year, uh, January, uh, February, you're hearing about in the news. I haven't heard much about it, and uh, you know, um, the articles that I've been able to you know, just casually, uh, you know, in cursory manner, uh, look up on the internet. Um, you don't, you don't, uh, I mean, you don't see that they've made progress with that, um, which is too bad um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the way we police our communities uh, is, uh, you know, is pertinent to, you know, everybody's, everybody's health and safety. It's, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things off the whitehouse.gov website says it's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, criminal, um, like an interest in, uh, you know, in uh, abating crime and an interest in, um, um, in, in, an interest in social justice are not uh, exclusive, they're mutually reinforcing goals. Um, I, I like, I like some of the things that you, you could, you could really, you could really, you know, kind of apply some of these, uh, these uh, um, uh, goals they have in the, in the, in the George, uh, uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, yeah, like uh, mobile, uh, let me see, mobile crisis response, de-escalation training, um, anti-bias training, uh, let's see, uh, help prevent crimes from occurring in the first place, mental health and substance use uh, disorder services. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else online? One more online? Good evening, person online. Yes, this is good. Hey, the last time the West Cliff Drive response plan was presented, many people felt the attitude was one of, oh, well, climate change, the road fell in, better make it one way, la-di-da, cut and run retreat is the plan. I hope and sense that the attitude is changing to take a firm stand in assigning a first priority to protecting valuable homes and valuable public transport and recreational property by holding the erosion line at the most vulnerable West Cliff sites with additional and stronger revetments while considering traffic changes only if they constitute an improvement. Unless there is an engineering or unsolvable reason, I don't see why the line to hold shouldn't include the now missing pathway to allow the maximum use. Why give up anything? I attended the London Nelson Center West Cliff Drive event, which was much needed, but I still didn't quite hear that commitment, but almost. What I don't want to see or hear is some phony public engagement or phony study where the decision, as it seemed before, has really already been made to do the least, actually a retreat, uh, where it is made to look like all the public wants is a bike lane. It warmed my heart to see nobody was at the climate change table because nobody except the fringe wants to see Westcliff Drive fall any more into the sea without doing 100% of whatever it takes to prevent that happening. The Save Westcliff leaders are pushing, in my opinion, an historical and false history lesson, claiming 350 yards of cliff has eroded in the last 100 years, citing aerial photos. Well, I looked at that evidence, and that 1928 photo shows a fuzzy picture of cliff where factors of wind taken relative to tides, time of year, whatever, uh, and a lower sea level make accurate interpretation difficult, but is real clear where the ocean is, and we haven't lost more than 50 yards. Okay, since Delaware Plateau Alta all existed back then, and they're laid out on perfect 100-yard intervals, my measurements indicate, again, about 50 to 70 yards at Woodrow has been lost in those 95 years, not 350. That's still 18 to 24 inches a year, not six feet. And I wish I could say more, but very precise measurements of erosion have been taken uh, with high-res LIDAR, and, and the erosion's really one to two and a half inches a year not two feet. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you again for uh, listening. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, read something from the Brown Act, uh, and that's in relation to the invitation that I'm benefiting from now of uh, talking about something that is not on the agenda. But the question is whether there should be that restriction of not on the agenda. But that's the, that's the question I want to ask about. Doesn't the, ground, the Brown Act really require uh, 
the council to have an agenda which is open to the public to ask about the agenda. That is to focus on and understand the deliberation, deliberations of the council when it's making all these decisions. I found that all the discussion here very interesting, but oh, let me read out. It's the, the Brown Act starts out by saying, the legislature finds and declares that the public councils and agencies in the state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. It is the intent of the law that their actions be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. And it goes on later, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments they have created. Therefore, uh, every agenda for regular uh, meetings shall provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly address the legislature, legislative body on any item that has been described in the notice for the meaning before or during consideration of that item. It seems to me like that's an explicit requirement under the Brown Act that the council be open to comment from the public about items on the agenda. And I, my personally, I, I hope you will accept that, and I would very much benefit from, and I'm sure other people would as well, if to, so that we can monitor, the public can monitor the debate and the discussions better. I would very much, I think it would be very e efficient if each meeting would start out with uh, each member on a, on a controversial issue, giving You're their now initial... a minute over your time, so wrap it up. Okay, Thank I you. will. I, w I will make a suggestion that the, when there's a controversial issue on the table, that each member say very briefly at the beginning of the debate why you are inclined currently to say yes or Thank no you. to the motion on Thank the table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your participation. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? No. no. We stand adjourned for one half hour. We will return at 7.30.
the ticket kit. Alaska Airlines. So yeah, that's what I've been recording. Or maybe that second pair of Uggs was for you, Renee. <laughs> She's being thoughtful. We'll that's see what it turned into. Right? Yeah. She discovered it. Like, hey. Hey. Thanks for the money for that. <laughs> oh, my. Holy cow. Seven days. Good Lord. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session for its evening session uh, at the hour of uh, just after 7.30 p.m. We are on item number 20 on our agenda. This is uh, an item related to a potential 2024 affordable workforce housing bond. Uh, and uh, if, if, if I might uh, introduce this item, uh, council members here, uh, when you were candidates and since you've been in office for years, uh, some months and some years, uh, have we know that, that certainly housing and housing affordability across a range of incomes is, uh, if not the highest uh, uh, ranking issue among voters, it, it's certainly one and two with the housing and homeless and the challenges around all of that. And uh, in listening to you folks uh, since December the 13th and hearing your priorities in, in many of these conversations on many issues, it, it seemed that perhaps it uh, might make sense for the council to see if there is a way that the public uh, might uh, consider advancing a bond measure to the ballot with the assistance of the city government uh, facilitating a process which could lead to that. Uh, I've had meetings like you all have had uh, during your time in office with the city manager, the city attorney, our bond council, our financial advisor, um, keeping it within the context of the Brown Act with some of you have had a direct conversation about this item, uh, or two of you, and uh, uh, wanted to bring this forward. Uh, the thought is that <coughs> the March ballot might be a good ballot uh, to have a housing bond on there. Um, it's not a great ballot. Uh, you all run for office. You know what difference is between a March primary and a November general turnout. We're going to have a lower turnout in March and a higher turnout in November. Uh, but in in thinking about that, uh, it, it, it appears as if maybe the city might want to do something in November of next year. Looks like other jurisdictions may do that as well. So. The March ballot might be a, a less cluttered ballot, but then the question is, it's a lower turnout ballot. So is there a way to, to move, help the community move forward on a ballot measure? In discussing this with uh, the city attorney, uh, and he will certainly speak for himself, I received the, uh, at council that there is a path to a, approval of an odd valorem property tax bond measure on affordable housing, on, on workforce affordable housing. We'll discuss that issue this evening as well. Uh, if that arrives on the ballot by way of citizens gathering signatures, as opposed to the legislative body placing the measure on the ballot. So thinking that combination of March ballot might be good because it's less cluttered, but it's a lower turnout, is there a legal path to, to look at a different voter threshold? The answer that I've received from council and which you will hear tonight as well as from our bond council and from our financial advisor is that that path is a, a worn path and uh, the bond council, which uh, certainly, shall we say, they are conservative in nature, and financial advisors are conservative in nature. Uh, we had a, a 
Zoom call with them the other day in which they supported the city attorney's uh, view and said that from their point of view in terms of the marketability of such a bond uh, that would be uh, put to the voters and the voters would pass on a majority vote that from bond council's point of view and the financial advisor's point of view, they're not concerned about that. They believe, in fact, they believe that that is a, a worn enough path that they would have no issue uh, with, with a bond issue. Uh, there are some questions about whether, uh, about when that should happen. We can get into that uh, uh, a little later. As to process, uh, it, it, again, in, in listening to you all, uh, it occurs to me that the voters of the city if they are participating and they are the leaders of assembling a bond, they put it together, we help them in facilitating their work, but they uh, are putting this bond together and in effect, we hand it off to them sometime probably around the end of, of this month, perhaps, we hand off the product that they have put together that we have helped facilitate and then it's up to them gather the signatures. That's a second test, I think, of the voter sentiment. Uh, first one is we'll do some public opinion polling and we'll have a public transparent process to facilitate the community putting together a bond. We have another opportunity then to test the voter mood through <coughs> signature gathering. If there's a market for this, people will sign it. If there's not, they won't. Um, and then the third test is obviously the, the election itself. Uh, in terms of the content, uh, I think that it's been pretty clear, uh, again, from uh, things said by council members over, over the years and certainly since I've had the pleasure of serving with you, um, that there are a rather broad variety of needs. Uh, the reason I call it uh, have, have slapped the label of workforce housing, uh, and, and that doesn't have to stick. This is a, a characterization for tonight, for this item, is that I think we know that uh, although there's probably not a legal definition yet of workforce housing, I think there's a practical definition. Some people would include in that definition um, some of our own employees. People who are, uh, work in this government and have a hard time finding housing or they have to travel great distances. Uh, we certainly know that the makeup of our economy here has a very significant component, component for the service industry and those folks have a, a big challenge in living and working in the same community. I also, I don't think it's a stretch to say that there are folks, we know this to be true, who have jobs, are working, and are living in their cars. We, I've heard you all talk about that <laughs> since I've been here. Uh, we also know that there are, are folks who are without homes who would like to work, but the instability of not having housing gets in the way of being able to, to move forward in that regard. So uh, when I say workforce housing, I mean that broadly, very broadly. And leave it up to the community who will show up at these meetings if we do this uh, to say how many buckets are there and how much goes in each bucket. Let them, let them make that determination uh, as we move along. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Council Member Newsom, Council Member Brown, for agreeing to co-author this. Uh, as it turns out, we also constitute the Budget and Revenue Committee for, uh, subcommittee rather, for, for this body. And uh, it may, uh, I'd like to at least put it out there as a, as a possibility uh, that if you want to move forward with this, uh, that uh, perhaps this subcommittee that you've already established, that we get portfolio to go conduct those meetings. Uh, so there's a context in which the meetings would happen. We would do it just like any other subcommittee of this body 
uh, we would we would be there and 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 uh, essentially be conveners or pre presiding uh, uh, members, and it would be the would be taking input from the community. Let me pause at this point and see if uh, Council Member Newsom, Council Member Brown would like to make comments on this, or, and then certainly entertain that, and then we will also entertain public comment on this. Mr. Newsom. And thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, <clears throat> uh, so housing is obviously a great issue in our community, and especially lack of housing, and especially affordable housing. Uh, and this, this item uh, will uh, direct staff to start a process of engaging the community on an, an affordable housing bond, an affordable workforce housing bond, uh, and, and helping craft it, as, as Mayor Keeley said, into a process of bringing about a bond. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to um, uh, support this agenda item with Mayor Keeley and, and uh, thank Mayor Keeley for his, for his work on it so far. Thank you, sir. Ms. Brown. Uh, yes, thank you. <coughs> I, I'll just say um, I have been, uh, during my six and a half years on the city council and, and prior to that for many decades, uh, really immersed in uh, efforts to get affordable housing uh, built in our community to ensure the preservation of affordable housing stock. And, I, and, and so the idea of a local funding source that can help uh, close the gap on projects that can help uh, us achieve our goals in getting uh, housing built and getting uh, housing built at a price point that um, is affordable to uh, our workforce and, and low-income people in our community. So uh, I'm just thrilled to, about the possibility of um, exploring this with the community. I think it makes sense to really get out there and have uh, real community engagement in the process. Um, having been involved in citizen initiatives as well, it's, it's, it is a lot of work, um, but it is an opportunity, as you've said, to um, get a better sense of where the community is at. I think the polling, the idea of polling is really important. And with respect to this being a really open com community process and the city's role in, in leading that, I, I think is really important. Um, we've seen initiatives uh, over the years that um, are full of good ideas and um, aren't fully <laughs> vetted, and um, a lot of time goes into trying to use this process to, um, you know, for people to get th good th things they want. And this is an opportunity for us to get what we all want. And so um, I'm, I'm really happy to be signed on and to move forward. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins and then certainly vice mayor we'll go around the table here Th Ms. Watkins. yeah no thank you for bringing this to yeah. us um, I know that there's been talk about something like this coming forward I, I I guess my question is just more more of a clarification question around what the motion is which is to look at us placing an affordable house okay yeah. so if I could get clarification because what I heard was that we'll do the research we'll um, direct staff to do the research and we'll invest in some polling. However, what I think I heard from you, <laughs> Mayor, is that then that information will inform a community initiative. But I, I don't, so I'm very comfortable with getting research. I think we should really absolutely 100% um, try to get a pulse on our community in terms of where they're at with, with what they're wanting our funding or their funding to go towards in terms of priorities. Um, but I, I just wanted to get a, a point of clarification on the recommendation. And, and we're going to do that as, as we move along here this evening. I, I see. I wrote that out at first. This is an evolving conversation. iterative conversation I issue. See. So we'll, uh, you're exactly right. This will, this will change this evening. Potentially. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, if I could, in terms of Certainly. the outcomes associated with that, just knowing, um, especially with the work with children's funds, that if you have a, peten a petition ballot initiative, then you would only need um, 50 plus one, really, Absolutely. to get dedicated uh, resources, whereas if it was put on by a legislative body, you would need the two-thirds majority, correct? correct? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Others? Madam Vice Chair, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, it's no secret in this room that I do not like taxes. Um, <laughs> as especially property taxes. But um, but I do think it's important to uh, bring this item forward so that the community can weigh in on the issue. And so I think the polling is a really important component. And again, the signature gathering, if that, if it comes to that, 
and then let the voters weigh in. And if that's where people want to spend their money, that's that's what that's what the will of the community is. Then that's where we should go. Um, so uh, I'm prepared to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that that is not an easy issue philosophically for you, and thank you for seeing your way clear on that. We had one more question. Certainly. I did have one more question. Yeah, we will. We'll go around one first round, and then we'll do another one. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, and actually, Council Member Watkins asked my question, too, on what the motion was. I wasn't sure if it was. Um, but investing, I think it's important. There were no attachments with this, and I had a couple people reach out um, to understand $35,000, what is that for? What is polling? And it costs that much. And so I think it's really important um, for folks who don't understand that process to um, know that um, polling is a randomized um, selection of voters that get a call usually. It's usually done via, via phone. And I just wanted to take a moment to explain that. Um, and they have a chance to answer um, some questions that are put together by a polling firm. Um, and they can weigh in. And if, if there's a great majority that in that polling says, yes, we absolutely want to want the city to pursue um, um, <clears throat> an affordable workforce housing bond, then um, that helps inform the next steps. And um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was out there for those that reached out about that process. And it sounds like a lot of money, but um, I think that is the important um, step in, in us uh, moving forward in this um, and I, I know from being on that revenue and budget committee, you know, mm -hmm. it's your job um, to really find ways to fund needs of the city. And um, I think, you know, housing and workforce housing and affordable housing, all of these terms, like you said, they're like with workforce, no legal definition, but we can all... Um, identify that that is a need. So I think it's great to explore this further and um, see what the, the polling suggests. If I might, uh, in response to that, provide a little more information. The, the thought uh, with respect to the public opinion research work is that, uh, and uh, Mr. Huffaker and, and his uh, staff have been working on this as well. It is that if we're going to have, have a very open, transparent public process, whoever wants to show up shows up, and we pub publicize it broadly. When they get there, I think a way to put some sideboards on everybody's expectations is to show them the results of a public opinion research document which says, well, they're, they're inclined to do this, but not this. They, they go this far, but not this far, whatever it may be. The poll will help them, people sort of regulate their own appetites, I think, and see what is real. It's a and great based way. based on that, plus what people want to advocate for, then hopefully a bond comes together. Ms. Contar Johnson? Sure, yeah, I don't have questions, but I'll just make some comments. Um, I really appreciate you, Mayor Keeley, and Council Members Newsom and Brown bringing this forward. I think this is absolutely the right process to gauge the um, community will and readiness for something like this. Um, I personally know that there is a need, and um, again, we've talked about it all day today. Um, and I think the Citizens Initiative, I love how you outline the, the first test is the poll, the second test is the signatures, the third is the votes. Um, and I think that's the appropriate process. So um, I'm happy to support this and that's it. Oh, oh, I had one more thing. Um, during this process, mm -hmm. I think it will be important to define what we mean by workforce housing. Of course. And, um, and then as you said, we'll see how the polls come out, but you know, what will this pay for? So I know that'll be outlined clearly, but specifically defining workforce housing, because that 
term gets kind of thrown around. Yeah. So thank you. Certainly. Uh, so, uh, if I might just come in, uh, yeah, be right with you, be right with you. Uh, uh, with regard to this public opinion research, uh, uh, so, again, Mr. Uh, City Manager and, and others have been working on this with FM3. Uh, there are several good polling firms uh, around California that I believe you can rely very much on, on their research. It's not advocacy polling. It's genuine public opinion research polling. Uh, as to the questions that are being asked, how to construct that, we're going to be having another meeting tomorrow morning on that. Uh, but I again, it is designed, if I could, let me say it this way, FM3, my experience with FM3, and the reason I like them a lot, is some polling firms will cut the poll in the favor of the client, mm -hmm. right? right? They'll cut it slightly, not a lot, not that you can't rely on it, not that they're dishonest or something, but there's polling methodology and there's polling methodology. And so what I like about FM3 is they slightly cut it against what your interest is. They make it harder for you, which I think is a very good thing. Yeah, but anyway, uh, Mr. Huffaker, would you like to talk about how the poll is, is being assembled at this point? I think you described it well, Mayor, and I know uh, Councilor Bruner was asking about process. I do want to just make clear that we collected quotes from several nationally recognized uh, polling firms. Uh, FM3 is one of the top three firms that does this work. Uh, as the mayor described, it is statistically valid. Um, research, which means that they will be including a sample size that gives us um, a good read on how the community feels about a number of issues. Um, we're approaching this work broadly as we will look at the look at the range of options around our community's housing needs, and I think most importantly, we want to hear from the community in terms of what areas within the broader um, envelope of, of housing. Um, their support for wanting to pursue uh, revenue options. So that's really the intent of the poll and allow, uh, allowing the findings of the poll to uh, inform uh, where the council and um, where the community go from here on, on the issue. So that's the first step. Eventually, uh, depending on the findings of that and moving forward with the next step, there will be a handoff to a community coalition that would have the responsibility of then going out and doing the signature gathering and ultimately coming forward to the council for consideration of placing a measure on the ballot um, down the road this next year. So this is early days and that's where we're at in the process. Ms. Watkins. I appreciate that. And I, I did have a question about the polling. Um, and so I appreciate the fact that we're gonna have a really reputable firm working on this because I do feel like the framing of the question really matters. Um, I guess my my uh, my question is around the the community handoff. Essentially, is that necessarily the path that we're committing to this evening? And and okay, I'm seeing Tony shake his head no, because I, I I think there's two ways, right? You can put it on. You could either do the the gathering, the signature gathering, and or the legislative body could potentially put it on. Um, and I read this originally as if we were gonna be potentially considering it for putting it on. Not that I'm opposed to a signature gathering process. I, I actually, I think that's a really great process to help um, educate and uh, get a pulse from the community as well. But I'm just kind of curious where that shifted between the agenda report coming out and tonight kind of moving in that direction. Because it's, it's, it's a lot of work to put uh, a ballot measure on. I mean, I. I I know in terms of the, a lot of the research I've done, it's a lot of work to get something on the ballot that way, so. I'm sure the mayor um, and council member Brown and Newsom will have some thoughts on this as well. Um, obviously reaching the 50, one, 50 plus one threshold is attractive uh, in terms of voter support and, um, versus a, a two thirds threshold. Okay. Having said that, the path towards placing an item on the ballot by voter initiative um, is, is a heavy lift. So, um, you know, I think, again, leaning on the findings of the poll to get a better sense of how strong, how strong uh, the community support is for um, some of the elements we might consider will also influence what process makes the most sense. 
And if I could, I just say also, if the if it's community initiated, then the community also plays a role in, in crafting the language, essentially. So oh, yeah. we relinquish that um, responsibility or that choice, essentially, to be able to craft what we think would work for our city as well. So I, I, I'm not prepared necessarily to say without information and data which direction to go mm -hmm. at this moment, but um, I, I appreciate kind of the options, essentially. A couple of other points. One is, uh, if I can go back to the polling for just a moment, uh, the way that these legit polling firms work in terms of who do they sample is that, they, first of all, they are only sampling likely voters in next March's primary. That's what they're doing. The next thing they do is it, they, they then model what they predict that turnout to be. How many Democrats, how many Republicans, how many declined to state, how many women, how many men, how many homeowners, how many renters, what is that likely voter pool going to look like? They poll that group and they poll until they get that group. And that's how you can have some confidence in at least that snapshot at that moment of the electorate that might come to the polls in March. Secondly, uh, at least it's my view of this, uh, having been the author of a couple of statewide bond measures, that uh, a poll is a snapshot a poll and a couple of tracking polls is a movie. And what you really want to see is the movie. And so as we move along in this, the uh, likely uh, part of the handoff is to hand off the tracking polls to the public as well, to some entity that will be, for all intents and purposes, the campaign committee, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, one other comment on, on the signature gathering. The reason time is short here, and, oh. and we would like to do three of these meetings a week from Thursday, the next Thursday, and the next Wednesday uh, in open public uh, ways, is so that we can get this and hand it off to them. They're probably only going to have 85 to 90 days to gather the signatures when they typically have 180. Mm -hmm. That goes then directly to the question of this group of somebodies out there that's going to participate in this that we say, here it is. Uh, they are going to have to have a very aggressive campaign because I think that, that volunteer signature gathering is only going to get you part way there when you only have 85 days to gather them. I have a question about Certainly. that. Certainly. So if, if the timeline and the process that you're outlining doesn't play out and they aren't able to gather those signatures, then are you assuming that that could potentially come back to this legislative body for placing on the ballot if the polling is um, favorable? Uh, I don't know what we would do. Okay. I, I, I really don't know yeah, what yeah, we would okay. do. Sure. Uh, but I, that's the accelerated timeline. You, I, that's yeah, why we're my, having my, my own you know, political judgment would be uh, if they can't get it done, I don't want to place a ballot measure on for March that we can't attain the threshold vote to approve it. And if the community is not favorable in terms of the polling and information you're receiving. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah, so we, we have other touch points where we'll meet exactly. as a council. To be, okay, exactly. that's what I was exactly. talking about. Great, yeah. thank you, because okay. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Condotti, would you take a moment and share with the public and the council your opinion on, on this matter, and then also report out uh, the conversations with both the Bond Council and Financial Advisor. Yes, happy to do that. Thank you. Um, Mayor Keeley, members of the council. Um, so what we're talking about here is a, <coughs> a tax measure that would be used to finance a bond issue <coughs> where, the, where the proceeds of the tax would be, would be designated for the purposes set forth in the measure. And that's called a special tax under California law. And so what this implicates is Proposition 218, which was enacted by California voters in uh, 1996, and it amended the California Constitution to add Articles 13C and D. And what it essentially does is it places procedural and substantive restrictions on cities' ability to uh, raise various taxes and, and fees and assessments. And so in a 
very grossly oversimplified way, um, a special tax under Proposition 218 is required to obtain a two-thirds majority vote in order to pass. A general tax, on the other hand, only requires a simple majority under Prop 218. However, unless the tax is um, based upon a unanimous declaration by the City Council of uh, a fiscal emergency, that the tax has to be placed, a general tax has to be placed on the ballot to coincide with the City Council election. Special taxes can be on any ballot. There was a case in 2017 decided by the California Supreme Court entitled the California Cannabis Coalition versus the City of Upland, in which the California Supreme Court essentially said that a general tax measure that qualified for the ballot by citizen initiative, it was a, it was a uh, tax on cannabis gross receipts that the, uh, that Upland could use for any general revenue purpose, um, did not need to comply with the requirement that the election coincide with a city council election. The court essentially said those procedural and substantive requirements were not imposed on the voters, they were imposed on the city council. Um, which led many people to speculate as to whether or not other requirements of Prop 218 uh, were, were similarly, similarly not applicable to a citizen-initiated uh, measure. And, and the question as to the simple majority versus two-thirds majority vote was answered in a uh, 2021 decision by the First Appellate District Court of Appeal uh, involving the city and county of San Francisco, where San Francisco voters placed on the ballot a, a tax on corporate gross receipts to, you, to, to fund, among other things, uh, services for um, the homeless and, and, and other special purposes. And the first appellate district, relying on the California Supreme Court's decision in Upland, concluded that um, that also the two-thirds majority vote requirement is not applicable to a tax placed on the um, placed on the ballot by citizen initiative, uh, and it only requires a simple majority vote. That decision was subject to a petition for review before the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court declined to review it, mm -hmm. indicating essentially the Supreme Court's um, you know, acknowledgement of the validity of that decision. So. That really provides the legal framework for how a citizen initiative mm -hmm. could be placed on the ballot and, and pass with a simple majority vote. My concern when this initially came to my attention is that I know that the bond markets are sometimes fickle. And so I was concerned that, you know, if we did this somewhat novel approach to, um, to a bond issue, would it spook the bond markets? And so I consulted with um, our the bond council that we've used for many years, uh, Jones Hall, and we met just last week, and the attorney from Jones Hall, his name is Chick Adams, uh, basically stated that his firm could write an unqualified legal opinion supporting the validity of the tax measure, which is what the bond market would look at when bond investors are trying to make a decision about whether or not they're going to risk investing in a, in a municipal bond. So, so an unqualified opinion from bond council is what, what bond investors would look at. Um, we also have a financial advisor that we've used most recently in connection with the water department's issue of uh, certificates of participation. And um, the financial advisor likewise said that, that they thought that that was a viable path forward. One caveat is that um, there is a measure that has qualified for the November 2024 ballot put out by the California Business Roundtable that would close the loophole created by the Upland and San Francisco cases. Um, however, if we are successful with a measure in March, uh, in other words, if, we, if a measure is placed by the voters on the March 2024 ballot and, and garners a simple majority but not a two-thirds majority vote, um, the, the CBRT measure could undo that. However, if we've already gone to the bond market before the vote has taken place, then under the contracts clause of the California Constitution, those bonds would not be subject to a legal challenge, even assuming that the CBRT measure passes. 
So that's the legal framework that we have um, sort of plotted out as one option for the council should you decide to move in that direction. The other option obviously would be a lot easier because it would just entail the council ordering uh, by resolution a measure put on the ballot um, for, for the same purpose. That would, however, again, require a two-thirds majority vote to, to pass. I might add, finally, that the city of Oakland uh, placed a general obligation bond measure on its November 2022 ballot, um, sort of along the lines of what we're discussing, and it got something like 75% voter approval. So it passed with a very comfortable supermajority uh, vote. So I think the intent with regard to the polling is to test voter sentiments here in Santa Cruz as to both you know, the, the magnitude of the, of the issue as well as the, the projects that the public wants to see the city pursue uh, with the funding. Other questions or comments? I Ms. Watkins, sir. Thank you. Certainly. Just because I've been tracking a lot of this, especially mm -hmm. as it related to a lot of the children's spending, so I'm very familiar with these legal circumstances that we're within. Um, it's very interesting that the timing is of, uh, of what it is in terms of the November potential threat to this. So, and then you answered my question in regards to the bond. So I, I appreciate the legal context because I think that really informs why you made the comments the way you did. There we go. <laughs> All right. Let me see if there's anyone with us uh, this evening who would wish to comment on this item. Good evening. Good evening. I've been in the trades 40 years. I've been a general contractor for 35 years, and I'd like to invite you to get out of the weeds and look a little broader. Housing is a mathematical equation. Cost to the house and the ability to pay equals home ownership. This city has done nothing but Focus on housing, which lines the pockets of developers with cash. And you have totally left alone the ability of the citizens of this city to pay for that housing. You haven't tried to raise the minimum wage. You haven't offered uh, a down payment program where the city loads a bond to make qualified buyers the advance of the down payment to establish a mortgage. You only worked on one side of the equation, and as long as you do, it will be a big problem for the people in this city. For the people coming from over the hill, no problem. They're making lots of money. I, I defy you to get in any one of your social groups and ask, how many of you are making $143,000 a year, the median income for this city? And I bet you you'll see very few hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Brokaw. Anyone else who's with us this evening wish to testify on this item? Good evening, sir. I suppose I have a couple of questions, but is yes, about a bond measure to get funds for the city, like the income of the city has somehow dropped. Well, when the personal businesses were destroyed due to dogmas of Brock Chisholm, um, what's really going on? Are you guys going to take bonds from the BRICS currency? Because the U.S. dollar is really not doing so good. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say i learned some things i'm gonna I'm probably just oh, i'm gonna leave it at that because there's other things to talk on but this is quite somewhat confusing but i wasn't kidding about the currency because what is coming in the next coming months to the united states thank you sir good evening good evening <clears throat> i got Lost in your discussion, it seemed to bounce around all over the place. So I'm just going to address what I see, which is the affordable workforce housing bond. I've lived in Santa Cruz my whole life, was born and raised here. And 
when I was young, the way you bought a house is you saved up 20% down payment. You had a good, reasonable job. You put your down payment down and you made payments. And then somewhere in the late 90s, the predatory lending schemes came out where they just gave everybody money. And then suddenly, everybody was getting into a bidding war because they had these all this fake access to funds. And we saw the prices of housing jump significantly. <clears throat> We've been through several cycles of booms and busts and booms and busts, as, as the gentleman before me indicated. Uh, people have lost their jobs through engineered shutdowns of small businesses, which I don't think is fair. My biggest question is, we've spent six hours here listening, listening to a housing crisis, which I think fits the problem reaction solution, and I can see you all already have a solution in mind for everybody who's experiencing the reaction to the problem that was brought here in Santa Cruz. I'm not seeing any factual data and statistics on how many of the homeless people are actually native residents of Santa Cruz. People who grew up here, went to school, the kids, everyone in my genre, um, <clears throat> a lot of people my age range, grew up here, many were able to stay, and a lot of people got priced out and had to leave. And I've listened to the lamenting stories about kids who grew up here but can't afford to buy a home here. We had big tech move in during the COVID lockdowns, and they jacked the prices up even more. Rentals of a home here are around $6,000 a month. That's untenable for most people, but it's because all the Menlo Park and San Francisco kids came down here with their big tech money. Where is the data and the statistics and prioritizing native Santa Cruzans? Would things have been differently if, say, people who owned homes here didn't just sell out to the highest bidder, but prioritize their community members? people who grew up here. We might not have such an overly inflated false pricing in the real estate market. These are my concerns. Thank you. Anyone else who's with us? We have two folks online, is that correct, Ms. Bush? Certainly, let's take the first one. Good evening. Yes, hello. Um, what the double speak words affordable workhouse housing bond really means is rent controlled, deed restricted, all property owners and other renters will subsidize government housing with zero benefit to them and will be forced to go into long-term debt in a move to destroy the free market in housing and make it a socialist-style government-controlled housing paid for with an end around Prop 13 ever higher property taxes, paying on a debt of principal plus interest for most of the rest of their lives. For everyone who pays, it is worse than your past socialist giveaway subsidies of public property building incentives because at least then no one goes into debt over those. They just lose public property access. It's not a tax on current income. It's not a tax on economic sales activity. It is placing the entire public in expensive long-term debt at a really bad time for that, where a vast most will get less than nothing for it. As to the worker housing angle, occupants as easily may already be on welfare, which this is just more of. It's people who can't afford to live your housing and will increase government dependence and invite poverty to come and stay in the city, your specialty. Once dependent, they will be loath to move beyond dependence, just like welfare, which it is. But in this case, you don't have the legitimacy of the federal government to provide for the public welfare. You overstep and misdirect your mission. It's almost all the public paying forever for a few somebody else's subsidy or rent control. There are already plenty of housing projects underway that will greatly increase the vacancy rate worth waiting for evaluation. You ignore the risks of overbuilding into a population decline or housing bubble burst at expensive sky-high interest rates, no less, and you know the vast majority of all extra housing built will at best only accommodate planned expansions of UCSC students and the staff when that happens. Students obtaining college degrees or staff aren't the sob story low-income targets you're selling this on. I ate hot dogs and beans, worked, took out loans in college, and I never thought anyone owed me anything. The mostly broke Bernie and cultural Marxists will be happy to fill out your biased expensive surveys and perhaps get signatures. They worship the government and do as told. Others think for themselves. The word useful idiots comes to mind. If this is a general tax, it's the same as voter rejected failed measure F, but with a swap grab for property taxes instead, with no insurance of any purpose except lining the city's budget. Do you know the meaning of no? That was like seven months ago. Did the people get their money's worth on the consultant surveys and cost to put measure F on the ballot? You could have lit a match to that money, no difference. 
if this is a special tax, it's a two-thirds vote needed, although you've got a sneaky way of trying to get around that. Let's not waste the money either, which is far more than 40000 to put a housing bond on the ballot. That in the path has been a coin flip to approve. But in today's world, people have had it. Up to the chrome dome would ever hire The day people tell the government, no, you've controlled and mismanaged enough of my money, and my life is right here, right now, today, and is why the people voted, voted Measure F down, because they've had enough. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Any, uh, we have a second person, is that correct? Two more. Two more. All right, let's take the next one. Good evening. Good evening, Council and Mayor Keeley. First, I'd like to uh, you to clarify if this is uh, the purpose of this is for workforce housing or permanent supportive housing, because it is buried in the in the staff report uh, says permanent supportive housing. Those are two very different types of housing, and I think the support for each one would vary greatly. So you should need to clarify that. I am in favor of uh, workforce housing. I do wonder, though, since the city has been bragging about one, being one of only 6% of California cities to meet its RENA goals for the current cycle, why we need to put a bond on when we're already in at least the top 6%. So that's another question answered. And then um, I think you really need to look at the cause of the high price of housing, particularly rental housing, and it really is UCSD. And so any, any although I support workforce housing, really any city initiative is going to be overwhelmed by UCSD. Currently with the LRDP, the plan is to increase enrollment by 8,000 students, 4,000 of which or more will be living off campus. You know, we've got Student Housing West, that's gonna be a net of 2,200 student beds. People toss around the 3,000 number, but that's the gross number. Uh, the net will be 2,200 and a few hundred more maybe for Kresge, but um, you can already see that's a deficit. <laughs> and so, you know, if we produce a few hundred houses, that's great. I support it, but it's not the real cause. I mean, either we should be, you guys should be pressing UCSC to put up some money to build housing, or you should be pressing the legislature to get UCSC to build more housing on campus, but housing that's affordable because student housing West prices are not affordable. So even if they built more at the current prices, they wouldn't be able to fill it. Uh, the, at 2023-24 UCSC apartment rates, uh, Student Housing West would go today for $3,959 for a one-bedroom apartment with cramming three students in there up to a five-bedroom apartment at $11,856. Finally, this end run around the um, two-thirds majority, Mr. Gondotti neglected to inform you that there is uh, an active legal theory, and I think it might have even been tested, um, that if the city council or does what you're talking about doing, which is in effect acting as private citizens to get around that two-thirds majority, that can be challenged in court. So you might want to do some more legal research to make sure that what you're planning on doing will really fly if anyone challenges it in court. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more, is that correct? Sir, would you like to testify on this? Come on forward, and then we'll take the last person online. Good evening. Oh, yeah, I just I just had to jump up uh, when it was said, you know, uh, they need to build more housing on campus, and I, I just don't think that's a, a remedy. Um, you've got um, real severe um, uh, housing insufficiency at UCSC. Uh, the campus has the highest, uh, um, I guess, the percentage of students which are, uh, you know, have been or are homeless. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's uh, there's there's uh, the state wants to over enroll. Uh, I think we were pressured to take more and more students, and it's somewhat unfair to people uh, like workforce, um, uh, people seeking housing, people seeking um, affordable housing in the city when um, they're crowded to adjacent communities. Or, I mean, I feel like, I, I almost feel like saying, if you do get this money, uh, linking last, uh, uh, last uh, meetings, uh, uh, maps of the... Uh, 
the perspective areas where things could be built. I almost feel like suggesting if you do get this passed that you consider utilizing it in sort of a creative way by building housing a little bit further away from UCSC so it's not, you know, it's not seen as a possible place for those students to um, uh, co-opt. Sorry, sorry to, you know, I mean, if any, I'm stepping on any toes or making anybody uncomfortable by saying that, but unfortunately it is sort of a blind spot for many, many people that the, the university just can't continue getting arbitrarily larger in, in terms of its enrollment numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else? One more. Good evening. Hi, thank you. Online. Good evening. Julian. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to echo what the very first person speaking for public comment said. I think that's such an essential point that what's needed is not just affordable housing, but a multifaceted approach that makes sure we can afford to pay rent and save and eventually purchase a home. And affordable housing is one component of that, but it can't be the only component. So I wouldn't view it as an either or, I, and I would commend the housing bond, and I would just say that Definitely, if you're doing that, also do the other things that will make that housing bond super successful. Look at ways to lift up those who really need deeply affordable housing. Um, and then I have some questions about this that hopefully y'all can speak to. So one is what exactly would need to happen on the community side? As Council Member Watkins pointed out, it's a lot of work to get something on the ballot through voter initiative and a, a cynical take, not my take, but a cynical take might view this as punting to the community. So I'm curious if the city has the means legally to help facilitate a citizen-led ballot moving forward. I get that the community feedback and polling is a lot of money and like work that the city would be doing here. I don't want to minimize that, but I'm curious, does the city have means to do anything else after that, or does it really then fall to the community? Um, and then as far as the process for community feedback and polling, um, I wanted to encourage that you pay special attention to the populations with the greatest need for affordable housing and those at the greatest risk of displacement, uh, especially from the downtown plan. Part of polling is what looking at what can pass, but if what passes doesn't reflect what is most needed by our most at-risk community members, then we're not actually making good policy. We're just making policy that will pass. And those are two different things. So if, as Mayor Keeley pointed out, the polling groups are looking at likely voters in next March's primary, then my concern would be, are we looking at political feasibility or are we looking at community need when we think about how to design an affordable housing bond and what it might specifically fund? And who are those polling groups gonna say is likely to show up and how many of those likely voters are actually going to live in or need affordable housing? And I get it's a tricky balancing act to look at feasibility versus need, but I wanted to raise this as something that deserves a lot of attention and discussion, whether it's a citizen or a city council originated affordable housing ballot that ends up on our ballot in March. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to vocalize support for deeply affordable housing and affordable housing that emphasizes multi-bedroom units that will be available to families. Um, and I just wanted to ask, did I understand it correctly? The plan is to hold these feedback meetings in the next three weeks, or maybe I misunderstood that. Thank you all. Respond to the gentleman quickly. Uh, yes, sir, you, you do understand that correctly. Uh, starting a week from tomorrow and for, I'm, I'm sorry, a week from day after tomorrow, a week from this Thursday, Thursday, the next Thursday, and the next Wednesday, probably something like 5.30 to 8.30 or later. Uh, we will, you will see in a moment, I've got a revised uh, motion here that I think more accurately reflects the desire here of the body. Uh, but yes, sir, you do, you do have that right. Uh, let me uh, uh, suggest a motion and see if anyone would, would like to make this. Uh, a motion to direct the Budget and Revenue Subcommittee of the City Council and staff to initiate a process to engage the public in consideration of an affordable workforce housing bond measure 
via public signature gathering on the March 2024 ballot, including engagement of a research firm and scheduling community meetings and outreach. I will wait for a moment and be glad to, any part of that you need me to work through. Um, can you just repeat it again? Certainly, yeah. glad to do that. Motion to direct the Budget and Revenue Subcommittee of the City Council and staff to initiate a process to engage the public in consideration of an affordable workforce housing bond measure via public signature gathering on the March 2024 ballot, including the engagement of a research firm and scheduling community meetings and outreach. Are we willing to we'll make, make I will make that motion. We're willing to second that? Sure. Second oh. by Colin Tari Johnson. Okay, good, we're good. Uh, yeah. On, on uh, yes, please, Ms. Watkins. May I ask a, a question for clarification Certainly, on course. your motion? And that you are uh, um, identifying that the, the petition gathering is a component of that. Do you want to specify that in the yeah, motion? Yeah, so uh, uh, what I've put here is via public signature gathering. The idea there is, is so it is clear that our role as the city Information is to gathering. facilitate the public's ability to assemble a bond if they want okay. to. That would then arrive on the ballot via signature, signature gathering by the public. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Okay. Good. Question, Ms. Bruner. That's my question as well. The way it's worded, it's mm -hmm. to initiate a process to engage the public via public via signature gathering. So it sounds like we're engaging the public via signature gathering. Is that how it? I just. I don't see the language yet, so. Okay, let me uh, see if Sounds it, like in, we're, in yeah. a moment, in a moment, Ms. Bush will put that up and we can work on this together. So I believe maybe what we could do there is after the word workforce measure, put a comma. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, uh, put a comma. Uh, an extra public. And strike the word public. And then on for the March 2024 ballot. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the very end is, uh, uh, so you have that right, and then it is, and scheduling community meetings and outreach. Uh, and scheduling community meetings and outreach. So thank you for the maker. Yes, yes, I can see you over I here. I realize the word public was in the wrong place, but I think it should be inserted after via. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And Mayor, if I may just Certainly. ask a, a question to make sure I'm understanding intent here clearly. Um, given that we are going to allow the polling to determine whether or not the process is one of which is a citizen's initiative versus a question that comes back to this body consideration of placing on the March ballot, would it make sense to just simply strike via public signature gathering um, on, on or for the March 2024 ballot and keep that broad to keep options open? Just a question. Uh, here's... My concern about that is 
I'll be probably the most surprised person in the city if polling shows that the, on the March ballot, the two-thirds vote measure. I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll wait to see what the research says, and we'll wait to see what the public says if they show up at these meetings. I think by, by saying at the outset uh, that via signature gathering, we are, we are committing ourselves sort of belt and suspenders to committing ourselves to this public process as opposed to the legislative body. Uh, I mean, frankly, one of the criticisms of the empty home tax or our downtown, our future, uh, was that those measures got to the ballot via signature, but they were done privately. One of the criticisms was no chance to iterate that, no chance for public participation, etc. So I think people like the signature gathering way of getting something on your ballot. We're curing, I think, the private nature of people who get items to the ballot via signature, that they're, the product that they're asking people to sign is not a publicly vetted process. So I'm trying to sort of belt and suspenders these so it would be no, no question that this measure we will give them a draft to work on when we give them the polling data, briefings on housing conditions and so on at the first meeting. We're going to also give them a draft so that we're not holding a series of affordable housing salons. We're holding a series of drafting sessions with the public. And they can amend that any way they want, but it is their product. Questions or comments? I, I, I think I had a similar question to what Matt brought up in terms of is that um, restricting our, our options essentially by having that? But I, I, I hear your, um, your, you know, your thoughts on that and, and your perspective, and I, and I understand. In terms of the framing of it, it feels to me that um, to initiate a process to engage the public, um, and comma, including engagement of a research firm and scheduling community uh, meetings and outreach, is sort of before then okay. regarding a consideration. Go ahead. For, so I would move, move that. Yeah, to. I'm sorry. I would move that up because I feel like engaging the public really is about the. In, so it'd be. Okay, where would you like it? So after ballot of March 2024 ballot. Yes. It the comma including engagement would go after public. Engage the public, comma, including engagement of a research firm Got and it. scheduling of community and meetings and outreach and then comma, regarding a consideration for okay. these purposes. Because it feels like that's there you go. sequentially Thank you. the process. Thank you. Right, right. That's my mom coming through me <laughs> as, an, as an English teacher and yeah. editor. Yeah, or, or you as an educator, <laughs> <Exactly>. yes. <laughs> principal, school principal, why did you Looks figure better, that out? Looks better, seems better. <laughs> I know, give us a program. Comma after public, right? We yeah. good? Yes. Look at this. Are you are you good? Is this what yes, Ms. Watkins? You know. Is this what you were looking for? You could put a you could put a comma after public, like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, with the maker of the motion. Yes. Okay. Good. Second, I believe I might have seconded. I don't know. Somebody seconded. Uh, uh, Ms. Collins, John, you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, further debate or discussion on the motion. Let me add one final note. Mr. Huffaker has assembled a team of city folks who will, in effect, staff those three public meetings held at the police community room. And uh, thank you for that. And uh, this will be an additional activity on people already having lots of activities and responsibilities. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for the folks who, if this motion passes, will assist us in that regard. Further questions or comments, Ms. Collins Johnson. So um, the three of you are brown acted on this. Yes. If other council members want to attend any one of these community meetings but not converse with other council members, what would you advise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will give that some thought and communicate with council members individually. Okay. I think it's permissible to attend and not participate but it always makes me a little squeamish uh, when that happens. 
So I'll stay away I, if I need to, but I'm interested in attending at least one of them. <laughs> well, let, me, stay away. Let, me do that, <laughs> yeah. let me do that analysis and I'll be happy to, to get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 21, independent police auditor report. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Uh, yeah. Who is presenting on this item? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Michael you? Trinaco, there your you independent are. police auditor. There we are. Hello, good evening. And uh, I will be uh, doing a high-level presentation along with my colleague, um, Sam Marion, a Santa Cruz resident and a part of the IPA team. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And council, it's uh, good to see some familiar faces and new ones as well. Um, we are going in the interest of time to do a high-level presentation of our report. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bush, for putting up our a very brief PowerPoint um, presentation that will guide this report. Um, just to remind folks about uh, our responsibilities, um, one of them, uh, as the IPA, is to provide every year a report of the activities uh, that we have done as your IPA, uh, along with um, our review of the cases, the complaints um, that were received during that uh, annual, during that one year period, and uh, what we have found with regard to how the police department in your city has dealt with these complaints, as well as um, any other um, recommendations we. Um, come up with to um, improve the process, to improve guidance to officers, and to comment on how well the investigations have been done, as well as whether the results of those investigations, the dispositions of the complaints, uh, were evidence-based and reasonable. Um, can we go to the next slide, Ms. Bush? Is, uh, these are uh, just summaries of our, of our role um, in your city. Uh, one of the things we do is that we provide an opportunity and an ability for those who are interested in potentially filing a complaint against the city police department um, to give them an idea of what that process is, uh, to assist them in um, accumulating the information or getting the information to the police department. Sometimes we provide a, a mechanism to do that. Um, for those who um, may feel uncomfortable about traveling to the police department or going through normal channels, regular channels, we provide another offloading uh, way in which that information can be uh, collected and then um, received so the department can go forward with the investigation. Another part of our responsibilities, as I indicated, is to take a look of, at complaint investigations and evaluate how well the department did, how thoroughly the department investigated the case, and whether the investigation was objective. Uh, finally, with regard to serious incidents, unfortunately, your city don't, does not have many of these. I don't think we had any during this reporting period, but any deadly force incidents or in custody deaths, uh, we are also um, uh, uh, assigned to, uh, to do a review and report on what we find with regard to that review. Next slide, please. We also uh, provide input on police department policies and procedures. Uh, this report uh, talks about some of the um, recommendations we made uh, over this past calendar year to um, uh, suggest, make suggestions to improve the police department's policies and procedures. We meet at least quarterly, but usually more often with the police department uh, just as a check-in to um, check in with them to see how we think they're doing and to see um, whether there are any particular enforcement challenges um, that um, the department is dealing with. We are, um, we provide an we provide um, public engagement opportunities for community members and advocacy groups. And then in our report, uh, you can see where we've reported on the work we've done in that regard for the past year. And then as tonight, 
uh, we report to your council uh, on an annual basis with regard to what we're finding. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so these are the activities uh, that we have um, done over the past year. We have talked with complainants, as indicated in our report. We met with community members. Uh, the Chiefs has an advisory committee. We attended one of their meetings to ad advise them about who we are and um, the resource that we resources that we provide as an independent police auditor. And we have met quarterly with the Chief and Command staff. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, in this uh, period, we reviewed 33 use of force and complaint investigations. Um, that's a high number, um, and as explained in our report, and I think for those who may recall our appearance last year, the department got behind a bit with regard to um, completing these investigations in a timely way, and um, as a result, um, had to catch up. As a result of a, a, a new sergeant being assigned to the responsibility of investigating these complaints, he was extremely diligent over the past calendar year and caught up. Uh, and so now um, we are pleased to be able to report uh, that um, uh, the department is is up to, is caught up with regard to the complaint investigations and no longer is behind um, with regard to them. Uh, we have been working particularly on some particular parts of the um, department's policy. One involves the way in which complaints are received and handled. And the department has been receptive to recommendations we've made in that regard. We obviously last year presented our second report and drafted our third report. Um, with regard to the report itself and some of the uh, key parts of that report that is in the package, part of your agenda package, I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Samra, and have her discuss uh, our findings and, uh, and some of the high level um, aspects of that report. Samra, can you take over? Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and City Council members. Uh, my name is Samra Marion and I work with Mike uh, Janako on the Independent Police Auditor team. And thank you for the opportunity for us to address you tonight. Um, some of our observations uh, from our review of last year dealt with the way in which the department was able to improve its system for documenting, monitoring, and completing investigations. So much of our previous report had focused on the challenges that the, the police department had in completing their investigations in a timely manner. And we saw throughout last year that the department took very important steps to tackle its the backlog of cases um, so that they were able to enhance their complaint process by capturing time, date, and manner complaints are received. They also enhance their procedures so that complainants receive a disposition letter and that the improvements or reforms that arose from those complaints are included in those letters. And as Mike mentioned, the department now has a new sergeant and is meeting regularly to monitor the timeliness of investigation. So last year we saw that type of um, significant progress some other observations that we had was that we saw that the department continue to be receptive to our input um, so that we had the opportunity to, to talk through recommendations that we had made in our previous report and the department took actions on those recommendations. And we also had the opportunity um, to provide feedback on some of the department policies. Um, we saw the department also use incident review as a mechanism for improving its own processes. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So as we reviewed the 33 use of force and public complaint investigations, um, we found that many of those investigations were thorough. We agreed and found that the conclusions were sound. And it also provided us an opportunity to identify areas for improvement. So, so we made 21 recommendations and they're detailed um, in the report that's available in the, in the city council materials. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few um, of those key recommendations. First, we made several recommendations to improve the, the police department's taser policy. And this was an opportunity to provide officers more guidance about standards for use and also some of the risks that are involved, especially concerning vulnerable populations. We also made several recommendations to strengthen the police department's use of force review process. 
such as including more documentation concerning when officers use the escalation and a process to evaluate um, the, those uh, de-escalation um, efforts and uh, were they warranted. Um, we also suggested that supervisors play a much more significant and active role in the use of force incident review and we recommended that supervisors roles be delineated in their policy. And lastly, another recommendation we made was that the department consider adopting a children of arrested parents policy so, so that officers have more guidance when they're dealing with the complexity um, of their role when they're arresting a parent in front of a child. Next slide, please. We, since um, our report, we've had very, many positive um, discussions with the police department about our 21 recommendations and the department took prompt action on 16 um, of those recommendations and um, materials that have been filed in conjunction with our um, presentation are the police department's revised personnel complaint policy, their use of force policy, and their taser policy. So they're available for review by the public as well as um, the, the, uh, all of you. And these revised um, procedures have addressed, um, as I said, uh, the, the vast majority of our recommendations. We're still um, in discussion with the police department about just the few remaining discussions and, um, and, and those discussions have been quite po positive. So that concludes my comments about the annual report and I'll, I'll get it back to you, Mike. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so that is a very, as I said, high level um, presentation of what we have found. I have to say that we have been pleased with uh, the receptiveness of the police department, uh, the support of the city, and, um, and um, I think that the work that we have done has been a very productive work in moving um, all in a positive direction. This is all about getting better. It's also about ensuring that there is accountability, but really improving the way in which the department provides its policing services to your residents. And I think we are, are pleased with uh, the activity and the results of the past year. Uh, there's always more to do, and we look forward to continuing to engage with the department in a productive and positive way. We're obviously here um, to answer any questions that any of you might have uh, or any um, uh, hear any statements or direction from any, any of council. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council members. I know it's been a long day for all of you, but we appreciate the opportunity to present to you and to um, also to hear from you uh, regarding this report. Well, thank you, sir, and your team very much for the comprehensive report. Let me ask council members if you have questions or comments on this item. Do Ms. After public comment, okay. After public comment. Anyone who's with us in chambers that would like to comment on this, this would be your opportunity to do so. Anyone who is uh, joining us online and you would wish to make comment, uh, you can do that uh, online as well. And we will alternate between folks who are here in chambers and folks who are calling in. Good evening, Mr. Brokaw. Um, I would like to get into the weeds and I would recommend that the council read case number 16 on page 32 where they were called to a situation where there was a custody dispute between a husband, a wife, and a daughter. The daughter continued screaming for her mom as her mom was led away in handcuffs. Officers, and she continued to cry and scream. After she was handcuffed, officers lifted her from the ground and attempted to have her walk, but she resisted walking and continued screaming. Officer one pushed her against a patrol car, requested shackles, and did a leg sweep on a child, pushing her face into the ground and shackled her ankles. While trying to put her into the police car, they knocked her head against the plexiglass that separates the back seat from the front seat, and then they put a foam helmet on her head to protect her after they had already hit her. The on-scene mental health liaison, this ties into the cahoots that we talked about earlier today, the lauded 
health liaison was on scene the entire time, and what did she do? She put the child in for a 5150 psychiatric hold. That, to me, is unconscionable. There was another incident, case number 31, I encourage you to read it. Um, starts on the way my pages are listed, it starts on 27 and goes to 28. There was a guy in a, in a shelter, I'm, I'm just gonna paraphrase. Um, the officer, he said he was handicapped. The officer one replied, I don't care if you're handicapped. Um, and then he said, don't grab me like that, bitch. And this is still officer one. She said, actually, I prefer cunt, so thank you. Okay, that yeah. will, you know. I'm, I'm just reading. I, I'm just fine, reading. It's fine. important that you people hear the language that comes out of the officer's mouths when interacting with the public. Okay? That's all I have to say. The, the, yeah, this is me. just a Mr. bit. Mr. Brokaw, excuse me. I'm not going to permit that to be spoken in these chambers. Are you finished? Yeah, I'm finished. Thank you. It's important that you hear Thank that. Thank you. Someone online. You're next. Good evening. As you all can imagine, this is a very difficult and emotional uh, topic for me to discuss because I am the mother of that complaint of case number 16. And um, I am very uh, unhappy with Mr. Jenico's report. I think it has a lot of bias, misogyny, and supports patriarchy. I would call your attention to the uploaded documents. Uh, there are 61 pages. Pages 1 through 11 are the heart and bones of my complaint on this auditor's report. And if you look at 60 and 61, I do know that a uh, retired police chief of 41 years did write in, and he was very eloquent when he described um, how this report does not get to the heart and bones of the matter. Nowhere in your report, Mr. Janico, did I see that you recommend prosecution for violations of California Penal Code 832.7F1 that was published in your second report that we heard in chambers on February, in February. Nowhere in your report did you recommend prosecution for 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242 violations, which is kidnapping under color of law. And my child was wrongfully uh, beaten, strangled. Nowhere do you mention Ruben Badeo kneeling on her neck. And then you seek to um, shame her for defending herself. And you claim that she was assaultive to the police after they strangled her, tore her away from her mom. Nowhere do you put in the report that the dad drove from three counties away and permitted vi perpetrated violence to us. You couch it as if it was just a, an arrest warrant, as if that gives any man wearing a badge and a gun to beat up an innocent woman and child. What about VAWA? Where was VAWA and this mental health worker? My daughter and I have family members in the area. Where was the decision to put her in the care of a trusted family member instead of locking an innocent child away for three days and then putting her into a psychiatric uh, control program with MK Ultra and child threats with the reunification therapy of the other two children who've been kidnapped in Santa Cruz? And all of you here have been ignoring it. And this is not okay. I reject this report. It's a disgrace. It's shameful. You should be fired. Read all the comments because my complaint was 358 pages long with hundreds of pages of supporting documents of nefarious behavior by many people. This is unacceptable. No more kidnapping children and you guys need to do your jobs and rescue my daughter and the missing two other Lane kids. Anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Hello, my name is Justin Lang. My two children are the children that the previous commenter mentioned. They were taken with the help of the Santa Cruz Police Department from my mother's home. They were assaulted in front of the police. The police stood by 
and did nothing as my children were assaulted and dragged away, kicking and screaming in the night by a private company, I urge you to take action to form some sort of independent investigation of this. The investigation that I just heard mentioned seems to be an attempt to exonerate the police department. And anybody who has seen the videos of the previous commenter's daughter being taken or my children taken in front of the police that time and by the police in her case knows that this is a crime against these children. And for anybody with the authority to do something about this, to sit silent and do nothing is a travesty and a crime against humanity. And I urge you to take some sort of action on this. Thank you. Thank you. Wish to testify? Yes, I want to thank the previous two speakers. They made the point so clearly. And uh, especially, and then I want to go back to the one where the taser problem. It was not mentioned, and it should be looked at again, that report. That man was having a medical problem. The police shouldn't have been having it. It should have been a person who's dealing with a medical problem. Should bring it up. But he did say, yes, I'm, uh, I'm crippled, I'm disabled. I don't care if you're disabled. And then he was tasered, never having done, as far as I can read the report, never having uh, been a threat, a physical threat to anybody. And I hope the, the council will make it clear, one way or another, that no taser should ever be made unless it is in the context of the observation in principle of a reasonable person who thinks that they are in physical danger. Only a physical danger to another person is there in the context, in the mind, in the, in the, as, as it observed by a reasonable person should the taser ever be used. And the report sugar-coated all that, it seems to me. And it's unacceptable. Thank you. Do we have anyone else online? Ms. Bush. Good evening, sir. Some people think that tasers are named after that um, terrible, awfully expensive tea they serve at Starbucks, but actually it's the Tom Swift electric ray gun, and they are actually uh, very, very painful and uh, uh, non-lethal. Um, uh, they're, they're a tactical thing. Um, I, I, I don't know how cruel it is. I've never been tased. I'm sure they are painful because um, they, they cause uh, uh, tetany in all, in all your muscles at once. Um, so it's just like, Argh. anyway. Um, I mean, I'd volunteer just if anybody wanted to demonstrate what it's like, I would, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem that awful to go through it, but I mean, I've seen videos of people who've had it done and they definitely look like they didn't enjoy it. Um, it, uh, it doesn't stop certain people, which is disturbing, you know, but, um, uh, technical stuff, not tasers. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I was heartened to see that there was no like major high level thing, no no, no high peaks that, that rose to the level of you know them, you know, saying it was some kind of uh, uh, some kind of a, um, a, you know, I mean, obviously many of these things spoken of tonight are are really significant issues. Um, um, I you know I I I personally have uh, been uh, subject to. Shades of you know levels of police brutality. I personally have been thrown to the ground. I personally have had, uh, you know, choked, uh, you know, held down, things like that. And it's, um, you know, it's always well a question of you know whether, you know, they misconstrued something or you know or if, I mean, so yeah, I'm uh, yeah I'm I mean I'm glad that we have this thing. I remember back in the uh, I think it was the '90s when they first sort of. Uh, um, uh, 
have, I mean, have, you know, I, I see it's the third annual report, but I mean, it's been maybe three decades since they've had uh, the, the police oversight, uh, you know, uh, uh, body. Anyway, uh, I know, I know, you like me would rather be, uh, or would have rather been at that uh, wharf uh, musical event uh, that they're having every second Tuesday of the uh, of the month. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know who uh, planned it that way, <laughs> but maybe it's someone uh, who wasn't thinking about us. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Nice to see you all again. Wow. The talk by these professionals kind of reminds me of the talk on number five. I didn't realize you gave me more time at the time, but sure is fascinating to have some witnesses that really contradict the information. Uh, you know, without law enforcement, we actually wouldn't have laws, and who would you call? Why have so many citizens become so passive and not involved? Oh, we could talk about that for a long time. Anyway, you know, what's happened yesterday has happened. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't mean there shouldn't be accountability. Um, I wish that I observed more citizens actually helping each other out, being polite. Maybe I engage more with law enforcement than, and emergency responders than most people. I know I do. But um, it seems when you engage with anyone and you give them more respect than you expect them to give you, you know, positive things often happen. Um, I mean, I've kind of gone over this citizen's rule book. Uh, I was able to give a man in this county, this is the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. Um, this book it has some pretty interesting things in it. You know, if he was an original constitutional sheriff, he would have the power to uh, arrest a standing president, but since that that constitution didn't even last two years. What we have is this uh, corporate pirate flag and a completely different set of rules than the two flags that are right outside. And so the people are really being bedazzled and you guys are going back and forth on all kinds of subjects. You know, I was gonna make a joke before, but I didn't, but I'm gonna say it now. Boy, I sure would love to uh, get an internship at 1313 60th Street in Chicago. Um, that's a direct reference to you city council members are really have been supposedly elected. We could talk about voter fraud, that's not on the subject. But the city and county managers actually control what you guys do. And that's the location of the CFR Council of Foreign Relations. So happy birthday to you. It's yep. nice to be here. I missed public comments by probably 30 seconds, but whatever. Nice to see all of you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else wish to testify matters back before the council? No one else online. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Bush. No one else on matters back before the council. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. I will move the um, recommendation to receive the annual report from the city independent city's independent police auditor <laughs> OIR group, and I have comments. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second by the vice mayor on your motion. Um, so, so thank you for the report and the presentation. And um, thank you to our police department for working with what I understood was there were 21 recommendations made and 16 of them are already in progress. Um, I do want to speak to case um, 16 and the, maybe the appropriate staff can um, also come and, and share. Uh, I know several of us council members have um, followed up on the challenges around reunification camps and what we as a city can and can't do. Um, I can't think it was last month that our city council unanimously supported a letter of support to our state legislators uh, to pass state policy around reunification camps. This is not something that we as a council support and we're making that known to our state legislator I believe individually we've also written letters. Um, in terms of how our 
Santa Cruz PD response to these calls that are mandated by a judge. So there is very little we can do um, in terms of, of what the judge has mandated. Um, what we can, what I see, what we can respond to is when there is a minor involved, how we enter that call and how we prepare ourselves to respond to that call. Um, you know, the, one of the recommendations is the department should consider adopting a children of arrested parents policy. And, and I'm no expert in this area, but I would like us to um, look and see what options are available for when we are responding to any call, not just for, for when a parent is getting arrested, but any call that we are aware of that there's a minor involved. Again, I, I don't know what policy options there are, but that's something that I would like our department to pursue and, and explore is how do we prepare ourselves, mental health clinicians, how do we prepare ourselves to enter that, to respond to that call and enter that physical space when there's a minor involved. Um, I think I'll stop there, but I don't know if anyone can or needs to comment on what our role is and isn't in, in the specific um, response to reunification camps. I don't know if Tony, you have insight or if um, Chief Escalante, no. Yeah. I mean, I think it is just that, that we, we it's, it's a judge, ordered mandate that we have very little purview over. That was my understanding, yes. Okay. But I don't think the city has a really viable mechanism for regulating that type of issue that is ordered by a superior court judge. But what we can do is um, take a really deep look in how we respond to those calls for services. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Further, thank you. Further on this item, Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I, I'm i gonna be really honest here and, and just say a few words. I really, I, I don't really have words to respond to the contents of this report. I appreciate uh, your work in um, bringing it to us. I appreciate the work of the, um, the police department in um, you know, helping to facilitate uh, making this available. And, um, I, I, but I just don't, I don't, I, I cried as I read about what the subjects in uh, these investigations endured. And I, I, I really couldn't help but think that our city could very well end up on the national news for a taser-related death um, if things continue to go the way they're going. Um, I appreciate that there is, uh, there is an interest in uh, policy changes, that those changes are being made. I think we need to do more. Um, in these cases, what I see is escalation, not de-escalation. Uh, the description, uh, others have talked about some of the other incidents which also disturb me. The description of the first incident, um, uh, the, uh, case 10, um, was, was so concerning. The, as the auditor pointed out, I, I would say quite earnestly and, and politely, uh, the use by the, uh, the taser and the way it was used was unnecessary and, and probably illegal. Um, and it was concerning that the uh, department's investigation justified those actions. I, it's, uh, I, I'm just, I just don't understand it. Um, I think the pro proposed policy changes, I, I'm really glad to see those. I'm, I think it's the least that <laughs> could be done. In a, at the end of the day, you all have a tough job. I'm talking to the po police officers here. You have a tough job and it's, it's not made easier by um, having to justify your actions and having that level of scrutiny. Um, but the, but it's important, and I'm really glad that we have an independent auditor. Um, I recognize there are questions about um, the, the level of um, uh, indictment <laughs> involved in that. Um, I'll just end by saying, because I, I just have no power <laughs> sitting here as, a, as one council member to do anything to change this. Um, and I, I know that if we had a CAHOOTS model non-law law enforcement response program that incidents like this would be far less likely. Um, and so I really hope that people will take that seriously, looking at that model, 
um, and not rely on um, the, the way we've been doing things because clearly uh, there are problems. So I, I just have to say that I have to be real honest um, about it. Um, thank you for, for being here and thank you for following up. I hope things improve. Ms. Watkins. Yeah, no, I appreciate your comments, uh, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Kelantari Johnson, and I um, recognize the just you know how challenging these are real life situations that are happening in the community, and I I guess my maybe it's a comment in terms of um, a suggestion in that absolutely some of the policies, but I do know that we have a younger workforce, a younger um, population of incoming officers and similar to how you would do with teachers and new teachers is you have mentors and you have a way to help coach and train them and I don't know the dynamic within um, law enforcement in that way but I think there is a playbook out there that could be looked at in terms of how some of the younger officers who are coming on are mentored and supported and coached by um, others to help avoid especially I don't know their age I don't know not necessarily to these circumstances but in general I know that that's just the overall trend in terms of the workforce so um, perhaps a suggestion internally for uh, mentorship and coaching for some of the younger folks anyone else on this item Ms. Bruner thank you um, thank you to the independent auditor um, for looking at these um, situations and these cases and reviewing and providing the recommendations and um, boy was that tough to read through some of those details um, and you know hearing hearing some of um, the situations and um, you know the recommendations that were made, I, I'm glad that you um, you also addressed my um, what I was going to say. But um, I'm hoping that there's it says that there's 16 um, uh, of those recommendations have been implemented into the updated policy, and I wasn't clear on the other five if. Um, um, that is in pro pro progress of, of being worked on, and I'm wondering if, if you could answer that. Good evening, Chief. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, <clears throat> to the uh, other five recommendations, they are all a work in progress with the, uh, with the auditor. As an example, the... Um, Child of Arrested Parents policy has actually already been sent to uh, SAMRA to kick around a draft, and I think we've gotten some comments back, and uh, so that's in, in motion. All the ones that have the asterisks have already been addressed um, right. as a result of their uh, original um, uh, report. So there's been, and most of that work was in the taser policy and the uh, use of force policy as well. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Flick will call the roll. <coughs> Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kellantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. For the business, come before the council. Ms. Bush, for the business, come before the council. Motion to adjourn and be in order. The vice mayor moves. Ms. Watkins seconds. Not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries and so ordered. We stand adjourned. Thanks for spending your whole birthday with us. I know. What a way to celebrate, Fred. <laughs>